It's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Chet Graham, Johnny. Who? Wake up, boy. Chet Graham claims New York Mutual. Oh, hi, Chet. How are things? Bad. Johnny, I have to make a little trip out to the coast on a phony claim. I'll be gone about four days, but I need someone to hold down my office while I'm away. Can you do it? Oh, that's not my line, Chet. You know that. Well, make it your line, Johnny. Somebody has to be here. Look, you can live in my apartment. You can use my tickets to wish you were here. You can even take my girl if you want. New York's swell this time of year. Can't you get anybody there? Oh, everybody's got the flu or busy or something. When do you want to leave for the coast? I'd like to get out on the noon plane today. Well, I can be down there by 11. Good. We'll probably miss each other, but just walk right in the office and make yourself at home. I'll call you from L.A. Have a good trip. Uh, By the way, what does your girl look like? Even your best dream was never that good. Just leave her phone number on your desk. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to New York Mutual Underwriters Limited, Rockefeller Center, New York City. Attention, Mr. Chester Graham, claims and adjustments. Dear Chet, you probably read some of this in the Los Angeles papers, but they don't have the whole story. Maybe they'll never get it all. I hope not. I found out part of it, stumbled into the rest of it, and I'm trying to forget all of it. The following is an accounting of expenditures during your four-day absence and my investigation of the James Clayton matter. Expense account item one, $14.35 transportation Hartford to New York, where, as per your advice, I walked in your office, sat down, and made myself at home. And where, 15 minutes later, I had a caller. Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. The girl at the reception desk said Mr. Graham was out of town and that you were taking his place. Yes. Please sit down. Well, thank you, but I don't have time. I'm Miss Stebbins, Dr. James Clayton's nurse. He asked me to see you. I see. He gave me these policy numbers. He said that your company wrote these policies and that he'd like to talk to one of you. Well, certainly, Miss Stebbins. He can come by any time. No, you don't understand. Dr. Clayton can't get away from the office. We're terribly rushed, and I really should be getting back myself. He's there all alone. Well, do you know what it's about, Miss Stebbins? I... No. The doctor's been acting strangely all day. He had me cancel all of his outside calls, and then he sent me here. He said to explain that it was very urgent. I'm... I'm very concerned for him. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform and cape was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced out a wan, unprofessional smile, and started to cry. I pretended not to notice all this as we got on the elevator and went down into the street. However, ten minutes later, when we arrived at a suite of offices in the Pelroy building, I had to notice Dr. James Clayton. He met us at the door. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat and carrying a stethoscope in one hand. But in the other, he brandished a thirty-two Ivor Johnson. The safety was off. Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, doctor. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance office. Claims investigation? Yeah. Oh, fine. Uh, Jane, this would be a good time for you to get some lunch, don't you think? Well, doctor, I have all of those lab reports to... No, go ahead, Janie. Like a good girl, I want to speak with Mr. Dollar alone. Of course, doctor, if you say so. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Very fine girl, Jane. She's worked for me a long time. Very fine. Do you always meet her at the door with firearms, doctor? Oh, oh, this. Well, all I can say is this is a ridiculous mess. My life's been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. This, I, I, I don't even know how to load it. <laughs> I look foolish, I suppose. A threat on your life, doctor, comes under the heading of police business. I know that very well. And I would go directly to the police, only... Well, it is a delicate matter. You seem dubious already. No, just curious. Go on, please. Well, several months ago, I attended a patient named Florence Harmon. A thorough examination disclosed that her poor physical condition wasn't based on any organic disorder, but rather upon an emotional instability. Now, this, I finally discovered, was brought about by her marriage to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Benjamin Harmon. I could only advise that she divorce him immediately. Well, that's somewhat extreme, Doctor. 
Are you always certain of advice like that? In this case, there's no other answer. I approached Mr. Harmon on the subject last night at his home. I explained that Mrs. Harmon's health, her very life is in jeopardy. And more is involved here than keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. I see. But uh, Mr. Harmon doesn't care for semantics, huh? Uh, He attacked me. If it hadn't been for the assistance of Mrs. Harmon and a servant, he might have choked me to death. When I left, he threatened me. Then you should have called the police. Yes, yes, I've thought of that. But look, if if you approached Harmon in the right manner, Dollar, he might discard his ideas of violence. Well, you're the expert on homicidal tendencies, but the best thing I can see for you is to prefer assault charges and have him locked up. I know all that, but it's for Mrs. Harmon's sake. Please understand, she's been through a shattering ordeal. Look, Mr. Dollar, would you, would you go see him and talk to him? If you think he means it, really, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him. The Harmon residence was in Westchester, a story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. There was a 51 Cadillac in the open garage and a 52 Ford station wagon in front of the house. Yes? This one didn't have a white coat or stethoscope, but he had a gun. What is it? Mr. Harmon? I'm Harmon. What do you want? Mr. Harmon, my name is Dollar. And Dollar, I'm like... huh? Get out of my way! Oh! Drink this. Easy now. Oh. Take it, please. Oh, you had quite a blow. Try a little more. It should make you feel better. What was... Who... Oh, you you can bring suit against him, against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. He's just ungovernable. He could easily have killed you. You, uh, Mrs. Harmon? Yes. Your husband think I was the ice man? Oh, I don't know what he thought. I... I just heard him yell at you, and when I came to the door, you were lying there, and he'd taken the station wagon and left. Why, last night, he even attacked my personal physician and threatened to kill him. I don't know what's gotten into him. You'd better sit down. Uh, It's getting better. Where'd he go? Heaven only knows. Mad. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar, mad. He's liable to do anything. I'm... I'm scared. I'm scared stiff. I called Dr. Clayton, who promised to notify the police. It was about a quarter to six when I got back to his office. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. Hi. You Dr. Clayton? No. Hey, uh, don't I know you? I was thinking the same about you. Uh, Wait, Dollar? Yeah. Tom Bassman, Central Division. Oh, sure. How are you, Tom? Fine. Hey, you must be the one. What? This Dr. Clayton called downtown about a threat, said his insurance company had advised him to report it. That's right. Well, where is he? Well, he should be here, Tom. What's his nurse say? I rang the buzzer. No one around at all. What's this all about? A man named Benjamin Harmon's threatened the doctor's life. I met him myself. He's carrying a gun, and he looked dangerous to me. I just came from his house. He's still there? No. I better phone in and get a pickup out on him. When the doctor shows up, I'll get a complaint. And... Oh, Hello. Hello. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Evans. Dr. Clayton here? This is Sergeant Bassman. We want to see him ourselves. You're a police officer? That's right, miss. I heard him talking to you on the phone. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Well, goodness, he sent me out to pick up these things. He was here when I left. Oh. What? Perhaps he had an emergency. Well, is there any way we can find out? Well, if he had one, it would be right here on the pad, because I always have to know... That's funny. What? He got an emergency call, 1213 Alessandro Street. Can I see that, please? Uh Uh-huh. There's no name on this, Miss Stebbins. Do you recognize the address at all? No, I don't. The doctor just wouldn't take a random emergency call unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual. Dollar, how bad off did you think Harmon was? Mad. Had a gun. Cracked me. Plenty rough. This is in the warehouse district. Think we better go down there? I think so. Wait. What? 1213. 
Now it'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This one's 1240, and the rest belong to that warehouse. Yeah. Tom. Hmm? That car. M.D. on the license plate? Yeah. It might be Clayton's. Yeah. That's Clayton's car, all right. He must be around here somewhere looking for 1213. Yeah. Well, let's have a peek. Tom. I see. He's had it. Is it Clayton? Yeah, that's him. Some emergency this was. Yeah. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. On weekends, it seems everybody takes his car out on the highways. Some drivers are less experienced than others. They either speed or poke along with a whole stream of cars behind them. Both types are a menace to safety. Whatever you do, be moderate, be obedient to all traffic laws. Be careful, use your head, and don't take chances. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. An hour of questioning in the neighborhood turned up two people who recalled hearing the shots. And one man remembered seeing a man who answered Benjamin Harmon's description loitering in the vicinity of a nearby bar earlier in the evening. Obviously, Dr. Clayton had been lured to his death by the murderer who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited till the victim appeared, and then shot him down. Expense account item three, $11.65. A good dinner, three martinis, tip, and thinking at Toot Shores. After which, I strolled over to the Pelroy building. Expense account item four, five dollars even. Bribed watchman. Uh, I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. I appreciate it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. Just looking around is all. Too bad about the doctor. Nice fellow. Very. What do you think you'll find? A policeman been ahead almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Sure. Well, what? Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it uh, with him when he went out on that emergency. Well, don't be too long. The business about the emergency kit started me thinking. I opened Clayton's file drawer and skimmed through every patient's name from Abbott to Zabrowski. He'd been a thorough man and from all evidences operated an efficient medical office. However, he had no medical history in his files on Florence Harmon. There was nothing to indicate that she had ever been a patient of his. On the other hand, there was an entry a year before which showed that he had examined, treated, and discharged Benjamin Harmon as a patient. I think these two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I needed for a while. Nurse Jane Stebbins' home address was duly noted on Dr. Clayton's phone book. Oakdale House. Surprisingly enough, on Oak Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 210. Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I just got home a little while ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Do you want to come in? Thanks. I don't want to keep you up. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straightened it up for days, it seems. <laughs> I'm sorry. Things like this aren't easy. I know. Don't apologize to me. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Have they caught Mr. Harmon yet? No, not yet. Uh, Miss Stebbins, you worked for Dr. Clayton a long while, didn't you? Five years. 
Then you should be able to tell me who he was going to marry. Marry? Well, I didn't know. I have no idea. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon. Honeymoon? Look. Reservations on the Ile de France for next April. I found them in his desk drawer. Confirmed to Dr. and Mrs. James Clayton. Well? What difference does it make? I don't know. Seems strange that you've been with him for such a long time and didn't know about this. I... Or did you? All right. What about Mrs. Harmon? Well... Look, Miss Stebbins, things are wrong all the way down the line about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll come out sooner or later. I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar, but Mrs. Harmon was the only one Dr. Clayton saw socially. And she, of course, is married. Of course. And the good doctor advised her to get a divorce. He meet her when Mr. Harmon was a patient of his? Yes, that's right. They became friendly. But Mrs. Harmon was never a patient. No, never. Just her husband. What can you tell me about Mr. Harmon? Well, really, all I know is he came in to see Dr. Clayton a few times. Over a year ago, I guess. Then after... After he saw what was happening between Mrs. Harmon and Dr. Clayton, he stopped coming in. I sent a copy of his medical history to another doctor. But Dr. Clayton had been seeing Mrs. Harmon all this time. It's awful to say this now, Mr. Dollar. Doctor's dead. I'm no moralist. We're all human. It's happened before. Married people have been attracted by others. I'm tired, Mr. Dollar. Sure. Do you have any idea why I was called in today? At first, I didn't. I... Well, of course, it happened. The police told me about Mr. Harmon's threats. But I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Harmon, and what does it all mean? It means the wrong man was killed. Please, Mr. Dollar. I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Now, look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police looking for Ben. I don't have... You and Clayton... I was going to be the star witness when the state tried him for shooting your husband. Whatever I said as a material witness would back up his self-defense plea and get him off on a justifiable homicide. Isn't that it? I tell you, I won't listen And you and the doctor would sail to France and live happily ever after. What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? You won't listen. Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, I know you know everything, then it must be that way. Yeah, only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your doctor boyfriend after all. Get out of here. Get out of my house. You can't prove anything. You're right, Mrs. Harmon. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. They catch your husband and they'll put him away for it. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Or maybe you didn't really love your doctor after all. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Well, that's it, Sergeant. I want to know if people can really get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law. If and when you pick up Benjamin Harmon, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, we'll get him, Dollar. The others, I can't answer. What you just told me is really a thing. I don't see how any lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and finally guns him down, do you? Supposing I could prove that Harmon was being set up as a patsy, that the doctor was really supposed to gun him down and plead self-defense. Up to the judge and the jury. When we get Harmon, he'll be arraigned and indicted on first-degree murder charges. Don't worry about that. And if it goes that far, it generally means he'll get the works. After all, we're pretty sure he shot and killed the doctor. Hang up, Dollar. Huh? You still there, Dollar? Hang up or I'll blow your head off. Benjamin Harmon wasn't kidding. He was blazing mad. He had a gun and... I knew he wasn't afraid to use it. I was across the street when you left my place a little while ago. Fixing up another deal, were you? I don't know what you're talking about, Harmon. I followed you here so we could have this talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you. They'll shoot you down if they see you. Nobody's going to shoot me down, not yet. Now, where's your office? Hartford, Connecticut. I mean here. Where do you practice here? Come on. I don't practice anything here. My office is in Hartford. This apartment belongs to a friend of mine. 
I'm standing in for him here while he's out of town. Where's his office? New York Mutual Liability. I mean his law office. I want to get down there and see how much... Hold on now. I'm not a lawyer. My friend's not a lawyer. We're insurance investigators. Where's the office? I tell you, we... Listen! Clayton called me this morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about divorcing Florence. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there. I think I know why Clayton called you and told you that, but I don't... You and he were trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. You're wrong, Harmon. I didn't know anything about that. Nobody takes my wife away from me. Now, that's the kind of temper that got you in all the trouble you're in. Look, you can shoot me here and I'll be number two. But they'll get you real easy here. You know I didn't kill Clayton? How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people heard you threaten him. I have an idea why you did it, and you might have been right. But murder for any reason... Shut up! You're in on it somewhere. You know who did kill him. And you're going to clear me or I'll rip it out of you, Dollar. Or rip it out of you! Why, you crazy... You... All right. Here. Try this. Go on. I'm tired of fooling with you. Now, get on your you. feet. Right. Well, you got one point in your favor. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No. Here, take another drink. Now, you have a chance to talk to me right now. I don't think the police will be interested in much you have to say. I wanted to kill Clayton, but I didn't. I didn't. Nobody will believe that. I know I've got a temper, and I've tried to control it, but I didn't kill him. I'm not impressed with that. I want facts. Where were you when Clayton was shot? How do I know? I didn't know what time he was shot. Say between five and six today. I was out getting mad. Fried. Where? Who saw you? No. After after we met, I was so sore. I jumped in the car and went out and bought myself a jug. I know it sounds crazy, but I spent most of the time just sitting in the car down to the docks, just drinking and thinking and getting mad. I don't know what it was. I don't know when I walked over to the saloon, phoned Clayton. I told him I was on Alessandro Street and to come on down. I wanted to have a showdown. You mean you wanted him to come down so you could kill him? Maybe I did have it on my mind. I don't know. I waited an hour or so, but he never showed up. When I called back at his office, nobody answered. So I climbed back in my car, and that's where I heard about my being wanted for killing him. It was on the newscast. I didn't do a dollar. I swear I didn't. The others I knew about, and I didn't kill them. What others? Florence always had other friends. <laughs> yes, I don't love her anymore, but I don't know. Maybe I hate her for all of it. When a man doesn't let part of his life walk away from him, I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her get away with it, it would have been too much for me to hold. Even though... Because... Even though you didn't love her and you knew she didn't love you? Yes. That sounds stupid. Maybe. I loved her once. She loved me the way two people only love at certain times. Hell, no sense yet. I'm not well, darling. Clayton gave me a year. Another doctor, 18 months. Finished anemia. The two of them could have waited at least till I was dead, couldn't they? Couldn't they? I found some sleeping pills in your medicine cabinet, and I fed him a couple with some hot cocoa. He dropped off to sleep in your bed while I made some phone calls confirming what he just told me. Expense account item five, taxi fare. $4.05 back to Oak Street, to Oakdale House. Special rates for nurses. I thought you'd be back. I'm glad it's you. I think somehow you're the kind of man who understands things. I'll be a good listener. Go ahead. When I first started as his nurse, I fell in love with him. 
I guess it's an old story. Terribly old and corny. But then he met her. I heard him tell you all those lies today about treating Mrs. Harmon. I was out in the hall. Didn't have any idea exactly what he intended to do until I heard him call Mr. Harmon. Right after you left. He told him you were a lawyer. He knew Harmon was upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about knowing what people would do. I was here when Mr. Harmon called in tonight. Doctor took the call and wrote it down on the pad. I saw him put the gun inside his coat, and I knew he was going down there to shoot Mr. Harmon. So I followed him. He was walking around the dark looking for Mr. Harmon with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy that she wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. He struggled and the gun went off. I don't know how many times. Then I came back here and pretended I'd been down at the drugstore. I see. What's your first name? Jane. Jane, Dr. Clayton made all sorts of elaborate plans so he'd have a self-defense plea. But you don't have to go to all that trouble. You can prove self-defense. He had the gun. He was going to use it on you. I beg your pardon? I can help you, Jane. It'll go second degree or manslaughter, suspended. You didn't mean to shoot him, but he meant to shoot you. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. What? I guess they haven't found her yet. I killed Mrs. Harmon an hour ago. Expense account item six, same as one, transportation back to Hartford. I didn't spend any other money, Chet. I didn't meet your girl, and I didn't see the musical. I didn't go any place. I just sat in your office and looked at the walls for the next three days. I'm leaving this where you'll see it when you come in tomorrow morning. Settle up and don't call me for a long time. A long, long time, if you call at all. Expense account total, $56.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and is written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Joseph Kearns, John McIntyre, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Every Sunday, CBS Radio's Bob Trout brings you a timely weekend roundup of world news. As a special eyewitness feature, an overseas CBS Radio News correspondent flies in to give you an up-to-the-minute account of developments on his beat. Don't miss Bob Trout's World News Roundup Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, Care of Star Times. Dear Dan, 
If this is the way you want it, okay. If a pal and buddy has to reach you the hard way, all right. Enclosed is a ticket to my fight with Brennan tomorrow night. I'd like to see your mug at ringside. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up for you. Johnny Capella. Johnny Capella, a kid when I first met him, fighting in a different way. At Anzio. And maybe, just maybe, Anzio wasn't as hard for him to take as what happened right here. <laughs> Now back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Double Right Cross. Johnny Capelli, contender for the middleweight crowd. A big, overgrown kid with a smile full of white teeth and a heart full of kindness for everybody. Johnny Capelli? I never heard of him, Mr. Holliday. Well, you don't read the sport pages, Susie. But you know him, huh? Uh huh. We played duck on a rock on the beach at Anzio for keeps. <laughs> I saw him a little while ago. Told him my box 13 idea, and I guess he saw the ad in the Star Time. And you're going to fight, huh? Yes, that's it, Sissy. Did he send you a bedside seat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I can do with that one. So long, Sissy. In the driving rain, I headed for the stadium, and my cab ran fenders first into a traffic jam. Well, there's no use trying to get through, so I paid off the cabby and started to plow the rest of the way to the stadium. I looked at my watch two minutes after ten. The first round of the fight was underway. By the time I hit ringside, people were already on their feet leaving. There was booing. And talk. Capelli knocked out. Capelli acted like a fourth raider. Johnny Capelli laid down. I pushed my way back to the dressing rooms with a little knot of people around one door, and a girl was rattling the knob and calling, Johnny, Johnny, please open the door. Johnny. What's the matter? What's going on? Uh, how are you? Report up, beat it. No, I'm a friend of Johnny's. Who are you? His manager. I mean, I was, but not after tonight. He loses one fight, and you're quitting. Yeah, like he did. When he comes out of there, tell him he can take this contract and tell him. You're Helen, aren't you? Yes. Please go away. Johnny can't see any reporters now. Please go, will you? I looked at him. So this was Helen. The girl Johnny dreamed about, talked about, raved about, and talked some more about. All the while, he and I were trying to miss the casualty list in Italy. The girl he sent a diamond brooch, bought with a year's pay, hoarded like a miser. Well, if looks counted, she was worth it. She rattled the knob again. And... Please, Johnny. It's Helen. Johnny. May I try? Johnny. Johnny, this is Dan. Dan Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, yes. You recognize the name? Oh, yes. Johnny spoke of you. He said. <laughs> What's the matter with Johnny? He won't come out, Holiday. Oh? Who are you? Helen's brother. You see if you can get Johnny out of there, Holiday. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny Capelli. It's Dan, Johnny. Is there any other way out of this dressing room? Yeah, the window. This is the ground floor. He could have got out of the window. Look, both of you, Helen and... Uh, um, Name's Eddie. Yeah, all right, Eddie. Get somebody with a key to open this door. Go ahead, Eddie. Step on it. Okay, be back in a minute. Now, what's all this about, Helen? Oh, I don't know. As soon as the fight was over, it came... He was conscious? Yes, he walked, but we got the door here, and he broke ahead of me and ran in and locked the door, and I just... All right, Helen. All right. Now, take it easy. We'll find out what's happened. When we got into the dressing room, Johnny was gone and Eddie was right. The window was open. I couldn't figure it. Johnny Capelli, a kid whose courage was A+. Plus. A kid who went through Anzio, Salerno, Casino. Sure, he was scared, like, just like the rest of us. But he didn't whimper. And he didn't run out, ever. He just didn't figure, and Helen didn't make it any more clear. No, I don't know. I don't know why he ran away. Well, take it easy, sis. Johnny must have had a reason. Yes, he must have. 
Now, listen, where'd he go? Well, if he's not at the hotel, I, I don't know. Well, he called there. That's no good. Any other place, think. Well, I, I don't know of any. All right. Uh, where can I get in touch with you later? 387 Christopher Place. Good. You wait there. I'll find Johnny. <laughs> It was tough, but I finally tracked on a cab driver who remembered picking up a man back at the stadium. Seemed, well, drunk, he said. Took him to a little hotel on the other side of town. It could be Johnny, so I went there and... Go away. Johnny. Get out. Listen to me, Johnny. This is Dan. Dan Holliday. Dan? Yeah, let me in, Johnny. No, go away. Just go away, will you? What are you trying to do, Johnny? Nothing. Please, will you go away? Look, kid, let me in or I'll break in. Johnny. How are you, Dan? Where's the light? Don't turn it on. Don't, Dan. Okay, Johnny. No light. Close the door. Why'd you come? Why do you think? Listen, nobody else knows where I am, do they? No, nobody. Helen? No. Where is she? Home, waiting waiting for me to call her. But you're not going to. What's the matter, Johnny? Dan, I... I'm sick. What do you mean? I don't know. Look, Dan, it was swell of you to come. There's nobody I'd want to see any more than you, but... Not now, Dan. Some other time, but not tonight. You're going to tell me what's wrong, Johnny. All right. Turn on the light and take a look. Johnny. Yeah. Better with the light off, isn't it? Now, listen, you took a beating. You're hurt, kid. Hurt badly. I've got to get a doctor. No. I said yes. No, you got a doctor, so help me, Dan. I'll kill you. I'll... Uh... Johnny. Hello. Desk clerk. Listen, get a doctor to room 10 right away. And that means right now. Holiday. He'll sleep for a while now. How long before he wakes up, Doctor? Five, six hours, maybe longer. How badly is he hurt? Well, it's hard to tell. He took quite a beating. Uh, who is he? A uh, friend of mine. I see. Fight? Yeah, sort of. Well, I... Uh... Look, Doctor, as long as there's no gunshot wound, you, you don't have to report this, do you? No, but... Uh... Well, let's leave it that way, then, huh? You'll be back in the morning? Yes, I'll make a more thorough examination, then. He was too hysterical to do much with tonight. But I think he'll be calmer when he awakens. Then there's nothing... nothing too bad. I don't think so. Bruises, contusions, and his eyes. I, uh... What's wrong with his eyes? I'll see you in the morning. Uh, good night, Miss Holliday. Good night. Thanks, Doctor. I sat by Johnny's bed and watched. I... I didn't call Helen because... Well, for some reason, Johnny didn't want anybody to know. To know what? Maybe I'd find out when Johnny came, too. Maybe he wouldn't tell me. And I just couldn't see Johnny running out on anything. There had to be something wrong. Something big. I sat in a chair alongside the bed and thought about it. And I guess I fell asleep because the next thing I knew, I... Huh? Oh, oh, just a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Is he still sleeping? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe for another hour or so. But I'll wait. Thanks. You'll be all right? Well, I'd like to ask him a few questions when he awakens. I don't think there's anything seriously wrong, but, uh... Well, I'll wait. What are you getting at? I don't know. You'll have to wait, too. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll go out and get some coffee. You can use some, too, can't you? Yes, thanks. I'll be right back. I thought I'd be right back. But when I got down to the street, something changed my plans. There was a newsstand, and the first thing that hit my eye was a sub-headline. It said, Boxing Commission holds up Capelli purse. Capelli disappears after fight fiasco. 
I hurried to a phone, called the Star Times, got a few strings pulled, and a half hour later, I was sitting across from the commissioner at his home. Just exactly what interest do you have in this, Mr. Holliday? I'm a friend of Johnny's. I see. All right. You must have something important to tell me this early in the morning. I want you to tell me something, Commissioner. What? Why is the commission holding up Johnny's purse? Because we believe the fight was not quite on the level. Meaning you think Johnny threw it? We don't know. We're going to look at the movies this morning. Johnny didn't throw that fight. Did you see it? No, I didn't, but I... How do you know? Oh, because I know Johnny. That's your only reason? I think it's enough, Commissioner. Look, Mr. Holliday, we have one job to do. Keep the boxing game fair and square as a service to the fans who pay their money to see good, clean sport. Capelle was a ten-to-one favorite last night. A big bet placed on Brennan would bring a lot of money to anyone. Meaning Johnny might have bet on Brennan? It's been done. And the commission is in business to see that it doesn't happen anymore. Until Capelle proves otherwise... We'll say he threw that fight. I didn't believe it. But Johnny lost. He lost badly. And he did run out, and he he wouldn't tell why. I went back to the little hotel and ran into the doctor who was just leaving. Oh, Mr. Holliday. That cup of coffee took a long time. It wasn't coffee. How's Johnny? He'll be all right. That all? No. Last night when I examined him, something puzzled me. What? His eyes. Pupils dilated. And? This morning when I examined him again, I asked a few questions. What about? Your friend had every symptom of bellamine poisoning. Last night, the pupils of his eyes were dilated and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. That would affect his sight, wouldn't it? Yes. Taken internally, bellamine is poisonous. Quarter grain enough is fatal. And less than that? Dryness of throat, nervousness... In other words, if someone gave him Bellamine, he'd he'd have a hard time seeing. Very difficult. And if he were a boxer? Well, if he were a boxer and went in the ring with his eyes in that condition, he wouldn't be able to see his opponent. to Box 13 and Double Right Cross with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So Johnny lost the fight because he couldn't see Brennan. But why did he run out? Why didn't he want anyone to see him? I I thought I was going blind, Dan. Brennan was just a shadow that was beating me. Why didn't you quit? Why didn't you say something? Because I didn't want anybody to know. It was going to be that way. I'd take it alone. Noble, huh? Look, Dan... I waited a long time for that fight. You meant a crack at the title. Helen waited with me. If I was going blind, I wasn't going to let her know. Stick with me. Sure, sure. A kid like you would think that way. Now, listen to me, Johnny. Somebody fed you the stuff to impair your sight. Somebody who wanted you to lose that fight. Who? You're crazy, Dan. What did you eat yesterday? Eat? The day of the fight? Nothing. Just a little breakfast. And the rest of the day? Nothing. Liquids? Water? Milk? Of course not. No fighter fills himself up with liquids. Makes him logy, heavy on his feet. But, Johnny, the Bellamine had to be given to you just before you went into the ring. Any earlier in the day, and the effect would have worn off before the fight. Look, why don't you lay off, Dan? I'm telling you, I, I didn't eat anything or drink anything, not for hours before the fight. But you had to. No, no, no. I know what I did. I Look, maybe it was my eyes. Maybe it is what I thought. I got hit in Italy, Dan. Maybe it's not that. The doctor knows what he's talking about, Johnny. Somebody fed you that stuff. Who? You tell me. Nobody. I didn't eat, drink. Do I have to go over all that again? No. But I am. You wait here, Johnny. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite over Brennan. And somebody played that for all it was worth. And it looked like it was worth a lot of money if the bet was big enough. A little while later, I was talking to Brennan. You're crazy, Holiday. Uh, Maybe the guy wasn't in shape. Look, Brennan, Johnny was in condition. So you're telling me that somebody doped him? Meaning me? No, no, no. I'm just asking. And I'm telling. I got 120 fights on a clean sheet. None of them was shady. 
I don't play that way. I'm not saying that. I'm only trying to find out who could have given Johnny that drug. Well, I wasn't near his dressing room. I didn't, didn't even see him after we weighed in that afternoon. All right, it, it had to be in his food. Food? No fighter's going to eat right before a match. I drink water? He just winches his mouth, that's all. What else, Brennan? If he's training right, nothing else. But, but if he gets thirsty... I told you, he just winches his mouth. He drinks water, makes him heavy. That's why a fighter chews gum all day. It gives him a more... Gum? Bit... Yeah, gum. Why? Gum. That's it, Brennan. That's it. <laughs> Sure, I chewed gum all day. Before the fight in your dressing room? I must have been chewing gum. I remember the... Go ahead, Johnny. What were you going to say? Nothing. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Look, there's only one way the drug could have been given to you. Now, you've got to think who gave you gum just before you went in that ring. I didn't have any. Johnny, what are you hiding? Nothing. You were going to say something a second ago. Did Baker, your manager, give you... No. Who else was with you? Just... Baker. I was Helen. Shut up, Dan. Did she give you any gum? Forget the whole thing. I'm going blind, that's all. Oh, you're yeah, not. Beat it. Helen gave you that gum. She was in your dressing room before the fight, wasn't she? Cut it out, Dan. That's why you shut up before you remembered. And the chewing gum was the only way the drug could be given to you. Because you didn't eat, you didn't drink water, or anything else before you went in that ring. But maybe 15 minutes before, Helen handed you the gum, didn't she? Shut up, Dan. Shut up and forget the whole thing. Come on, Johnny. She gave you the gum, didn't she? Didn't she? You, uh, you still got a good right, Johnny. I'm sorry, Dan. Sure. Sure, let's forget it. But I didn't want to forget it. I left Johnny and went to see Baker's manager. I didn't tell him what I'd found out. I just listened. Sure, I brought the kid up from the ham and egg plums. But after last night, we're washed up. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, a match with the champ next. Did you bet on Johnny? I never bet. Even if you thought Johnny was going to win? What are you driving at? That somebody was stood to make a killing if Johnny lost. You are asking for a cloud holiday? I just had one. What about Helen? Now, what about her? All right, Baker, here are the cards. Johnny went in the ring last night, a sure bet to lose. What? Yeah, that's right. He was drugged. He couldn't see Brennan from the first bell until he was counted out. He was fighting on instinct and courage. Listen, what are you giving me? There was nobody in his dressing room but me and... And Helen? Yeah. Now, what about her? Nothing. Except once I walk in on the two of them and... Well, they was having a fight. What about? They clammed up when I walked in, but I heard something about a... Brooch. Brooch? Diamond brooch? The one Johnny sent her from Italy? Maybe. All I know is what I said. That's enough. Thanks, Baker. Maybe you'll have a champ on your hands yet. The next stop was to see Helen. I, I wasn't sure how to handle this. And all I had to go on was the fact that Johnny was covering for her. Why? And they'd had a fight over that brooch. Again, why? So the big question was, did she or did she not double-cross Johnny? Her first words to me were... Dan, you found Johnny. Maybe. Maybe, but what do you mean? Sit down, Helen. What's the matter? Is he all right? He'll be all right. He's he's in a little hotel. Well, then take me there. I want to see him, Dan. Maybe he doesn't want to see you. What? Johnny, now, did he say that? No. Well, what are you doing? Why don't you take me to him? Why are you talking like this, Dan? How much did you win on the fight, Helen? What do you mean? I watched her face closely after I asked that. Either she was the new Sarah Bernhardt or she was in the clear. For a couple of seconds, she stared at me and then... That's a filthy thing to say. Yes, I know, but I've got something to find out. And what did you hope to find out by asking me that? I hope to find out who made a killing on the fight by making Johnny a setup for Brennan. He was ten to one. Good odds for somebody who'd lay a good-sized bet on Brennan. You mean you... You think I'd bet against Johnny? Did you? That's not worth answering. All right, look. Johnny was knocked out because he was drugged. He couldn't see. 
And he was drugged only a few minutes before he went into the ring. Baker? No, a manager who's bringing up a champion doesn't sell him out. And, and that leaves only me, is that it? Maybe. And I bet everything I had on Brennan. Is that your story? What's yours, Helen? I have none. If that's what you believe, believe it. But tell me where Johnny is. I promised I wouldn't. You promised? Oh, no, Johnny can't believe I... Where's that brooch he sent you? Brooch? Yeah, that's right. The one he sent from Italy. A $3,000 brooch would bring about 1500 in a pawn shop. And 1500 at 10 to 1. <laughs> well, seems to be my day for taking it. I'm sorry. Didn't you give Johnny chewing gum just before he went into the ring? What did you say? Chewing gum. Johnny wouldn't tell me, but I know you gave it to him. I... Yes. You... You admit it? Yes. Huh. That was the only way he could have been drugged. And you admit it? Yes, I admit it. Doesn't make sense. All right, it doesn't make sense. You're so right, Mr. Holliday. Nothing makes sense. Nothing. Now go back and tell Johnny. Tell everybody. Go on. Well, this I couldn't get. Two of them. Johnny and Helen knowing it must have been the gum and Johnny not wanting to tell me. Then Helen coming right out and saying she gave it to him. Okay, there was one answer, and I hunted for it in the shape of that brooch. I called Lieutenant Kling at headquarters and got him to do me a favor. It took almost the rest of the day, but late that afternoon. Brooch? Uh, yes, yes, the police called, but I, I assure you I did not receive stolen goods in my shop. The, the police know that I... So don't you're in the that... clear now, don't worry. Has the brooch been redeemed yet? Uh, no, no. Look, uh, all I want to see is a slip and who signed the brooch in. Well, here, I, I have it ready... I thought it would be the police who would come. I, it's right here. Here. Here you are. There's no mistake about this. Oh, no, no. I I let him have a thousand dollars on it. A thousand? And you're sure? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there. There's where he signed his name. Uh, John, uh, uh, John Capelli. No, that couldn't be right. Unless... Unless Johnny was afraid he couldn't make a fake fight look good. And wanted to make sure. But where did Helen figure? And why? Why? Then it hit me. Johnny protects Helen. Helen admits she did it. It made so little sense it began to clear. I checked with betting agents and found one who took a bet on Brennan. A bet of $1,000 at 10 to 1. He remembered who placed the bet, so... Well, they gave me one more call to make. Back, I went to Helen's apartment. Hello. Yes? Oh, hi, Holiday. Come on in. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Sister home? No. Uh, grab a chair. Haven't you seen her? Oh, yes, yes, earlier. Well, aren't you going to ask me about Johnny? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, where is he? I know. Well, well, what about him? I mean, he's okay, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. Oh, that's swell. You know, Holiday, I couldn't figure a guy like Johnny doing something like that. No, neither could I, Eddie. That's why I knew he didn't. What? Here, Eddie, uh, have a stick of gum. I... Oh, no, I, I never use it. Good for the nerves. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, that's what you come to see me about, huh? Maybe. You like to gamble, don't you, Eddie? Gamble? Oh, sometimes. Why? Ever get in so deep you had to uh, steal to make yourself even? What kind of a crack is that? Oh, a nasty one. Just as nasty as stealing your sister's brooch. I... What did she tell you? Nothing. She had a fight with Johnny. Maybe he noticed she didn't have the brooch. Asked her about it. Maybe she had her ideas about where it was. Yeah? So what? So she knew and gave you a break. But you had different ideas, Eddie. You pawned the brooch, signed Johnny's name to the slip, then bet a thousand against Johnny. Ah, you nuts, you're off your rocker. Tell you what, Eddie. Let's you and I take a trip to the pawnbroker, then we'll go to the betting agent where you place the bet. Maybe I won't look so much off my rocker then, huh? All right. So what? 
I got a break. I'll redeem the brooch and... But what are you looking at me like that for? I took two on the chin today. Maybe it's my turn now to give, Eddie. You lay off now. Sis won't prosecute and Johnny won't either. <laughs> she won't marry him if he did and... It's not the brooch, Eddie. It's the chewing gum. The gum you gave your sister to give Johnny. The drug gum to ensure your bet. You can't prove nothing, you can't. Eddie, you and I are going to the boxing commission and you're going to talk. No, I ain't. Either that or I tell Johnny everything. And leave him in the room. Alone with you. Oh, uh, Eddie. Get your top coat, too. It's kind of chilly outside. <laughs> Susie, as they say in the books, all's well that ends well. Gee, it's so romantic. Johnny and Helen getting married. Johnny getting another crack at the championship. And I... Uh, What's the matter? Uh, What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? Oh, Susie, my jaw is really sore. Johnny hung a nice right cross on me. What's a right cross? Huh? Well, it's, um... Uh, here, look, put up your hands. This way? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, look... I, uh, I leave it my left like this, and you... Like that? I... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Holiday. Mr. Holiday. I... Oh, good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by E. Jack Newman and Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and the part of Johnny Capelli was played by John Beal. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, who follows transcribed in 30 seconds. Later tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way. And on the menu at Duffy's tonight, there's a blue plate special of grilled English language, served up by the delightfully ungrammatical Archie. Plus, laughs garnished with chuckles, brought to you by Archie's remarkable crew. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern, just keep your dial tuned to NBC. And this Sunday means another broadcast of The Big Show... Your guests include Fred Allen, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, and many, many more. Tallulah, of course, is your hostess on The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. Mr. Wolf, we've got a case. I'm not sure whether somebody's going to kill a rabbit or a rabbit is going to kill somebody, but either way, it's going to be murder. Please, Mr. Wolf, even orchids have to eat. Yes, sir, Mr. Wolf will take the case. As a matter of fact, he's working on it right now. Money, work. Bah. Greatest detective in the world. Only trouble is, he is. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Archie is right. Nero Wolf is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet.
Tonight, it's the case Nero Wolf likes to remember as the case of the friendly rabbit. He sometimes prefers his proverb scramble. It began in lots of places. Let's take a look at a few of them. In particular, the richly appointed library of a man named V. Mr. V, what's happening? Relax, Haynes. Your blood pressure... I thought it was a gag, but... You really are shutting the club down. I'm shutting it down. Why? I got the joint roll and the suckers are pouring in. And next week, the governor's committee. Huh? It's moving out of Baylor County. Our joint enterprise is in Baylor County. I think the club needs a rest. Crime committees so rarely admire gambling. Oh, that's different. So it is. The club needs a rest. You need a vacation. Florida, perhaps? I don't like Florida. Pick any place you like, just so long as you get out of reach of a subpoena. Oh, the heat's on, huh, boss? You've just coined a phrase that may very well catch on. Get out and stay out of the state until I send for you. Okay, Mr. V. Sure, Mr. V. Marshal? Yeah? That about covers us in Baylor, am I right? Yeah, right. The dear governor's dear committee will be sorely disappointed. However, I doubt it'll give up quite so soon. I wouldn't think so. Therefore, have the truck driver deliver another shipment of carrots to the rabbit farm. Eh, Marshal? Okay, boss. Come in, Williams. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Williams, I'm disturbed. The crime committee, sir? It was doing well, very well. And then... I know, sir. There's a leak... Someone is passing on confidential information. Who? That's the problem. Who? Started three weeks ago. A three-man committee, Wilson, McCarthy, Tolliver. One of them, Williams? I'd stake my life, sir, no. Then who? You've forgotten Collier, committee secretary. You have reason to suspect him? No, nothing that means anything, except... You do suspect him? He's been watched, telephone calls checked, mail. I have no reason to suspect him, except that one thing bothers me. What's that? He has a small farm in Greendale County. He rarely went near the place in all the time he's been up here at the Capitol. But that suddenly changed. Three weeks ago? Yes, sir. He's been staying at the farm for three weeks. Is there anything unusual about that farm? Nothing unusual. Except Jimmy Collier has gone in for raising rabbits. Jimmy. Who is... Oh, hello, Claire. You've been hiding from me. I... I've been out here with the rabbits. Jimmy, what's wrong? With what? You. There's nothing. You're lying. We grew up together, remember? We lived next to each other, Jimmy. We were going to be married. Hey, wait a minute. We still are, last I heard. You haven't heard recently enough. What does that mean? It means we're not getting married. But, Claire, You've been avoiding me, and you've been getting money, lots of money, from someplace. And in a shady way, I feel. All right, you know. So what? I've been concerned about your sudden devotion to these... these rabbits... And the kind of men you've been seeing. What do you mean? Like the one up at the house now, waiting for you. Oh, there's somebody waiting? That's why I came down here after you. I'd better get up there. He's a crook, Jimmy. Look, I... All right. I sort of got myself in a mess. I needed money and... But it's over, Claire. No more. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wish I could believe you. For your own sake. But I feel I can't. Not anymore. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Either stop breathing so heavily or... Take the evening off? Stop breathing. Old Dr. Tidmouse wouldn't approve of that. Who in blue and assorted blazes is old Dr. Tidmouse? My family doctor. May have escaped your puny mind, but you don't have a family. Answer the phone. Oh, but it might be a case. It might be very important. It might mean work, Mr. Wolf. Archie. W-O-R-K. You've got millions in the bank. Why worry? Confound you. Do you want me to answer that phone myself? Now you've got me. No, Mr. Wolf. Couldn't let you knock yourself out lifting a telephone receiver. Nero Wolf's office. Archie Goodwin speaking. What? What? Wait. Mr. Wolf is to go up to Greendale at... Oh, now look, friend. Mr. Wolf does not go anywhere, and that includes Greendale. He wouldn't stir out of the house for anybody short of the... Uh, What? I see. Yes, sir, in an hour. Goodbye. Mr. Wolf, brace yourself. You've got an appointment with a Mr. Williams at the Starlight Hotel in Greendale for one hour from now. You're insane. No, I'll admit I've been tempted. Fury, 
Were it not for the fact that often the native hue of resolution is sickly door with a pale cast of thought... Quoting Hamlet will get you no place. I would fire you. And then who would drive you to the Starlight Hotel in Greendale? I'm not going to Greendale. Nevertheless, in an hour you will be there. And who, may I inquire, Cecil? The governor of the state. Is that all, Mr. Williams? That, Mr. Wolfe, is all anyone knows about the situation. Except the guilty man, of course. An admirably clear summary, Mr. Williams. Obviously, our meeting here at the hotel was necessary. I couldn't be seen entering your house, nor would it have been advisable for you to visit the governor. I can appreciate that. You're quite sure I need pay no attention to anyone on the committee except James Collier? Quite sure. Police surveillance of Collier is deemed unwise. He has suddenly taken interest in rabbits, but although keeping them may perhaps be considered suspicious, it is hardly in itself of value. You have no other evidence against Collier? I know we're clutching at straws, Mr. Wolf, but there is a leak and work is being nullified. Something must be done. Hence the governor's call for you. Very well, sir. I shall uh, attempt to be more than uh, a man clutching at a straw. <laughs> I said attempt. Archie. And back. We shall stay at Greendale near Collier and his rabbits. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Wolf? Oh, naturally, I know that shutting your eyes and pushing your lips in and out indicates you're thinking feverishly, but there's nothing for you to think about. Three. Oh, I accept your correction. What are you thinking about? Hotel beds, they're notoriously flimsy. Oh, you gave up on the case so soon. Fiddlesticks. I already know exactly what role the rabbits play in our problem, therefore... We're going to drive out to Collier's farm? You are. While you test the hotel beds, fine. It'll be necessary for you to spend the night at Collier's place. You'll drive out there and pretend you've lost a cylinder or something. <laughs> oh, a lost cylinder. Why? Confound you, Archie, you can invent something plausible as a pretext, and if you are properly charming, Mr. Collier will, I hope, invite you to stay the night. And during the night I sleep, hmm? Happily breathing the fresh country air. <laughs> Trust not. <laughs> okay, Mr. Wolf, I accept the assignment. I will learn all I can from Mr. Collier's rabbits. Incidentally, remember the play Harvey? I do, why? Harvey was an invisible rabbit, a figment of a man's imagination. I hope this rabbit venture is more tangible, Mr. Wolf. It is, Mr. Goodwin. Will you desist and depart? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, if anyone calls, just say I've gone out to Greendale to cross-examine a rabbit. Hmm? Archie, I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of gas, and me such a big boy. Hmm. Ah. <gasps> Hello. Uh, Hello? A tree a friend of yours? The the tree? Yeah, the one you're clutching. Oh, I I was leaning against it. It's an idea, but not a good one. Trees are notoriously skittish. The instant you really need one, they're out sowing wild oaks or something. You sound as if you know a lot about trees. Oh, I do. I was brought up in one. Look, now, if you really have to lean, I can recommend... No, thanks. Huh? I tried. Nice moonlight we're having. My name is Goodwin, and blondes call me Archie. I'm not blonde. Brunettes call me Archie, too. And what do redheads call you? <laughs> oh, we'll just skip that, huh? And your name is... Claire. Claire. I approve. Now, you may not believe this, but I have just run out of gas. You think I might wangle some up at your house? My house? You mean Jimmy's house. All right, I mean Jimmy's house. Well, I I don't know. He might have some. Now, why don't we go up to the house and ask him? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy who? Collier. Uh Uh-huh. I like to be formal when I'm borrowing gas. Would you mind waving your left hand in front of my nose? Waving, Mike? Yes, just try it. Don't worry. I won't bite it. All right. I did. And very gracefully, too. No ring on the third finger. You're not Mrs. Collier. There isn't any Mrs. Collier. 
Are you applying for the position? Mr. Goodwin, I... Now, remember what I confided in you about brunettes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Archie, you're a little rapid. Maybe. But I always remember what old Dr. Titmouse said. What did he say? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. Robert Herrick wrote that. He did? Dr. Titmouse is a liar. How much farther is this house? Well, it's just beyond those trees. I... Oh! What? Uh... Oh, I... There was something ran across the path. It brushed my legs. It frightened me so. Must have been a rabbit. I I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. It was silly of oh, me. Oh, don't worry about it. Also, you will have noticed how much more satisfactory I am than a tree. We're clutching at it moments of stress, I mean. Archie. Mm-hmm. But you'd better let go now. What I... And we'll get on to the house. See, I don't need a haircut, and you're not the right type for Delilah anyway. You mean something by that. Something nasty. Well, that depends. What I meant is you've already signaled whoever you're supposed to signal. Nothing frightened you back there. Why? That scream had a lot of carrying power. Oh, that's the house, huh? Looks peaceful enough. Archie, I... Who were you supposed to warn if anyone came up the path to the house? For no one. Something did frighten Honey, me. Honey, I've been lied to by experts, and you're not one. Ah. Oh. Think I ought to knock? No, we don't think I ought to knock. Dark inside. Except for a handful of moonlight filtering in through the windows. Kind of early for Collier to turn in, isn't it? I wouldn't know. Let's go find out. <gasps> now relax, relax. Grandpa's making with the chimes. Time is... Yeah, ten o'clock. Oh, it's getting late. Come on. This would be the living room. Filled with early American furniture. The early Americans would be pleased. Nothing here. What's that door lead to? I... I don't know. Or I won't tell? Oh, smaller room. Dark as... <laughs> Come in. Good to be here. Oh, you're not the bellboy. I'm sorry. I should have remembered to bring some beer. Indeed, and you are? I'm a fellow guest at this hotel, Mr. Wolf. My name is Veek. Veek, ah, yes. A criminal of moderate intelligence and immoderate pretensions. We won't quarrel, Mr. Wolf. I have something to offer you. You and your boy Goodwin didn't drive up to Greendale for the exercise. I dislike exercise. Shortens life. James Collier lives nearby. The Governor's Committee on Crime is unhappy. There's been a leakage of information. It hasn't helped them in their work. But it has helped you. You wouldn't have left your house in New York on any ordinary job. A request from the Governor, however... Shall we stop fencing? Hmm. I don't have to fence with you. The Committee's work doesn't particularly bother me. I've already made my arrangements for retiring from active business, shall I say... However, I don't want you messing around in the meantime. Indeed. In your effort to discover how the committee's information leaked out, you might also discover a number of things about me that I prefer to remain undiscovered. No one has employed me to do anything about you, sir? Not directly, but indirectly you might have to. I want to insure myself against any such possibility. I want to make a deal with you. I'm ready to supply you with the name of the man responsible for the leak and papers proving his guilt. I have them here. In return for which you expect... A quick conclusion to your activities and your return to New York, leaving my name out of your reports. I'm neither a public official nor a philanthropist. I should do nothing about you unless it becomes necessary. You may remove your hand from your pocket. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Now then, the name of the man. James Collier. Proof of his guilt? These... A series of reports on the committee's meetings in Collier's handwriting. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And I hope for your sake that we do not meet again. Phew. Archie, answer the... Oh. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? I'm at the Collier place. Since it takes only ten minutes to get there, may I congratulate you on your speed? I've been at the Collier place for nearly an hour. Doing what? Oh, 
discussing Rosebud. Your so, delay has been explained. Good night. And for another, I was being around when someone got murdered. Ah, you laid hands on the murderer? No, the room was dark. The time I got Claire untangled from me and started looking for somebody with a gun, he'd left. I see. And the dead man, of course, is James Collier. No, sorry. Found it, it had to be. Who was he? Total stranger. Ah, gee. I'm not being difficult. There was no identification on him. Strange. A description. Early 30s, height maybe 5'10", weight around 175 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a very natty dresser. Suit custom tailored with a built-in shoulder holster. Don Juan shirts. Manicured but very dirty fingernails. And he... Uh-oh. Company. The police? Mm-hmm. Very well, you tell them whatever you think proper, without mentioning the governor's committee, of course. You then bid them farewell and come to the hotel. Can't I say goodbye to Claire, too? You cannot confound you, Archie. Do you think I want to wait up all night? Police were not happy about letting me go, but I threatened to tell you on them, so they gave up. You have told me the entire story of what occurred at the Collier Farm, Archie? Mm Mm-hmm. All details. If you like, I wouldn't mind repeating the parts about Claire. Phooey. You may call it phooey, I call it love. By the way, did you know that it was Robert Herrick who wrote that... Confound po- you, be quiet. Okay, push your lips around, but you've missed something. I have? Mm-hmm. The burning question of the day. The night, brother. Which is? Where is James Collier? Ah! Stop buying. The cops want him on suspicion of murder. The way it shapes up, he shot our unknown pal and then headed for the nearest border. Nonsense. You mean he didn't shoot our unknown pal? I mean, Collier's whereabouts are not a mystery. You know where he is? I know where he is. I don't believe it. You couldn't know. You haven't been out of the hotel. You haven't had any calls. Archie, I use my intelligence. If you had used yours instead of holding the girl... I still wouldn't know where Collier is. Never mind. I'm impressed. What do I do now? You get Mr. Veek on the phone. Huh? He's staying here at the hotel. Old home week. Operator. Mr. Veek, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Veek. Mr. Wolf wants to speak with you. Just a second. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Mr. V, where were you at 10 o'clock? Why, on my way to the hotel. You checked in at... At 10.15, then came directly to your room. One other question. You have an employee, a man in his early 30s, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and well-dressed. Am I correct? Yes, that is Marshall. No, that was Marshall. Good night, sir. Having done that, whatever it meant, we now go to sleep? Hooray, we go to the Collier Farm. Okay, but why? Because, Archie, uh, <laughs> the time has come to cross-examine the rabbits. <laughs> Confound you, Archie. You're not driving a truck. Be careful. Truck drivers are careful. Also, they are courteous. Indeed. Furthermore, they will always stop to help a motorist in time of trouble. Archie, are you training to become a truck driver, or have you fallen in love with a truck driver's daughter? Her name is Susie, a hair the color of wheat fields at high noon. Never mind turning purple. I'm about to change the subject. Boss, I have a theory. Stick to truck drivers. As follows. Our boy Collier, who had been selling information to Veek, had a change of heart and decided to turn ethical. But Veek's man, Marshall, at Veek's orders, tried to apply pressure, so Collier shot him and headed for Canada. Ah, and the girl's robe. Must have brightened my life. Ah. Oh, you mean about her playing sentry? Well, she's in Veek's employ, too. Fooey. Don't like my theory. It's charming. It merely happens to be wrong. Merely happens to be... Why is it wrong? Because Archie of a dead man's dirty fingernails, Marshall's fingernails. Oh. Well, you made me bring you to the rabbit hutches. We have arrived. There are the rabbits. Go ahead, cross-examine them. Hmm, good many hutches. A large pen for the rabbits to run about in. Notice that they're all cowering at the far end of the pen, ran as we entered. That's because they don't like us, maybe, huh? <laughs> one of them, however, seems to be friendly. The one up here, in at the corner opposite us. Oh, yeah, there is one here. He's not friendly, Mr. Wolf. Indeed? He's dead. Somebody stole in his skull. Interesting. What's interesting about a dead rabbit? He may be dead now, Archie, but he was friendly. Too friendly. 
Claire, this is Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, this is Claire. Claire, I'm Archie. Ah, a chair, Archie. A chair. Try this one. Be gentle with it. If you break it, all the early Americans will hate you. It was a... Uh... Steady. Oh. Ah. oh, now then. Mr. Wolf, I'm dreadfully tired. The police have... Are idiots. What? For example, do they know that you were posted as sentry outside this house in order to warn James Collier of any intrusion? Well, they don't... I wasn't. I... Do they know that James Collier and the dead man Marshall were quarreling? No. Do they know that James Collier had armed himself in preparation for this meeting with the gunman? That isn't true. It I... is true. I don't have to say anything. You've already said more than enough with your actions, my dear. What, what do you mean? According to Archie's report, and Archie's always meticulously accurate, when you and he opened the door of the room in which the murder took place, you screamed at the shots. Well, of course. Any girl would scream with... Then you clung to Archie with sufficient force and for sufficient length of time to prevent him from chasing the murderer. Why? I... Because you had seen and recognized the murderer as the man you loved. It was too dark to see anything. True. Therefore, you didn't have to see the man. You thought you already knew who the killer had to be. That, that's a lie. You're shielding James Collier, aren't you? I'll never admit any of it. Never. May not be necessary. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Get hold of that policeman outside and remember what happened to one particular rabbit. Well, uh, look around for freshly dug earth. Midnight. What, what are we waiting for? A return? Archie's? No, it'll take him longer. Well, then whose? <gasps> Mr. Veek's, of course, complete with the revolver. Come in, Mr. Veek. It couldn't have been easier. No one outside, only the two of you here. I warned you, Wolf. Fiddlesticks, you merely tried to use me as a prop for an alibi and a rationalization for a motive. I don't understand. Mr. That... Wolf does. Indeed I do. Did you really think me fool enough to believe your proposal, Mr. Veek? It was plausible. It was nonsense. You pretended you were handling James Collier, plus the proofs of his guilt, over to me in an effort to keep yourself out of the picture. But your proposition was silly. No matter how much I might have wanted to help you, I would have been powerless once James Collier went before a jury. You are too intelligent not to know that. That couldn't have given you enough to go on. It didn't. You yourself gave me more. I did. When you came to my room, you told me you knew Mr. Goodwin and I had come to Greendale, checked in at the hotel. I did. However, when I phoned you later and asked for an account of your movements between 10 and 10.30, you replied that you had driven to the hotel, signed in, and came directly to my room. Obviously, you already knew of my presence in the hotel. How? I, uh... Only one way you could have known. You had seen Archie at some time prior to the time you checked in at the hotel. And the only place where Archie was... Was here, at the farm. Yes, which told me Mr. Veek had been here at the time of Marshall's death. What was Veek doing here? Only one thing. Murder. <gasps> then he killed the gunman. No other possibility. But Jimmy, I thought he did it. James Collier couldn't have killed Marshall because at the time he was killed... James Collier was already... already dead. Archie! What's this? Leave it, Cuffy. Let's play. Untrap that gun first. My arm! Oh. That's nice and cooperative, so... Oh. He'll be quiet for a while. The cop is back in the rabbit pen, Mr. Wolf, guarding Collier's grave. Grave, Archie? Yeah. With James Collier in it. Oh. Poor Jimmy. Veek knew the expose was coming. He had to shut Collier up. So he had his gunman, Marshall, kill Collier and bury him in the rabbit run back of the hutches. You spotted that, boss, because of... A dead rabbit. The others scurried away from the man who bore James Collier's body to that lonely spot. But one rabbit overcame his fear. He was too friendly. And got killed for it. There was that and... And the, the dirty fingernails of Marshall, the gunman who killed and buried James Collier. Your description indicated extreme neatness. The dirty fingernails were a wrong note. Yeah, indicated he'd been digging. So we know now, don't we? Veek killed his own trigger man to frame a dead man for it. 
Collier would be thought guilty. He'd be hunted among the living. And all the while... Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Claire. It's all right, Archie. I didn't love Jimmy. That was all washed up. Mr. Wolf, I understand everything, except why did Jimmy suddenly start staying at the farm with the rabbits? He knew he'd be watched. He couldn't risk conveying his information by telephone or the mails. Nor could he be seen holding conversation with men who might be traced to Veek. But who would suspect a truck driver delivering carrots for the rabbits as being the go-between for Jimmy Collier and Veek? Nero Wolf. Which is why I hope there's an adequate bed in this house for Mr. Wolf. I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Splendid, Archie. You will have the police remove Mr. Veek and then... And then maybe Claire would like to uh, go gathering rosebuds, huh? By moonlight? I would like to. Sure. I shall go up to bed now. I've seen the moonlight more times than I care to remember. However, while you and Miss Claire stroll through the moonlight, Archie... Yeah? You might remember that rosebuds have thorns. <laughs> you have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Martha Shaw, Hal Gerard, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Impolite Corpse. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is the delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. Now it's Sam Spade. Then, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... An Angle on Murder. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the mutilated foot. Then I grabbed her. And I wound my fingers around her throat. <laughs> squeezed her windpipe tight. <laughs> Tighter and tighter. <laughs> What's the matter, Patsy? Oh, Nick, put the lights on. All right. And I said I wanted to hear the recorded confession you made of that mad murderer who killed his wife. I didn't think I'd have to listen to it in the dark. Well, that's the way we got him to confess in the first place. Oh, I'll take it, Patsy. Okay, Nick. Nick Carter's office. Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Nicholas Carter. This is Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello. John Hamill, the banker's associates. Oh, hello, John. How have you been? Nick, I'm in trouble. I can't discuss it over the phone. How soon can you meet me? Where? On West Street, around the corner from the Greystone building, where my offices are. Please get there as fast as you can. All right, John. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Scubby, you understand exactly what you're to do? Yeah, Nick. Okay, I'll see you later. I've got a date in this corner. Okay, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Hey, look at that car coming up the street, would you? Hey, Nick, watch out! That car is headed right at you! Jump, Nick! 
Oh. Did he hit you, Nick? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, gee, that was close. It almost seemed like whoever was driving that car did that on purpose. Wouldn't be at all surprised, Cubby. I think somebody is interested in preventing me from keeping my appointment. Hey, look, maybe I better stay with you, Nick. No, I've got something else for you to do, Scubby. I got the number in that car. Hop down to the license bureau and find out who it belongs to. Then wait for me at the office. Oh, Nick. Uh, sorry, I'm so late. Oh, hello, John. I've been on this corner waiting for you for 20 minutes. Where have you been? Trying to get here without anyone seeing me. Well, why all the mystery? What's up? Wait a minute, Nick. Here, get back in this doorway, quick. Don't let him see us. Well, who was that? Somebody trailing you? I don't know. I never saw him before. Well, then why'd you want to dodge him? You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Nick. Absolutely nothing. Now listen, I don't want the police in on this just yet, if I can help it. A banking firm like mine can't stand any unnecessary notoriety. Well, yes, I know, John, but what's this all about? Well, let me explain. I wanted to tell you out here where I can be sure no one will hear us. You see, Nick, several days ago, I discovered there's a serious shortage on our books. Somebody has been taking money from the accounts, and I'm almost, almost sure I know who it is. I've called a meeting of my four partners. They're upstairs in my office waiting for me right now to have a showdown before the stockholders find out. That's why I ask you to come over here, Nick. You may have to make an arrest tonight. Well, you don't want a detective, John. You want a cop. No, no, no. You're wrong, Nick. I want you. Please come along. Well, perhaps you better wait down the lobby while I go up and see if everything's all right. That is safe for you to come No, out. no, Nick. There's no need for that. All right. I John. want to be in on the showdown. Come on. Anything you say. And if you really feel that something dangerous is in the wind, I think I should go up there first and look around. Then if everything's okay, let you know. No, no. I want to go up now and get it over with. Well, you insist. I do, Nick. Oh, I know it's pretty late, but I waited purposely till the offices were closed to avoid any publicity. This whole business requires the greatest secrecy. Twenty-fourth floor. Oh, this is our floor, Nick. After you, John. Oh, thank you. Kind of dark in this hallway, isn't it? Yes, the lighting isn't any too good here, but I... John! John! Johnny, you hurt bad? What's happened? Why is John? Uh, quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen, John Hamill is dead. John Hamill is dead, but that's terrible, terrible. How did it happen? That's what I want to know. You seem to know him. Who are you? Well, I could ask you the same question. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter, the detective? Yes. Oh, well... My name's Tom Burdick. I'm one of Hamill's partners, and uh, uh, these are the others. Uh, Mr. Carter, I'm Emil Garrick, and this is Arthur Nelson and Alan Cornish. How do you do, Mr. Carter? You're Cornish, huh? Yes, Mr. Carter. What do you know about this? Nothing, nothing. I I was in my office all the time. No, that's not true, Cornish. I saw you go out in the hall just a few seconds before Hamill was shot. That right, Cornish? Yes, I, I did go out for a moment. But when the shot was fired, I was back in my office. But why question me? Why don't you ask Burdick where he was on Nelson Mechanic? Well, I can easily explain where Mr. Nelson and I were. We were both together in my office preparing some papers for tonight's meeting. That's right, Mr. Carter. I was with Mr. Garrick. Which of you men belong to which office? Well, you can see the layout yourself, Mr. Carter. They all open off this L-shaped corridor. First comes Nelson's office, then Burdick's. There, on the long leg of the L. Then on the corner at the end is Cornish's office, directly in line with the corridor to the elevator. And Garrick's office is around the corner on the short leg of the L. That's right. Hmm. That's out of sight of the elevator completely, isn't it? Sure. You can't even see the corridor from my office. So I see. Then, Cornish, your office is the only one which faces the corridor. I'd like to have a look at it. All right. This way. This is my office, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Peculiar order, yeah? Let's see. Well, what are we here in this umbrella stand? A gun. A what? what did you and say? it's been fired very recently. I should say, gentlemen, this was the murder weapon. That's Mr. Cornish's umbrella stand. What do you know about this, Cornish? I don't know anything about it. Well, that gun belongs to Mr. Cornish. That's right, Mr. Carter. I've seen it in his desk many times. I recognize that fancy handle. Say, what are you fellows trying to do? Well, sure, it's my gun. But I haven't seen it for three days. Someone stole it on my desk, Mr. Carter. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because I... I didn't carry a permit for it. I was afraid of getting in trouble. Cornish, I regret that appearances are against you. 
I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. You won't turn me over to the police? Well, what happened to the lights? Cornish, turn them out. Turn those lights on, somebody. Oh, there you are, Mr. Carter. There he goes, Carter. It's Cornish. He's escaping down the hall. Stop, Cornish. Stop or I'll shoot. You see, Patsy, I was right with Hamill when he was murdered. What I can't figure out was how he was shot when there was no one else in the hall with us. Don't ask me, Nick. And here's something else. I heard only one shot fired. But Cornish's gun had three empty shells. And to top it all off, here's the bullet that killed Hamill. The coroner gave it to me. Notice how it's all banged up? Yes, how did that happen? I wish I knew. Patsy, if I knew the answer to that, I think I'd know the answer to this whole case. Until we find Cornish... Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Carter? Yes, this is Nick Carter. Oh, this is Alan Cornish. I... I suppose I'm a fool for calling Wub Carter, but I need help. I'm desperate and I can't go to the police. You've got to help me prove I didn't kill Hamill. Why'd you run away, Cornish? Because I was scared. Lucky for me you didn't hit me. Don't worry, Cornish. If I'd really wanted to hit you, I would have. Where are you now? I'll tell you, but you've got to promise to come alone. If you don't... The I... only thing I'll promise you is that I won't do anything until I have to have talked to you. Now, what's the address? 1813 Oak Street. Come right over. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, sit tight. I'll be there. You mean we'll be there. I'm sick of sitting around here. I'm going with you. Eighteen thirteen Oak Street. This is it, Betsy. Gosh, what a creepy looking place. Ah, certainly not very attractive. Well, come on, let's go in. Maybe he's not here. Said he'd be here. Wonder if... The... Well, the door's open. Should we go in? We can't keep our date with Cornish if we don't. Gosh, it's dark in here. Nick, do you suppose it could be a trap? You never can be quite sure, Patsy. But here's the door. Stand behind me. You see anything in there, Nick? Wait till I get my flashlight. No. Nope. Looks deserted. Oh, come on. Let's try another room. Gee, this place gives me the jitters. It's practically deserted. Maybe he's in here. Stand back, Betsy. No, nothing in there. Maybe he got scared after he called you and slipped away. We'll soon find out. There's another door. Over there. Yes. He's hanged himself. Well, Nick, I don't know why we came back to the office again tonight. Cornish is dead. I guess that closes the case. Let's see. I'm not satisfied. When I talked to him on the phone, he certainly didn't sound like a man who was going to kill himself. When a man wants to prove himself innocent, he doesn't commit suicide. No, Patsy, there's something about that hanging that's bothering me, and I can't lay my finger on it. You probably figured that was the best way out. To kick over the chair and end it all. Patsy, remind me to give you a raise. And what did I do? I got it! Look, Patsy, Cornish was a short man. Well, so what? Patsy, Cornish couldn't have hanged himself. Well, why not? Don't you remember, Patsy? The only furniture in that room was a bed. And Cornish was so short, he never could reach that noose from the bed where it was. Of course, Nick. The bed was on the other side of the room. Patsy Cornish was murdered, which eliminates him as a suspect. Probably he was killed by the same man who killed Hamill. Oh, but who, Nick? Who? I wish I knew. I wish I Hiya, knew. Nick. Hiya, Patsy. Well, if it isn't the missing link. Scubby, did you find out anything about that car that nearly ran me down this afternoon? Oh, you bet, Nick. Good. But what a time I've been having. Wait till you hear what I have to tell you. Well? I had to get the license commissioner out of bed to get it, but, oh, boy, it was worth it. Hey, do you know who that car belongs to? Tom Burdick, Hamill's partner. Good boy, Scubby. You get his address, too? Yeah, some deserted neck of the woods out in Long Island. I've got the address here somewhere. Fine. Come on, Scubby. You and I are going to pay him a visit. You know, Scubby, the more I think of it, the more it looks as if Tom Burdick might be mixed up in this some way. Oh, I hope so, Nick. Otherwise, we're using up a lot of gas in this jalopy of mine for nothing. Hey, have you noticed anything funny, Nick? You mean that car that's been trailing us for the last few minutes? That's it. 
What do you make of it, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. But I think we'll be finding out quickly enough. They're overtaking us. Better step on it. Okay, Nick. Here we go. How are we doing? Not so good, Scubby. They're still gaining on us. Can you give her any more gas? I'll try. There. They still coming up? Yes, Scubby. And fast. Duck, hey. Scubby. They're shooting at us. You're telling me. Watch it. Here they come. Well, I've done all I can, Nick. This old bus won't go any faster. Well, let's try an old trick, Scubby. When they get close to us, slam on your brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Yeah? They won't be expecting that. It may throw them completely off balance and spoil their aim. Okay, Nick. You say when. Now, pull over. Okay. <sighs> oh, boy. That was a close one. Are you all right, Nick? Yeah. Well, we won't see them anymore for a while. Get going, Scubby. We've got to make up for lost time. Well, Nick, I've got to hand it to you. You have the darndest way of getting into a cellar. Well, we had to get into Verdict's house somehow. This cellar with its creek entrance from the garage looked like the safest way. Especially with those two vicious-looking dogs posted at both the front and back doors to the house. Well, they sure were big ones, too. I'd hate to meet one of them. Hey, where do you think this is going to lead us to, Nick? We should find a stairway going upstairs. That's not very much mistaken. Yeah? Yeah. Here's one. All right, let's go up. But careful. All right, Nick, you lead the way. I'm with you. Here's the door. I hope it's open. No, darn it, it's locked. I'll soon fix that. There. All right, Scubby, come up. No, wait, wait, wait. Someone's coming to the room, Scubby. Get back. We can hear through the crack of the door. I'll leave it open in a loop. Well, Mrs. Bertig, I'm certainly glad you called me up. I'm only too happy to be here at a time like this. After all, we're practically neighbors, aren't we? Oh, I just had to talk to someone, Mr. Garrick. I'm so worried about Tom and those horrible things that have been happening at the office. What do you make of all this? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Mrs. Burdick. Tom can take care of himself, if he has to. What do you mean, Mr. Garrick? Nothing, nothing. But he has been acting rather strangely lately. Well, that's just it. I'm so worried. I haven't seen or heard from him all day. He's never been so late coming home from the office. Well, it's after 11. Oh, there's really nothing to worry about, Mrs. Burdick, even in a case like this. Of course, it looks very peculiar for Tom to be missing his way, especially at this particular time. Mr. Garrick, I'm... you don't think Tom had anything to do with all this sort of... Well, Mrs. Burdick, I like Tom very much. I would hate to think that Tom had anything to do with this murder. Of course, things are... Well, Scubby, we don't seem to be learning much this way. Might as well go in and let him know we're here. Sure, Nick. Good evening, Mr. Garrick. <sighs> Why, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I just came along with one of my assistants, Scubby Wilson, to talk to Mr. Burdick. We came in this way because we didn't want to disturb the dogs. Oh, really? Uh, who are you? Oh, Mrs. Burdick, uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge of investigating Hamill's death. Mr. Carter, the detective? Nothing's happened to Tom, has it? I don't believe so, Mrs. Burdick. I just want to ask him a few questions when he arrives. Well, maybe that's why Tom hasn't come home. Maybe he's afraid of... Uh, maybe that's he now. Wait, wait, I'll go look out the window to see if that's his car. Carter, I must warn you to be careful. Burdick's a dangerous man. Tom! Tom! Nick Carter's here! Please, Mrs. Burdick, come away from that window. Here to see you. you won't do him any good that way, Mrs. Tom. Burdick. Tom! Stop Tom. it, you hear me? Please! Hey, that's his car, Mr. Carter. Look, he's getting away. Come on, Scubby, let's get after him. Okay, Wait, I'll go with you, Carter. Hurry up. I want to know why he runs away when he hears my name. I hope this car of yours stays on the road, Carter. Don't worry about it, Mr. Garrick. Carter, I, I didn't want to say too much in front of Mrs. Burdick, but we've all been afraid of Burdick. All right, all right. Scubby, just keep your foot on that throttle and keep after him. Oh, boy, we sure made that one on two wheels. Nick, I'm pushing this crate as fast as she'll go, but we don't seem to be getting any closer. That car of Burdick's can sure step. As long as we hang on and don't lose him, I'll be satisfied. Hey, watch it. We're coming to a railroad crossing. So I see. Well, maybe we can head him off now. If Burdick tries to beat that limit to the crossing, he's crazy. Look, Carter, I think he's going to try to make it. He can't do it. He'll be killed. Oh. oh, Nick, that nurse 
nurse that just came out of the operating room is signaling you. Oh, yes. She wants me to go into Burdick. You wait for me here, Scubby. Okay, Nick. Burdick? Burdick, can you hear me? Yes, Carter. I can hear you. Carter, I'm a dying man. Yes, I... I know. I swear to you, I didn't kill Hamill or Cornish. Then why did you try to run me down with your car this afternoon? Carter, I didn't do that. All I know is that for several hours this afternoon, my car was mysteriously missing. I didn't find it again until I started home this evening. Bertie, why did you run away from your home tonight when your wife told you we were there? And how about the securities we found on you after the wreck? It wasn't you. It was securities. I took them so that... Yes, Burdick? Why did you take them? I took them so I could keep him from stealing them. Who? Burdick, who? Burdick, who's he? Carter. Front office. Bottom drawer of desk. Something will lead you to murder. Yes, Burdick? Who's the murderer? He... He is... Burdick. Burdick. Oh, poor chap. If you'd spoken sooner, you might have lived longer. Oh, Nick, I got here as quick as I could. Have you found anything yet? I think so. Scubby Burdick wasn't lying to me. I found this in the bottom drawer of the desk in the front office here. A book? Well, is that what Burdick meant? Just look at that title. Studies of Various Angles of Bullets in Flight. Well, so what, Nick? Scubby, that's the way Hamill was killed. It all adds up perfectly. Now I know why I heard only one shot when I found three empty shells in the murder weapon. Three shots were fired. But two of them were fired at a different time from the third. Well, do you know where the other two bullets are, Nick? I do. Follow me out in the hall and I'll show you. Yeah? You see, Scubby, as soon as I found that book in the flight of bullets, I did a bit of looking around. And I finally found them. Well, where are they? In the office here? No, Scubby, in the corridor. Right over there in that dark corner, embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft, about a half a dozen feet from where Hamill was killed. Well, what are they doing over there? Scubby, this was a very ingenious crime. And if you watch carefully, I'll show you just how ingenious it really was. Now, you notice that Cornish's office is the only one facing the corridor leading from the elevator. Yeah. So what? Well, in order to shoot someone coming down the hall, the murderer, if he were in any office but Cornish's, would have to step from his office out into this corridor and be seen. Right? Yeah, right. But our murderer was very clever. I got the answer when I located the book and when I found these embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft. The two missing bullets. Right. Well, hey, they're all banged up. Precisely, just like the murder bullet. And that's what gave me the answer. You see, Scubby, yeah. the murderer never left his office. He stood inside the front office, the one around the corner, on the lower leg of the L-shaped corridor, and aimed at that steel pillar built into the wall over there. When the bullet hit the steel face of the pillar, it was deflected into Hamill's lungs. Look here. You see these marks in the face of the pillar here? Where? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are the bullet marks. Oh, well, gosh, Nick, that's fantastic. Hey, are you sure you're right? Positive. Don't you see, Scubby? That explains the other two shots that were fired. They weren't fired at Hamill, and they weren't fired at the time the murder was committed. They were practice shots used by the murderer to be sure he had the correct angle from which to shoot Hamill. Gosh, Nick, I've certainly got to hand it to you. Yes, but we still have to get the murderer. But how? And who is it, Nick? I rather think that if we step back in the office and wait, we'll find out soon enough, Scubby. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that whoever it is will be in this office within the next few minutes, because after my discoveries... I made a couple of phone calls, and I invited the two remaining partners to meet me here. Shh. Here comes someone now. Oh, Oh, how do you do, gentlemen? Oh, hello, Garrick. I got your phone call, Carter, and I got here as fast as I could. Garrick, have you seen this book before? Mm, Studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Why, yes, now that I think of it, I think I have. Does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. 
But I remember that one day when I was with Mr. Nelson, he stopped in front of a bookshop and looked at it. Rather closely now that I think of it. Yes, I, I'm sure it was Nelson. Very interesting. Now tell me, Mr. Garrick, when the murder was committed, are you positive that you and Mr. Nelson were in this office together? That's right, Mr. Carter. And you show me exactly where each of you stood at the time the shot was fired. Well, now let me see. I was uh, here, facing the window, and Nelson was, well, standing uh, right about here by the door. Mm hmm. I see. Did you notice in which direction he was facing at the time? Yes, I remember. This way, facing the corridor. In other words, the way he was standing, you could see him only in profile. That's right. Well, there's no question that that's how it was done, Scubby. The murderer planted himself in this office so that he could establish a strong alibi. He then took the gun from his pocket, unseen by the other person in the room, who could see him only in profile, and then fired it at that steel pillar. Then as he ran into the corridor with a rest, after Hamill was dead, he dropped the gun into the umbrella stand in front of Cornish's office. Well, Carter, do you mean that Nelson is the one How who... do you do, gentlemen? Uh, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, Nelson, you did. Why did you kill Hamill and Cornish? Please, Garrick, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Nelson, does this book look familiar to you? Uh, this book? Uh, no, I can't say that it does. You sure you've never seen this book before? Hmm. Now that you mention it, I may have glanced at it in a bookshop at one time or another, but then I look over a lot of books. I like to browse. I see. Nelson, see how you approve of this story of Hamill's murder. Yes. The killer knew of Cornish's criminal record, and he figured he could embezzle some of the firm's money and pin it on an innocent man. Then when he found out that Hamill was becoming suspicious and was having the accounts checked... He became panicky and afraid that it might not work out the way he had planned. So he decided to kill Hamill. Then when he happened to overhear Hamill's conversation with me over the telephone, he hurriedly borrowed Burdick's car without Burdick's knowledge and tried to get rid of me. That's an interesting way out, Mr. Carter. Have you also a theory as to who the killer is? I have. By the process of elimination, it has to be either you or Mr. Garrick or an unknown. And I've already proved that I didn't do it. It must have been an unknown then, Mr. Carter. I certainly didn't kill Hamill. I had nothing to do with the murder. When the shot was fired, I was right here in this room with Mr. Garrick. He can testify to that. He has already, Mr. Nelson. In fact, Mr. Carter, I was standing right here facing the window when the shot was fired. Oh, no. That's where I was, Mr. Carter. Standing there at the window. Now, now please, Garrick. Please, please gentlemen, please. please. I... You don't have to argue about it. I know who was at the window. And I know who fired the fatal shot. Scubby, take a look at the flyleaf of this book. Well, what are they, Nick? They look like the scribbles that some guys draw when they have nothing else to do. Oh, doodles, they call them. Exactly. While I was looking through the various offices, I found some papers with these same doodling marks on them in one of the desks. And these marks were made by the murderer. Garrick, I arrest you. Oh, Sergeant, murder... he's got a gun! Stop. 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 Oh. Uh. Well, Scubby... Pick up the pieces. Oh, boy. There's the murderer, Garrick. He's also the man who tried to murder you and me last night in the road of Burdick's home. Oh, well, I'll be... You see, Scubby, Burdick has his suspicions about Garrick. That's why we found those securities on him. He took them so that they wouldn't fall into Garrick's hands. He'd suddenly found out that Garrick was an unscrupulous crook. And that was the reason he ran when Mrs. Burdick called him. He saw Garrick at the window and was afraid of him. Well, Nick, I must say he had me fooled when he said that Nelson was standing at the door of the office here when he was really there himself. Yes, and telling us who was in this office, our clever murderer just reversed the positions in which he and Mr. Nelson were standing when the murder was committed. But once I saw the marks on that flyleaf, I knew who stood where. And that's why I had Nelson come up here, to force Garrick's hand. Well, Nick, one way's as good as another as long as you get results. And you always seem to do that. decided to come back, did you? Yes, Patsy, it's all over. Well, I think you can go home now. Why, Mr. Carter, are you sure you can spare me? Why not? You've been so busy on this case all night, Mr. Carter, you may not have noticed that it is now a new day. And a good secretary is always on the job the first thing in the morning. Shall I take a letter, Mr. Carter? <laughs> This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. 
Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what's next week's story all about? Well, when this case was first brought to me, it seemed so routine and uninteresting that I practically turned it down. But it was far from routine once you got into it, wasn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. So far from it that I almost got myself bumped off investigating it. It's really the story of a man who thought he was so much cleverer than Nick that he could outwit him every time. I don't suppose he got away with it. No, he found he wasn't really so clever after all. Like practically every criminal I ever met, he gave himself away by being too clever. Well, sounds like an interesting tale, Nick. Not only interesting, but downright exciting. But more of that next week. So long, folks. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by George Gordon. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Body on the Slab or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Beginning Wednesday, November 3rd, The Return of Nick Carter, which is produced in the studios of WOR, will be broadcast over most of these stations on Wednesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Wartime. Remember the new time, Wednesdays at 8.30 Eastern Wartime, beginning Wednesday, November 3rd. This is Mutual. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This the Diamond Detective Agency? Well, what does the sign on the door say? Yeah, uh, Diamond Detective Agency. And take a guess. Uh, are you Mr. Richard Diamond? It depends. How much does he owe you? Uh, uh, nothing. You just want to speak to him? I do. You come as a client? Yes, I do. You have a hundred a day in expenses? Yeah, I do. Then I now pronounce this man and client. Your name, please? Uh, my, my name is Thomas Jason. The stockbroker? Well, you better pay cash. Oh, I, I'm retired now, Mr. Diamond. And to end this uh, nonsense, here's your hundred dollars. Oh, thank you. Now, what's your trouble? Uh, it's Carol, uh, my adopted daughter. Uh, we adopted her when she was 12, uh, but my wife died shortly after. Frankly, Carol has been trouble ever since. And now? Uh, now, I, I'm afraid it is no longer a matter of delinquency. I, uh, well, there have been several incidents that make me suspect that she's trying to do away with me. Oh, sweet girl. What's her reason? My money. In my will, she is my only heir. Why not change the will? I, I said I suspected her, but I'm not certain, Mr. Diamond. And you understand, it would be terrible to disinherit her if I am wrong about my suspicions. I, I, I simply must be sure before I change my will. Do you have any idea of your suspicion? Yes. Yes, yes. This morning I did speak to her. They mentioned the possibility of cutting her from my will. She flew into a rage, made several terrible threats. Oh, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, I want you to... Oh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, we have the only corpse with the lie-down design. Oh, Rick, why don't you answer the phone right? Okay, Helen, baby. Diamond Detective Agency, Mr. Richard Diamond speaking. What? See, it throws you. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, honey, I'll see you tonight. i got a client. She? He. Good. Bye. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Jason, before I was so nicely interrupted. Yes, I, I want you to either prove my fears to be true or groundless. If I am right... I will change my will, of course. Where do I start? Uh, come to my house at three this afternoon. Here's the address. I'll introduce you to my stepdaughter, Carol, as a business acquaintance. 
After you've met and talked with her, I'll give you what details I have about her threats and actions. Okay, Mr. Jason, I'll be at your place at three this afternoon. Uh, Good day, Mr. Diamond. I checked the time and found it to be nearly 12, so I beat it out to grab a bite of food before the noon rush began. Cafes in downtown Manhattan at lunchtime can only be compared to a can of sardines after all their relatives move in. When I had downed my daily bread, I went back to the office, did a little washing, and found myself with still time to kill. So being interested in my new client's problems and always liking a clear view of a new case, I dropped in at the 5th Precinct to see what Lieutenant Levison had on the Jason family. When I walked into the squad room, I found Sergeant Otis tilted back in his chair with his number 14s crossed on the desk in front of him. From the sounds he was making, he was either sleeping or gargling with molasses. Sergeant Otis. Oh, boy. Sergeant Otis. I'm down. Otis, wake up. Oh, what? Oh, oh. Oh, it's you, Shamus. Patrol leader Diamond with his stout-hearted brownies who are shocked by your dreams. Shame on you. Hey, how'd you know I was dreaming about a dame? I peeked. Mm. You know, I think I'll tell the lieutenant that you were sleeping on the job. Well, oh, oh, no, please don't do that, Shamus. You'll start me pounding the beat again. Please don't tell him. Well, maybe I'll let you off the hook, but only if you tell Walt we're pals. That might stop him from giving me the devil about ribbing you. Pals? You mean friends? Buddies. Oh, no, I couldn't stand it. Hello, Walt. Okay, so where's the body? Nobody. You lost one? Now you stop that. Well, get you. All bad because I can't find a body for you. Oh, please, Rick. What do you want? I just wanted any dope you might have on the Thomas Jason family. Jason? Yeah, the broker. Oh, oh nothing on him, but plenty on his stepdaughter, Carol. Like what? Oh, she's a regular. Usually D&D, drunk driving, disturbing the peace. You want to see the file? Yeah, I might be worth a look. Uh, have my pal, Otis, bring it in. Sure, up. I... You what? My pal. What did you know? Otis and I are friends. <laughs> Is that why he tries to hide under the desk every time he sees you coming? Call him in. See for yourself. You think I won't? Otis, get the file on Carol Jason. Bring it in here. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> now we'll see, friend. <laughs> That's a laugh. <laughs> That's a laugh yourself. You better be feeling good. Yeah, what do you mean by that? You'll see. Uh, here, Lieutenant, here's the file. I'll take it, Otis. Thank you very much. Sergeant Otis, you have an opportunity to do me a great favor. Please, and without profanity, tell me what you think of Rick. Oh, he's nice. What? You're turning blue, Walt. I'll turn blue if I want to. What did you do to Otis? Dope him? You heard him. He thinks I'm nice. We're pals, buddies. I heard him all right, but I wouldn't believe it on a stack of police manuals. Otis, I'll give you one chance. What's this all about? The shamus told you, Lieutenant. I think he's a swell like A great guy. Thank you, Otis, my friend. Uh, always kidding, but a good pal. Otis, do your feet ache? My feet? Why, no, Lieutenant. Well, they will. I'm sending you to a beat. A beat? Yes, in Yonkers. Oh, no! <laughs> I went through the file on Carol Jason and found out Walt hadn't been kidding. She'd been picked up for everything from kicking dogs to slugging her boyfriend with a champagne bottle. Real nice girl. I left Walt trying to third degree the truth out of Otis and headed for what I hoped would be a nice easy case. In a few minutes, I was in front of my client, Jason's house on East 66th Street. It turned out to be a modest little shack of some 30 rooms with a brownstone cover. I was ushered in to wait in the library for Thomas Jason. But I got a surprise. Mr. Diamond? Well, now I'll bet you're Carol. Your stepfather's told me so much about you. You're a friend of my stepfather's? Well, uh, you might say we have things in common. Where is he? I'm afraid you can't see him, Mr. Diamond. You see, he's become quite ill. Oh, ill so quickly? I talked to him a few hours ago. He's about as sickly as Paul Bunyan. Mr. Diamond, will you please leave? Not until you tell me what happened to Jason, where he is, and why I can't see him. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, put a cork in it, honey. Your father suspected trouble. Apparently, it came quicker than he thought. Me, I want to know all your little secrets. Just who are you? Policeman? Private policeman, dear. Your father hired me this morning. Well, I'm firing you this afternoon. Father's ill, and I will not allow him to be disturbed. He paid me for a day's work. 
Tomorrow you can fire me. Is he here? No. Now, will you get out or do I call the real police? No, oh, maybe you'd better, dear. There's a smell around here that isn't a room full of roses. All right. If it's going to save trouble, I will tell you this much. Father had a serious mental condition. This afternoon, a couple of hours ago, he had an attack. And I was forced to have him taken to a place where he could be treated properly. With what? Embalming fluid? Why, you insulting... Where was he taken? Who's the doctor? I think I've answered all the questions I need to, Mr. Diamond. My actions are entirely legal. If you persist in your insinuations, I shall see that your license is revoked and that you are charged with defamation of character. Oh, get you. You've been reading up on the law, and I bet I know why. All right, dear. I'll leave now. Go on, and don't come back. Temper, temper, temper. I'm going, but we'll see each other again. Uh, hello, Pop. Got a minute? Yeah. You reckon so, Misty? What's on your mind? Oh, questions. Like how long you've been out here mowing the lawn? Uh, most of the day. Why? Did you, uh, see Mr. Jason leave? Oh, sure. Left in an ambulance, he did. He was wearing a funny white coat with the arms tied in back. Oh, my fashion certainly changed. You didn't notice any name on the ambulance, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, Mister. Oh, my, it was a silly name. About the silliest I've ever heard of. Oh, the name, Pop. What was it? Oh, don't be in such a dang rush. It was uh, Home Sweet Home Rest Home. Oh, no. Ain't that silly? I don't think my client agrees with you. If he was taken there for a rest, it may be a permanent one. Next stop, a drugstore with a phone book. Said book gave me the address, and I was soon in Baychester, looking at something pretty swank in the way of nuthouses. Home Sweet Home was two acres of lawn, trees, and a square white blockhouse, and all surrounded by 15 feet of spiked steel fencing. By this time, the setup was really beginning to smell, and I decided that maybe a shamus might not be welcome. So for a moment, I stood by the big gate debating how I could get in. The answer was fairly simple. I rang the bell. It caused a huge character wearing a white jacket with arms like hairy telephone poles to appear. Yeah... What can I do for you, mister? Now, let me in. Why? This is a rest home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I want to rest. Oh, funny. Beat it. I want to speak to the doctor, King Kong. Is he in? Maybe, maybe not. Who wants him? I do. Who are you? Ah, let's just say I'm a patient. You want to keep me out here dying of schizophrenia? Dr. Thorne is busy now. Come back later. Look, in one minute I start throwing fits... Think how that'll ruin your trade. Yeah, the doc wouldn't like that. Maybe you had better come in. Now, that's right neighborly of your friend. Wow. Nice place. For nuts? Please. I'm a patient, remember? So, if you're a nut, I should care. If you ain't, why should you? Now, that's a homely bit of philosophy. Tell me, what do you do here, break skulls? I don't think I like you. And I'm a nurse. What a shock this will be to Dr. Kildare. I don't know him. Now, you wouldn't. His nurses are pretty. If he had to have you as a nurse, he'd quit medicine and take up playing the glockenspiel. Well, you're nuts. Wait here. I'll get the doctor. Yes, nurse. Dr. Thorne, you got a patient, I think. All right, Brasso. I am Dr. Thorne, sir. What can I do for you? He's nuts, Doc. Be quiet, Brasso. Oh, he's right, Doc. I, I'm nuttier than a squirrel's hideout. Well, I'm afraid I can be of no assistance, uh, Mr. Promise you won't tell? Did I promise? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? H O L. I can spell. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, Mr. Holmes. This is a private sanitarium, and certain procedures must be followed. I have money, I can pay, and I want to stay here. But, Mr. Holmes, you must be examined by a doctor and committed by a relative. You're a doctor? Examine me. But your relative, you you can't commit yourself. Why not? I demand my rights. Oh, this is preposterous. This is not a hotel. You can't just come in and register. Tell me, who's your doctor? Where is your home? Well, look, look. Tell you what, you let me stay here for the day and I'll tell you who my doctor is. And if you don't let me stay, I'll tell everyone what a bad place you have. Uh, you, uh, you said something about having um, money. Just how much money? I've got a mattress full. Can I stay? Well, perhaps it can be arranged. 
Though, of course, I must examine you. Of course. And there will be a certain um, fee, you understand? Mm, I'm beginning to. Tell me, Mr... Um, H-O-L. Uh, stop! Mm, you certainly are most annoying. Tell me, why do you want to stay here anyway? Well, I, I've got to stop the plot. The, the plot? You know about that? Sure. You plan to rub out fearless Fosdick, but I'm not going to let you. Oh, I see. Tell me, do you, uh, do you have any dreams? Well, of course. I have dreams about eating ice cream cones, and oh, what a mess they are. What's so messy about eating an ice cream cone? My mouth is always filled with BBs. BBs? For my air rifle, stupid. How else could I stand off the Indians? Well, what Indians? Well, the Indians who want to steal my ice cream cones. Now, why would Indians want your ice cream cones? Oh, they're mad about pistachio. You are crazy, aren't you? Brazo, take Mr... Um... H-O-L. Oh, never mind. Take him to observation room B, Brazo. I don't have time for the examination now. Uh, wait, uh, can't I be with the other patients? I get lonely. Later, later. Come on, Sherlock. This way. Well, I was in, thanks to the good doctor not being able to pass up a possible easy buck. The big ape Brazo led me to a small room with bars on the window and a spring lock on the door. When he left, I made like a smart gumshoe and went after the lock with my penknife. Due to my early training in picking locks at the automat, I was out like Alabama. I found myself in a long hall with seven rooms, three on each side and one at the end. I knocked on every door. Nothing. Not even Bogart. The last one had to be Jason. Are you in there, Mr. Jason? Diamond. Oh, oh, I am glad to hear your voice. Please, get get me out of here. Just take it easy. I don't have a key, and this door has a padlock on it. But you must get me out. Sure, sure, but give me time. First, tell me what's the score. Why did they lock you up? Carol had it planned. She has paid Dr. Thorne to keep me here until I go crazy. She wants to have me judged legally insane so she can take the estate. Yeah. Well, maybe I can put a few kinks in her plan. Wait, wait, Diamond. Where are you going? Uh, There's a phone in the doctor's office. If no one's there, I'll use it to get help. Yes, but what if you can't get to the phone? And I go out and get the Marines. If I can get by that ape man, that locked gate. Don't go away. Oh, there you are, Sherlock. Oh, don't pick on me. I was only three and a half years old. I'm upset with you, Sherlock. You oughtn't to be running around the halls like this, huh? Well, that guy's got to have his constitutional, Brazo. Yeah, well, you're through with yours. The doc wants to examine you now. I, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think I'd I like it I said the doc wants you what the doc wants he gets. Well, bully for him, but this is one time you won't. I'm leaving. I don't want to break your arm, Sherlock. No? So you don't leave until the doc says so. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but certain things are necessary, like this. Oh. Now, you shouldn't act like oh. that. I might get mad. Oh, my knuckles. What is your jaw made of, concrete? Uh, come on, Sherlock. Or do you want to try again? Uh, no, thanks. One busted hand is enough. And don't try to run. The gate's locked. And if I have to catch you, <laughs> I'll fix your leg so you can't run again. Oh, friendly little butcher, aren't you? Uh, right in here, Sherlock. The doc is waiting. <laughs> here he is, Doc. Good. <clears throat> you can go back to the office, Brazo. I won't need you. Well... You seem to be well trained as a detective, Mr. Holmes. Do you always pick locks so easily? I do better with my erector set. Uh, but you needn't examine me further. I've changed my mind. You've changed your... This is odd. First you demand in, now you want out. I just remembered I forgot to pick up my station wagon. But the Indians. You want me to help you keep them from stealing your ice cream cones, don't you? Uh, they already got them, and all my money, too. They're both gone. Your money? But you don't have any money? Not a bolivar. Now, may I go, Doctor? You're going to stay right here, Mr. Holmes. There's something peculiar about the way you've recovered from your illusions. Uh, Doc, uh, Miss Jason to see you. She's in your office. Very well, Brazo. Stay here and guard this man, whoever he is. Uh, Holmes, age old. Will you shut up? I make sure he stays put this time, Brazo. I have some questions I want to ask him. He won't go in the place, Doc. You go ahead to the office. Well, Carol... This is a pleasant surprise. Come to visit Jason. Though, and our plans will have to be changed. Changed? Something has come up that may cause an investigation of stepfather's illness. We can't afford to take a chance of that. But we can't let Jason go now. I had no such intentions. He must be taken care of tonight. Taken care of? But that's impossible. How could I... He must be gotten rid of. What? Oh, no. 
No, I didn't bargain for murder. Look, Thorne, you're in and you're staying. I paid you $10,000. Don't forget it. But why all this sudden rush to change our plan? Why can't we A do private it? detective came to see me this morning. He was hired by stepfather. I knew he had suspicions, but I didn't know they'd gone so far. A detective? Oh, he can't act legally, but he's a sort to cause trouble. Detective. Private detective. Sherlock Holmes. He's rambling about. I'm afraid we're in serious trouble. Come with me. What? Your private detective. I think he's already found Jason. Come on. Hey, you wouldn't like to earn a hundred bucks, would you, Brazo? No. It is you, Diamond. Uh-oh. Fun's over. Thorne, you fool. How'd he get in here? He said he was a patient, Carol, and I swear he seemed crazy enough. He probably said he had money. Uh, you seem to understand each other, honey, but do you mind? I'd like to take Mr. Jason home For now. a couple of extra dollars, you let him walk right in. Oh, Thorne, you're an idiot. I suppose he's found Jason and talked to him. Well, he did get out of his room and wander about. Oh, that's great. So now I know the whole works. Uh, too bad, baby. Your plan is kaput. Not quite, Diamond. You've just talked yourself into real trouble. This gun says for you not to get any bright ideas. My IQ just dropped 30 points. Shut him up, Rizzo. Sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh! Now, stay with him while Thorne and I make arrangements. We won't be long. <laughs> Do I get the Yes, Rizzo, when we're ready. Yeah. Come on, Thorne, I want to talk to Stepfather. <laughs> Brazo's fist was made of the same stuff as his jaw. By the time I came around, darkness had painted the window, and the room was full of shadow and Brazo. The big hulk was squatting a few feet away, paying no attention to me. So I waited till my mind was clear while I eased off my right shoe. The heel was leather with a steel plate in it. I could only hope it was harder than Brazo's skull. With the shoe in my hand behind me, I was ready. Only to have him catch me stirring. <laughs> Coming to, eh, Shamus? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, hand me my cigarettes, will you, Brazo? You need a smoke, eh? Oh. <laughs> sure. So where, where are they? Uh, fell out of my pocket, uh, over there behind you. Oh, where, where? I don't see you. <laughs> I say, that's not... Need another? <laughs> Stop that. Oh, come on, Buster, fall. <laughs> well, is little old Brazo finally getting sleepy? Happy New Year, Buster. Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick, if you don't want me to be a customer of yours, get out to the home sweet home rest home fast. What? Hey, what kind of a gag is this now? It's no gag, believe me. My client and I are the blue plate specials and dinner is about to be served. The home sweet... Oh, it still sounds like a gag. Who'd call anything that? Now, don't argue, Walt. It's no joke. Okay, Rick. What's the address? 1820 Allerton Avenue, Baychester. And bring a blowtorch to cut an iron gauge. You may have to. All right. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Uh, Quicker, if you can. Stand right there, Diamond. Or I'll use this gun. Uh, Good afternoon. I represent the sleep fight. Looks like I came just in time. Only now that you've fixed Rosso, you have to dig your own grave. Dig my own grave? Oh, honey, is this trip really necessary? Keep moving or I'll kill you right here. I I move. Keep going. Over there behind those trees where Thorne and Jason are. Well, is Jason... He's alive, but not for long. Where's Brazo? I thought he was going to... Diamond knocked him out. I can dig their own graves. There, the shovels. Get busy. Carol, please, you may have the money. I swear... Shut up and dig. Carol, this is... Just work the shovel. Can you imagine Richard Diamond, private detective, letting a sawed-off female make him dig his own grave? You can't? Well, she did. And for a good half hour. I stalled as long as I could to give Walt Levinson a chance to get there. That's enough. I said that's deep enough. Oh, please, I'm just started. You're finished. Jason, get into that hole with him. Uh, Very well. I, I guess this is it, Diamond. I'm sorry to have dragged you in. Well, that's a horrible way to say it. Don't we get time for a last cigarette? No. Thorne, take this gun. What? Oh, no, I'm not going to kill them. Shut up and take this gun. Oh, don't do it, Thorne. Be a man about it. Here, Thorne. Don't be such a weakling. Two shots and it's over. No. It was your idea. I'm no murderer. That a boy. Stick up for your rights. You shut up. 
Thorne, do you do the job or do I make you number three in that grave? You wouldn't dare. You, you need me. Shut up, boy, Thorne. Tell her. Go on, Thorne. Take the gun. <laughs> no, I can't. I just can't. Not my fist. You whistling. I'll do it myself. Now, turn around, Diamond. Oh, now, look, baby. This thing's getting out of hand. You shoot me and the law will be all over the place. Not until I've filled that grave in over you. I call them, baby. Oh, you're lying. Am I? Well, just turn around and take a look at that lovely big fat policeman standing over there by that tree. Oh, you really don't expect me to fall for an old stunt like that. Well, if you don't, you'll fall for something. It's your funeral. No, it isn't. It's yours. All right, lady, drop it. What? Why, you... Smarty. I'll kill you anyway. <laughs> Carol. Rick, Rick, what the devil's going on here? What are you doing down there? I'm looking at the girl. I, I think you shot her pretty bad. Who are these two guys? Well, the guy with the cast in that knees is Doc Thorne. Better put the cuffs on him as an accessory. But you can't do this. I was the one that re refused to shoot you. Oh, stop licking my hand. You can tell it to the precinct judge. Otis, snap the cuffs on him and take him out of the car. Sure. Come on, you. Now, what about this other guy? The girl's stepfather. How do you feel, Mr. Jason? Sick, Mr. Diamond. How about the girl, Rick? Shall I call the ambulance? I don't know. Carol. Carol. Well, Rick? Ah, take your time, Walt. She's not with us. I gave Walt the story, then took Jason to his house. Stayed there long enough to brush the dirt off my clothes, wash my hands, and then I headed for a delayed date. At 975 Park Avenue, I found the big fireplace and the lovely redhead waiting for me. A redhead wearing a dress that was part green silk and part... Well... I'm the library, darling. Come on in. Oh, uh, hello, Helen, baby. You sound like you found oil in the basement. What's with the cheer? Me? Isn't it always? I like you. Hmm, I like the way you say that. Looking up at me with those big green eyes. They're not green. They're hazel. Oh, are they? Hmm... Let me look closer. Uh, not until you sing for me. Sing? Oh, honey, I'm tired. I want to rest. No, you don't. No, over to the piano. No, Rick, not here. But, Helen, all I wanted to do was... I know, Rick. Oh, you've been using that Ouija board again. I don't want to sing. Now look in my eyes. Close range? Contact. I'll sing. That's better. Like, uh, you must have been a beautiful baby. I love it. You must have been a beautiful baby You must have been a wonderful child When you were only starting to go to kindergarten I bet you drove the little boys wild And when it came to winning blue ribbons must have shown the other kids how I can see the judge's eyes As they handed you the prize I bet you made the cutest bow Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby Cause, baby, look at you now Like that? That was wonderful, Rick. Come here. Mm, about time. Mm. Oh, Rick. Do you think you can do that and sing, too? Honey, when you look at me like that, I could kiss you, sing, and knit a whole sweater at the same time. Rick, could you? Want to try? A sweater will take years. I'll buy that. Come here, we'll start with the neck. Rick. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm, you know something? Mm, what? I may even knit you a whole suit. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, Edwin Max, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week 
when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How much is your life worth? Think about that for a minute. Is it worth a little care? Well, that's all that's needed to protect it on America's streets and highways. Only your careful driving and your acceptance of personal responsibility for your own life can guard you from the dangers of the road. The price that you may pay for carelessness is a high one, and it's a price that thousands upon thousands of accident victims have already paid. Their gamble with death behind the wheel is a stark warning. A warning that an accident can happen to you. Last year alone, some 32,000 persons were killed in traffic accidents, and well over a million others were injured. Smash-ups have averaged more than one a minute, every minute of the day and night. These are the facts of traffic dangers. As for the facts of traffic safety, well, they all boil down to just two facts. Careful driving by automobile owners, careful walking by pedestrians. So drive carefully, walk carefully. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned to NBC's star lineup of shows. Each Saturday, make it a point to listen to NBC. You'll hear Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. Now, stay tuned for Lionel Barrymore and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. First Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean he's missing? Missing from where? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how long ago did he leave? Uh-huh. How much money? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I understand. Now, just hold the phone. I want to connect you with the detectives. Yeah. Just hold on. That's right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. After I went through the customary routine of turning out the platoon, reading reports and communications, and inspecting the cells and other parts of the station house, I went out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number three. At 10.30 a.m., I returned to the station house to keep an appointment with the owner of one of the many nightclubs in the precinct, who asked to see me in regard to the application of several of his new employees for cabaret worker permits, which are under the jurisdiction of the police department. After he left, I went into the back room and up the rickety stairs past the 21st detective squad on the second floor to the third floor, where the precinct youth patrolman, the safety officer, the civil defense patrolman, and the precinct hack inspector each have their offices. As I walked down the narrow hallway, I could see inside the open door of the hack inspector's office. Patrolman Jaffe sat behind his desk, and a man wearing a baseball cap and a washed-out sports shirt stood in front of him. And how long after that was it before you noticed the briefcase in the back of your cab? Captain? Hello, Jaffe. Well, I took the car around the corner, and this lady flags me, and she gets in. When I turn around to listen where she wants to go, I see the briefcase. Listen, what do you want from me? I brought it into the station house, didn't I? You're supposed to thoroughly search the interior of the cab after discharging each passenger. There was trucks double parked and a line in back of me when he got out. How could I hold up traffic? I ought to send you down to the hack bureau on a violation. For what? For being honest? For not looking in the back of the cab as soon as possible. I told you. Uh, Jaffe. Yes, sir, Captain. I want you to call down to the license bureau and check on these for me. Yes, sir. 
The owner of the cabaret was just in my office. He's got these new people working for him, and he hasn't heard. Yes, sir, I'll get right on it. Could I go now? I'm only losing time. Yeah, you can go. But look in the back of your cab, will you? I will. Don't worry about that. Oh, Jaffe, if the desk officer calls, I'll be in the detective squad. Yes, sir. For being honest, you're getting a jam. Well, you've got to be honest faster. Listen, I came in at the first station house I passed at the first opportunity. I brought the briefcase right in and gave it to the lieutenant down there. The lieutenant gave me a hard time for being honest. He just wants you to stay honest. Well, so long. Whole deal over nothing. Over a briefcase. Is uh, Lieutenant King in his office? Oh, yes, sir, Captain. He's in there. Yes. Captain Kennelly. Come in. Hello, Matt. Captain. You busy, Matt? No, sit down, Captain. I was just going over the telephone record of the squad. Those guys are supposed to enter every outside call they make. Well, we batted a great percentage last month. There's entries for about half the calls. Well, I guess what you need, Matt, is bookkeepers, not detectives. Yes, sir, I guess so. What can I do for you, Captain? Hold on to your chair, Matt. Ma, oh, what's up? The second and third floors are going to get a coat of paint. <laughs> well, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. They'll be here at 8 o'clock next Monday morning. Oh, I didn't think I'd live to see the day. Everything? Walls? Woodwork? Everything. What about the muster room and your office? Well, they say that can wait until next year. Did they take a good look at it? It can still wait. Yes. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Yeah, Cassidy. Lieutenant Lawrence K. of the 112th Squad is on the straight line, Lieutenant. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. Well, Matt, Wait I... just a second, Captain, if you have time. Yeah, sure, okay. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Hello, Matt. Larry, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, listen, Matt. Yeah. A uh, guy walked in the house out here and says he's office manager of the Sunning Hill Lennon Service at 764 East 80th Street. Yeah. Lester Mappin, M-A-P-P-I-N. He said he went to the bank for Hudson Trust Company, Lexington Avenue branch, to get his company's payroll. Yeah? He says two men forced him into a car just outside the bank, brought him out here, and dumped him on Queens Boulevard. How much was it? $3,129.60. You got a description of the man in the car? We're just starting to talk to him, Matt. He just this minute came upstairs. The desk officer sent him up. Sounds like a straight story, though. He said all they took was the cash. They left the bank book and duplicate deposit slip with them. So they didn't want that. The slip shows a deposit of about a dozen checks. There's a time stamp on it. 10.38 a.m. Okay, Larry. I'll send a couple of men out there to get them. If you get anything that looks like it could be a line before they get out there, would you get back to me here? Yeah, sure will, Matt. All right, thanks. I'll mention it. What is it, man? Payroll stick up, Captain. Yeah? Two men grabbed the office manager of a linen service as he was coming out of the Lexington Avenue branch of the Hudson Trust Company. Rode out to Forest Hills and took $3,000 off him. Cassidy. Yes, sir? Come in here. Yes, sir. Any descriptions of the car or the men? Just starting to talk to them out there. Oh. Yes, sir, Lieutenant? What are you working on? Well, nothing much until just now, Lieutenant. What happened just now? I took a call from the Sunning Hill Linen Service, 764 East 80th Street. Yeah? Their office manager left for the bank over an hour ago to get a $3,000 payroll. He hasn't shown up yet, so they're getting a little bit worried. I've got a right to be worried. They got him out at the 112th squad. He was stuck up by two men coming out of the bank. They loaded him into a car and drove him out and dumped him in Forest Hills. Oh, yeah? Call him back over there at the linen service. Tell him what happened. Yes, sir. Who's out there with you? Novak, sir. Take Novak and ride on out to the 112th. Get this guy, all right? Yes, sir. All right, get going. Novak? Uh... Oh, looked for a while like it was going to be a quiet day, Captain. You uh, hadn't counted on it, had you? No, sir, but I had my hopes up. Detectives Cassidy and Novak left immediately for the 112th precinct in Queens, where the man who had reported he had been robbed of a $3,129 payroll was being interviewed. Before I went downstairs to the muster room, Lieutenant K., the commander of the 112th detective squad, again telephoned Lieutenant King, the commander of the 21st squad. Lieutenant K.'s detectives had obtained more details from the victim and a description of the two men he said robbed him. He also gave a description of the car, but was unable to furnish a registration number. At noon, sector car number four came by the house for me, and I again went on patrol of the precinct. During the course of the patrol, we rode up Lexington Avenue, and as we approached the branch of the Hudson Trust Company, I saw the patrolman on post, patrolman Charles Lasky, on the sidewalk. I instructed patrolman Mercado, the operator of the car, to pull over to the curb. All right. Wait here, Mikado. 
Lasky? Yes, sir, Captain. Hello. Well, where were you? Where was I when, Captain? When those two stuck the gun on the fellow coming out of the bank and took a $3,000 payroll from him. Today? About 1040. Today? Not last night. Well, this is the first I've heard of it, Captain. What's your ringing time? 39. What happened? Well, the office manager of a linen service got a $3,000 payroll out of the bank. Came out here on the sidewalk. Two men accosted him, forced him into a car, and drove him out to Forest Hills. Didn't you hear about it? Well, I rang in at 11.40. The sergeant didn't tell me anything. Well, I don't think he knew about it then. No, it's been awful quiet on the post, Captain. Did you ring in on time at 10.39? Yes, sir, right on time. Where'd you ring from? Well, the call box right here in the corner. Well, how long were you on the corner? Didn't you see anything? No, sir, I... Didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Didn't you see two men walk up to another one on the street? One that was coming out of the bank? No, sir. You're sure? Captain, I, I would have noticed something like that if that happened. You're positive you were on the corner here at 1039? Yes, sir. I was ringing in. Well, what length of time did you talk to the sergeant? Well, for a couple of minutes, Captain. He was giving out an alarm on a lost child. Then where did you go? Well, if I remember correctly, I stayed right here on the corner for a while and... Oh, yeah, there was a car parked in the no-standing zone here, so I, I wrote out a summons to hang on it. Right here on the corner? Yes, sir, it was parked right here. Let's see the summons, Stub. You have it in your book? Yes, sir. Let me see. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, the car was parked right here. I, I wrote out the summons at uh, 1043. Mm -hmm. In other words, you were on this corner for at least five minutes. At least five minutes, Captain. The uh, car you wrote out the summons for, it wasn't a black Plymouth two-door, was it? No, sir, it was a convertible. Did you see the driver? Uh, a Chevy convertible, green. Yes, sir, I saw the driver when she came out. She'd been in the drugstore for a while, and when she came out, I was still writing the summons. Were there any other cars parked between here and the bank at that time? No, sir, there weren't. You're sure? Well, if there were, Captain, they, they would have gotten a summons. Come on over to the call box a minute. Yes, sir. No, I didn't see anything going on here, Captain. If anything was going on at that time, I would have seen it. Yeah. One eight first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Captain Kennelly on box 14. Yes, sir, Captain. Sergeant, uh, look on your telephone record and tell me what was the last time Lasky rang in. Yes, sir. 11.40, Captain. Uh -huh. And the time before that? 10.39, Captain. From box 14? Yes, sir. From box 14, both times. Sergeant, connect me with Lieutenant King, will you? Yes, sir. Hold on, Captain. Twenty-first squad, Lieutenant King. This is Captain Kennelly, Matt. Yes, sir. Matt, uh, did that hold-up victim tell the detectives out at the hundred and twelfth that the two men accosted him as soon as he came out of the bank? Yes, sir. They held a gun on him, took him across the sidewalk to the curb. Yes, sir. That's right. Said they had their car parked there right at the curb. Down at the corner from the bank. Yes, sir, that's right, down at the corner. Uh, Matt, I'm over on that corner now. Yes, sir. Lasky on post here was on this corner from the time of the robbery and for at least five minutes afterwards. He didn't see anything like that happen. Well, he might have missed it, Captain. The guy said it happened awful fast. They got him in the car in a hurry. Oh, uh, that's the point, Matt. Lasky says there was only one car parked here. It's a no-standing zone. He gave the one car parked here a summons, and it wasn't the getaway car. It was a green convertible. Is he sure he was there during the time of the robbery? Well, the man's deposit slip was stamped 1038 in the bank. Isn't that right? Yes, sir, that's right. 1038. Well, Lasky rang in from this call box here at 1039. Oh, did he? Yes, and he was standing here writing out the summons after that. The time on the summons is 1043. That puts a little bit different light on things, Captain. Yeah, I think it does. Did they get back from Forest Hills with the victim yet? No, sir, but they left there. I expect them back any minute. Well, I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about this robbery, Matt. So am I, Captain. If there was such a thing. All right, I'll be in in a little while. Yes, sir. Captain, if those stick-up men parked that car there, I'd have seen it. I'd have tagged it. I don't think there was a car. If there wasn't a car, Lasky, there wasn't a stick-up. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. You hear your confession repeated over and over again, drummed into your head. They make you memorize it, sign it, 
and by torture and drugs, they finally get you so you yourself believe it. Then, finally, they put you on the witness stand, and you hear a voice admitting the guilt. You don't even care anymore. You hardly realize that it's your own voice, repeating the words they want you to say. Yes, that has happened in some countries. But there's a very good reason why it couldn't happen to you. Fifteen words in our Bill of Rights are your protection. They say very clearly, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. When we read about the rigged trials, the phony witnesses, the drugged confessions that take place in certain countries today, we're pretty glad that our Constitution was written by men of foresight. Well, maybe they couldn't look ahead to our day, but they were determined to protect us against such things happening in this country. For ourselves, for generations to come, this right exists, assuring us of fair trials, due process of law, and no one can compel us to be a witness against ourselves. It's right there in black and white, in words that have been unaltered for 165 years. It is one of our freedoms. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. When I got back into the car, I instructed Patrolman Mercado to return to the station house. He made a right turn at the next corner and came downtown on 3rd Avenue. I got out of the car and told him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. Then I crossed the sidewalk walked up the stone steps into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. All right, 17. Division call. Inspector McBride wants to talk to you. All right. As soon as I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. What's doing, Ray? 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what's the trouble, lady? Yeah. Yeah. Heavy smoke is coming out of the smokestack? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You call the Department of Air Pollution Control. Air Pollution Control. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Worth 40495. Worth. W O. Well, I agree with you. Something ought to be done about that. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Don't mention it. Uh, what time did Inspector McBride call, Sergeant? Oh, it was uh, 12.14, Captain. Oh. I told him you were out on patrol. I asked him if he wanted you to get a radio call put out for you. He said no, just have you call him when you got back into the house. All right. Oh, and there's a couple of other messages. I left them on your desk. Okay. Can we go straight on through the back there, Mr. Mappin? Hello, Cassidy. Oh, Captain. Uh, Mr. Mappin, this is uh, Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. How do you do, Mr. Mappin? Well, it's too bad what happened to you. Yes, and in broad daylight, right on the street, in broad daylight. Oh, Cassidy, will you tell Lieutenant King I'm back in the house? Yes, sir. And uh, that I'll be upstairs in a little while. Yes, sir. All right, right back that way, Mr. Mappin. Now, you just can't tell. You just can't tell about what? You just can't tell what's going to happen to you in broad daylight. Yeah. Well, lots of things can happen. Upstairs. Yeah. And how did they know I was going to be in the bank and when I was going? Oh, they have ways of finding those things out. In broad daylight? Yeah, well, it has to be in broad daylight. The bank isn't open at night. It's right over that way. Uh, who is it I'm going to see? Lieutenant King. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. Right back there to that little office. I'd like to get a chance to call my office. Oh, you will, Mr. Mappin. I'd like to let them know where I am. You can call them. Yes. Cassidy, Lieutenant. Come in. Go ahead. Thank you. Lieutenant King, this is Mr. Mappin. Why are you, Mr. Mappin? Well, considering everything all right, I guess. Sit down, please. Thank you. Where's Novak, Cassidy? He's parking the car, Lieutenant. Okay. Well, that was some experience you had, Mr. Mappin. Yes, it was. I'd really like to call my office and let them know where I am. All right. Use this phone. Thank you. Hello? This is Mr. Mappin. Yes, yes, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. No, no, they didn't hurt me. Could I talk to Mr. Douglas, please? Thank you. Did you bring back a description of the men in the car, Cassidy? Oh, yes, sir. Here's a copy of the 61 they took from him. Here's the bank book and the deposit slip. They gave that back to him. Uh Uh-huh. Hello, Mr. Douglas. No, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. They didn't touch me. All they wanted was the money, I guess. No, 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 I'm not worried. I'm all right. I I called to tell you I'm back in New York. 
I'm at the 21st squad, 21st detective squad. That's on the second floor of the precinct house. Yeah, yes, that's right, sir. That's, that's right, Mr. Douglas. I'll ask him. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Mr. Douglas wants to know if you'd like him to come over here. No, that's not necessary right now. We want to talk to him, but we'll let him know when. There'll probably be someone over there to see him. Mr. Douglas, the Lieutenant says it's not necessary for you to come over. He says they'll send somebody over to see you. All right, sir. Y- yes, sir. Yes, sir, I will, Mr. Douglas. Goodbye. Yes, sir. That's my boss. He's really being very nice about the whole thing. Well, he's insured, isn't he? Oh, yes, of course he's insured. Now, Mr. Mappin. Yes, sir. I'd like to get the whole story of this from beginning to end. Is that all right with you? Well, I told it to the detectives out there, and I told it again to your two detectives when they came. Well, you really ought to get used to telling it, because you'll be telling it a lot more times. Yes, I suppose I will. First of all, where do you live? I, I live at 22 West 80th Street. Manhattan? Yes, sir, in Manhattan. How old are you? I'm 34. How long have you been working for the Sunning Hill Linen Service? A little over five years. You always been employed there in your present position? No, I was one of the cashiers when I first came. I was promoted about two and a half years ago. Just what does that mean, office manager? Well, I'm in charge of the entire office, all the girls, stenographers, and the clerks, and the cashiers, everybody who works in the office. I see. Well, you tell us what the routine is about the payroll? What do you mean, routine? I mean, just how is it made up and who gets it, everything about the payroll itself. Oh, well, of course, it's not our complete payroll, you know. The office help is paid by check, and the drivers and the workers in the laundry get paid in cash. They get paid every week, and we get paid every two weeks, uh, the office help. Why is that? I haven't any idea. It's just a system the accountant introduced several years ago. Must be some reason for it. Yes, I suppose there is. No, payday is today, naturally. Naturally. Well, uh, about 9.30 this morning, I phoned to the bank and told them exactly how I wanted the payroll made up. Uh, That is, I told them the payroll would be $3,129.60. I told them how many fives, how many tens, how many ones, and so forth uh, that I would want. So they'd have it ready when you got there? Yes, that's right, in a package. You took a deposit to the bank also? Oh, yes, checks that had come in. There's no sense making two trips when you can make one. Well, why isn't the payroll made up from the cash that the drivers bring in? It's mostly a cash business, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is, but the money the drivers bring in comes late in the afternoon, and we take it over and put it in the bank in the night depository. Mr. Douglas doesn't like to leave all that cash around the office overnight. He says the safes are not very safe, the ones that we have, that is. He thinks it's wise to put it in the night depository. Oh, so do we. Uh, You went to the bank? Yes, I went to the bank, and first I made my little deposit. It was just 10 or 12 checks from some of the accounts that had come in. I gave the teller the payroll check, and he gave me the package containing the payroll. That was at 10.38 a.m.? Oh, it was around there. I don't know exactly what time. Well, here's a deposit slip from the bank. You can see where it has the time stamped right on it. Oh, yes, I never noticed before they put the time on it. They do, yes. Uh, You left the teller's window with a package of money? yes. $3,129.60. $3,129.60. I headed out the front door to Lexington Avenue, just the way I do every week. When I got on the sidewalk, I turned to go back to the office. You are going to walk back? Yes. It was quite a pleasant day. I thought I would. And then I, I felt myself being shoved up against the wall, and these two men were there. One of them had his hand in his pocket, and I was sure it was a gun. It must have been a gun. It could have been anything else. And they told me to go over to the curb and get into the car, and I did. You just did? Well, there's nothing wrong in that, is there? There's nothing wrong in not wanting to get hurt. I mean, after all, it's only money. You can't take a chance of getting hurt just to save the money, especially if it's insured. Especially, yes. What happened after they put you in the car? Well, they told me to look down at the floor and not to look at either of their faces. They said they wouldn't hurt me if I didn't make them any trouble. And as I said, it's only money. I decided not to make them any trouble. I looked down at the floor, and I kept looking down at the floor. They told me they were going to take me someplace and let me out. They took you out to Forest Hills? That's right. I knew we went across the bridge, and we were driving out Queens Boulevard. I don't know where exactly they were taking me, but they were very nice about the whole thing. They laughed. They gave me back the bank book and the deposit slip, as you can see. They said they had no use for that, and they knew how much trouble it would cause me if they took it and if it was destroyed. They were very considerate about that. Did you ever see their gun or guns? No, as a matter of fact, but I I knew they had them. They must have had them. What made you so sure? Well, the one of them, the one who wasn't driving, he kept his hand in his pocket all the time, you know, in his coat pocket. He said he had a gun, and I couldn't do anything but believe him. You don't blame me for not taking a chance, do you? No, no, we don't blame you. After all, it was only money. Yeah, that's all it was, only money. They drove you out Queens Boulevard. Yes, that's right. And they got to 75th Road. They pulled the car into the curb. And the one that wasn't driving, he opened up and he got out and they told me to go down the subway. Go down there and don't look around. He said a friend of his was standing on the sidewalk there and would follow me downstairs and see that I didn't turn around or talk to anybody, use the phone, anything like that. Well, I, I couldn't do anything else but believe him. And I was glad to get out of the car. Mm, Yes, you were. Yes, sir. I agreed to do exactly what they said, so I went downstairs in the subway. I guess that car just pulled right away. 
I didn't see anybody around there, and I walked a few steps toward the train. Then I decided that that was just a story about having somebody follow me downstairs in the subway. So I got back up on the street. I looked around. The car was gone. And I, I saw a cop standing over there on a the corner, so I just walked over to him and told him what happened. That's all there is to it. Yes. Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Hello, Matt. Captain. Hello, Mr. Mappin. Captain. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to get straight, Mr. Mappin. Oh, yeah, sure. Anything you want to know, I'd be glad to tell you. I, I don't think I skipped anything. Well, there's a few things I'd just like to make sure about. Sure, anything you want. Uh, but listen, could I get some lunch, do you think? Any way I could send out for a sandwich? Yes, we'll get a sandwich for you. Yeah, I'd certainly appreciate it. I haven't had a thing to eat since breakfast. It's getting pretty late. As soon as we get through here. It won't take long. Well, all right, if it won't take long. Uh, you were in the bank at 10.38 a.m. If that's the time it says on the deposit slip, I guess that's what I must have been in there. I, I told you it was right around that time. Yes, you told us. Then you came right outside, started to walk back to your office. That's right. When you got out on the sidewalk, you were accosted by these two men. Yes. They told you to walk to the curb right there in front of the bank. Well, almost in front of the bank. Down closer to the corner a little bit, I think. Between the bank and the corner. Are you familiar with it? The bank isn't exactly on the corner. There's a couple of stores between the corner and the bank, Captain. Yes, I, uh, I know the spot. They forced you to get into a car which was parked at the curb. That's right. Now, you told the detectives it was, uh, see, a 1952 Plymouth two-door. That's right. That's what I think it was. It could have been a 51, but I think it was a 52. Oh. Now, what did you do with the money? Well, uh, they took it away from me almost as soon as I got in the car. They took the package just like it was given to me at the bank. I don't mean about the two men. I mean, what did you do with it? I, I told you, I gave it to them, those two men. Now, how could you give it to them if there weren't any two men? There wasn't any car. Oh, wait a minute. Mr. Mappin, there was a police officer standing on that corner at the very time you came out of the bank. Well, that could have been. In the space you described, there's no parking allowed. The officer was writing out a summons for a green Chevrolet convertible that had been parked there in violation of the law. No other car was parked there at that time. Now, what'd you do with the money? I, I was held up. They took it away from me. Where is it? I told you, that the two men took it away from me. They held me up on the street and made me get in the car. Captain, could we get Patrolman Lasky in here and have him describe the conditions on the street at that very time? We sure can. How soon do you want him, Matt? Let's get him in here as soon as possible. We'll have to take a ride out to Forest Hills and go to his sister's house. My sister's house? Yes, that's right. If you won't tell us where the money is, we'll find it. Well, what are you going to do at my sister's house? Find the money. It's not there. I don't have it. But you were there this morning, weren't you? No. Now, why would your sister lie to me? I made a telephone call to the house. She answered the phone. I asked for you. I told her I was a friend of yours. She said you weren't there, but you had been there this morning. You came to visit her, and you left. How about it, Lester? Well, nothing about it. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, I knew you picked Forest Hills for some reason. While you were on the way back here, I called some people at your office, asked them who your relatives were. They told me you had a sister in Forest Hills. Is the money there, Lester? It is there, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it's there. I didn't even unwrap it. I didn't even take it out of the package. It's there. Now, why did you want to steal it from your boss? I didn't want to. I, I just... I, I had to. I just had to. You believe me, Captain? I just had to. What do you mean, you had to? I just did. Well, what were you going to do with the money? I needed it. I... I wanted to go to Europe. Everybody was going to Europe. I wanted to go to Europe. I, I wanted to take a trip. Well, Lester, I don't think you'll get to Europe, but I do guarantee you a trip. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. What kind of accident? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is anyone hurt? Do you need an ambulance there? Now, who was hurt? Passengers of the bus or passengers of the car? Did the sergeant's car arrive on the scene yet? Yeah. Well, what are the traffic conditions there now? Yeah. All right. I'll notify the communications bureau to send an ambulance. Yeah. Are you placing the driver of the automobile under arrest? Okay. All right. Yeah. And 
so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Harold Stone, Santos Ortega, Frank Marth, John Larkin, George Petrie, and John Sylvester. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Just a moment, suspense with Ann Southern. Dilly, turn that radio down. How can we play bridge? Okay, Mom. I like the auto light show, but not so loud. Whose deal is it, May? Mine, Mary. My husband Ed always listens, too. When he's home on Thursdays, our house sounds just like his service station. I know what you mean. Tonight's probably spark plug night. You'd think the announcer with his commercials would be enough, but no. It's switched to auto light resistor. Spark plugs. <laughs> I know. Batteries and ignition systems. <laughs> well, Dora, what are you dreaming about? Oh, auto light? You mean the show with Ann Southern? Oh, Mary, tell Billy to turn up the radio again. I wouldn't miss suspense Billy, for will all. You turn the radio up, your Aunt Dora. Yes, went... ma'am. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Ann Southern in Anton Leder's production of Beware the Quiet Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Bourbon and soda with a twist of lemon. Okay, coming right up. Say, your name Margie? Yeah. How'd you know? He generally come in here with a heavy set guy, black wavy hair, wears a big diamond. Yeah. Yeah, he was in a while ago. Said to tell you he'd be late, but for you to be sure and wait for him. But I can't wait. I gotta get home to my. I gotta get home. How late do you say he'd be? Oh, about an hour. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, give me some nickels. Yeah. 
Here you are. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Banning, please. Yeah, Mr. Arthur Banning. Arthur? Margie. Uh, I I'm going to be late for supper. Yeah, I, I ran into a girl I used to know at Lincoln High. She wants me to have a drink with her. Yeah. And say, will you pick up some hamburger on the way home and start the potatoes? I'll be there as quick as I can. Bye. Now, here's your drink. Well, here's mud in your eye. Um, uh, there's a young fellow down the end of the bar who wants to buy you one. No, thanks. Well, it looks like a nice guy. That tall blonde fellow over by the mirror? None other. And you got a whole hour to kill. Is he... He isn't drunk, is he? No, nah, he's had a few, but he always carries it good. It might help pass the time. Say, what's it to you anyway? Five bucks. You say, I'd sure appreciate it. He offered you five bucks to get me to have a drink with him? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> he is kind of good looking. Well, okay. Sure, what the heck, I'll have a drink with him. <laughs> Okay, so you're married. Nothing wrong with having a drink together, so what? I figure what your old man don't know won't hurt him. I said I'd have a drink with you. If you've got any other ideas, I'll buy my own. Oh, now, don't get me wrong, honey. I spotted you as a good kid the minute you ankled in here. You just like excitement, that's all. And I'm the guy that can dish it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, I'm a private eye. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, like you hear about on the radio. Gee, what a break for me. You just stick around me, honey, and you'll get plenty of excitement. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, you take this new client of mine now. Bet you anything he makes a headlines tomorrow. <laughs> Ten to one, he'll murder his wife. Oh, yeah, sure. He hired me to find out if his wife's been stepping out. I felt kind of sorry for the guy. Probably doesn't have the money to take her out himself. He's a bank teller at Second National. Bank teller? Bank teller? My... What's his name? Oh, uh -uh, honey, no, no, that, that stuff's confidential. Matter of fact, I, I'm not supposed to talk about cases at all. Oh, go on. I won't tell anybody. Well, no, you don't look like the kind of babe that blabs everything she knows. How about that drink, huh? Sure. Hey, Charlie, two over here, huh? In the works. You know, he, he sort of gave me the creeps, this guy. He sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, and all the time figuring how to kill his wife. How'd you know what he was figuring? Well, for one thing, he didn't want evidence for a divorce. He sort of looked at me funny and said, I just want to know, that's all. If Margie is stepping out, I'll take care of it my own way. Margie? Yeah, yeah, that's his wife's name, Margie. Uh, hey, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. N nothing at all. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you drank the last one too fast. No, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just naturally pale, that's all. Y you were saying about this client... You figure he's going to murder his wife? Oh, sure, sure. It's in her back. Either that or suicide. Suicide? But he's more the type for murder. Oh, one of those big, brutal guys. Sort of, sort of mean looking, huh? No. <laughs> Quiet, mousy. Kind doesn't have much to say. Those are the guys you got to watch. But why? Because they never let you know what they're really thinking. Not until it's too late. They don't? You know, most guys, when they find their wives stepping, will raise cane. Maybe they'll even get a divorce, but... They don't get sore enough to murder. Yeah. But these quiet fellas, you know, they put the little woman on a pedestal. You wouldn't catch them out with other women, not in a million years. And when they discover their one and only has been kicking up her heels, oh, brother, watch out. Golly. And the worst of it is they go on acting like nothing's wrong, you see. And then all of a sudden, whango, they explode. They explode? Yeah, yeah. You know, like I always say, beware the quiet man. Like this new client of mine, for example, calm. You never met anybody calmer, but I'll What does bet. he look like? Oh, uh, well, he's just about average, I guess. Brown hair, getting sort of thin on the top. A little bit stoop-shouldered. Medium height? Wear glasses? Yeah, yeah, you know him? No, no, I, I don't know any of the boys. Excuse me. Hey, where are you going? I gotta make a phone call, just remembered something. Don't go away, I'll be right back. Ralph? Margie? I can't see you this afternoon. No, I'm not sore about you being late. 
But whatever you do, don't come into Charlie's place. Yeah, that's where I am now. You bet there's something wrong. There's plenty wrong. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Ann Southern in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, Dora, we're down 200 on that hand. Oh, are we? It's easy to see there's no playing bridge with you girls with suspense on. So let's stop playing and switch to Autolite spark plugs or whatever for the rest of the half hour, huh? Oh, Mary, I could kiss you. You're such an understanding sister-in-law, and I don't want to miss a single word. What about you, May? Dora, did you know that my husband knows Frank Martin, the Autolite salesman? He does? Mm -hmm. Well, then let's listen to Mr. Martin. Right now, you can get Autolite resistor spark plugs almost anywhere in the United States. They're sensational. Why, no other spark plug will give and maintain such performance. Autolite worked with leading car and truck manufacturers, and the ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug that permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than in other spark plugs. Actually, when you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. Oh, dear. And to think that I'll hear every word of that again from Ed when I get home. Now, here's the simple lowdown. As a result of the wide gap in the resistor spark plugs, your engine idles smoother, you have better luck with lean gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television receptions. Yes, and today you can get the resistor spark plug from almost any of Autolite's 60,000 dealers. That's the biggest spark plug news in years. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ann Southern as Margie in Beware the Quiet Man. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I stood there in the phone booth a minute after I hung up. I wasn't scared exactly, but I had to let those words sink in. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. I went back to the bar. I had to find out. Oh, beautiful. I thought you got a lot. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> Thanks. Now, about this fella, the one who's going to murder his wife. Oh, let's get the shop talk. I want to hear about you. I don't even know your name. Did he say what made him think she was stepping out? Ah, she's supposed to belong to some bridge club. The bank teller's wife's got up. But uh, friends of his saw her downtown a couple of times on her bridge dates. Is that all? You know, honey, you're pretty smart. You, you, you make like you're really interested in a guy's work. Oh, but I am. You know, I had a little doll once. I thought plenty of would have married her, maybe, but only every time I, I started talking about a case, she shut me up. Never mind about your little dolls. What about this guy? <laughs> hey, you're jealous. Well, what do you know? I'm not jealous. I only want to know. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Sure, a cute little doll like you doesn't want to hear a guy spotting off about another dame. Yeah, maybe I had a few too many. I just want to hear about this bank teller. Have you met his wife, maybe? No, but he showed me a picture of her. Oh, then you know what she looks like. Oh. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? <laughs> Never mind, the joke's on me. <laughs> hey, maybe you better not have him any more to drink. You're acting kind of screwy. Oh, I feel wonderful. Well, here's to you. A long life. Yeah. A long, long life. Yeah. Down a hatch. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, poor little Margie. You know, you showed me a snapshot of her in a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, was she stacked. As a matter of fact, uh, about your height and uh, build, you're blonde like you, too. Was she as pretty as I am? No, I, I couldn't see her face. It's kind of blurred. He, oh. He's bringing me a better picture of her tomorrow. Oh, I think I'd like another drink. You know, honey, you better start taking vitamins or something. You're pale as a sheep. I said I wanted another drink. Oh, oh sure. Hey, hey, Charlie, two more of the same, huh? Okay. Yeah, poor little Margie. You know, that's one thing I could never figure out. The cute little dolls with flirtatious eyes always pick some homely, quiet gink when it comes to settling down. 
And the handsome He-Man who has to beat off the dames with a club, what does he do? He marries a drab little pigeon. Yeah, that's why we get so many axe murders, I guess. Axe murders? Only in this case, he'll use a gun. But he doesn't have a... I mean, most bank clerks don't own guns. Oh, well, this one does. Now. Oh. Give me a light, will you? Yeah, sure. There you are. Hey, maybe if you lay off a booze, honey, and take a tonic or something, you'll feel better. Oh. Look at your hands. They're trembling. How do you know he has a gun? Oh. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Why'd you tell me? Tell you what? You got a squeamish stomach. All this talk about guns and shooting. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. I, I won't say one more word about it, I promise. I'm not squeamish, and I don't need vitamins. I want to know how you know this bank teller guy has a gun. All right, so I'm going to a pawn shop and buy one. <sighs> you know, honey, I, I could really go for you. It's a funny thing, we never even introduced ourselves. That's something we got to do. My name's Closen, Lem Closen. What's yours? You, you mean that man bought a gun and now he's home waiting to murder his wife in cold blood? Oh, no, no. He won't do anything until he gets my report. Oh. You see, tomorrow I check with her friends to see if she's been going to bridge club like she's supposed to. Yeah. And I meet my client for lunch and get a picture of Margie. Mm. And I take it around to the downtown bars to find out if she's been seen with anybody. And then I give my client the report when he gets off work. Yeah. And then? And if his suspicions are right, and they usually are, it's all over but the shooting. The shooting? Yeah. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. <sighs> say, uh, what'd you say your name was? I've got to get home. <sighs> Hello, dear. Hello, Arthur. Oh, I was beginning to worry about you. Well, uh... I really couldn't help being late for dinner. I wanted to leave, but Maybell, that's her name. You know, the girl I used to go to school with. She kept talking, yatta to yatta, and I just couldn't walk out on her in the middle of a sentence. Oh, that's all right. I didn't mind. Say, the potatoes are already like you told me. Shall I... Uh... No, no, I I'll hurry dinner. You just sit down and read the paper. Huh? Well, well, thank you, dear. You all right? You, you look a little flushed. Oh, well, I'm, I'm fine. I was just rushing, that's all. Uh, it'll be ready in a minute. Uh -huh. Did you have a hard day, darling? Oh, usual. People are taking out more money these days than they're putting in. Yeah, prices are awful, aren't they? Hmm. Nothing unusual? I mean, nothing happened today? Oh, a, a funny thing. Man came rushing in this morning, first thing the doors were opened. Wanted to withdraw all the money from their joint account before his wife beat him to it. Seems she was leaving him for another man. Oh, how awful. Oh, yeah. And while he was there, she appeared. You should have heard her carry on. Huh. She was a real shrew. Well, what happened? Oh, nothing. He didn't say a word. He, he was a gentleman. But I'll bet if he'd had a gun, he'd have killed her. <gasps> oh, well. <clears throat> Seems things like that happen all the time. Newspapers full of it. Are you mad at me, Arthur? Hmm? Are you mad at me? Am I mad at you? Why, no. Should I be? Arthur, darling, I... I've got something to confess. Well, far away. I didn't go to bridge club last week. No? I thought you'd die before you gave up bridge. <gasps> oh. Really, honey, you look awfully seedy. No, I'm fine. I, I feel fine. I, I had sort of a quarrel with Lorraine. I, I, I didn't want to tell you because you're always talking about how women can't get along with each other. Instead of going to bridge club, I went shopping. Instead. <laughs> fine. Only I hope you didn't go over the budget. Oh, no. That's good. I always said bridge was a waste of time. Then you're not angry about anything? Why, no. Why should I be? Oh, Arthur. What's the matter now? I don't deserve a swell husband like you. <laughs> oh, I'm not so hot. Oh, you always do the dinner dishes and bring me my breakfast in bed on Sunday mornings. The only morning you have to sleep. Arthur, I'd feel terrible if anything ever happened to us. Well, what's going to happen? Suppose someday you got real mad and exploded. Exploded? Yeah. What if, it, what if you got a gun and shot me dead? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Margie. Where do you get those crazy ideas? You mean, no matter how mad you got, no matter what I did to make you mad, you wouldn't shoot me dead? Well, Margie, you know I'd rather die than hurt one hair on your head. Oh, uh, then not suicide. <laughs> Say, how many drinks did you and Maybell have? Arthur, I want you to know I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better wife from now on. I'll stay home all the time and... Darn your socks. You? <laughs> Darning socks. 
You just wait and see. I'll get up every morning and, and make your breakfast. Oh, Margie, you know you won't do any of those things. I will, too. The nonsense. Women like you never change. I will, too. I'll change right away. Tomorrow. Besides, I don't want you to. Oh, come here, baby. I want you to stay just exactly the way you are right now. Just exactly, Arthur? Well, I love you very much, just the way you are. Oh, Arthur. Hey, that reminds me, I made an appointment for you tomorrow at 10. You're having your picture taken. My picture? I showed a fellow that old snapshot of you today, the one we took at the beach. Oh. It was so dog-eared he couldn't see what you looked like, and I realized we didn't have a single decent picture of you at all, so But, I... but why have it taken tomorrow? Well, the studio next to the bank is having a special advertising the new 60-minute service. 60-minute service? Yeah, that way I can pick up the finished picture before I go to lunch. I don't want my picture taken. Well, now you're being silly. I won't. I won't do it. Oh, honey, what's the matter? Don't touch me. I won't have my picture taken. I won't. Sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, all the time figuring how to kill his wife. <laughs> Quiet, Mousy. That's the kind you gotta watch. Never let you know what they're really thinking. And all of a sudden, wango, they explode. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Arthur wouldn't hurt me. He wouldn't. I won't think about it. I'll take a sleeping powder and go to bed. The gun. He did buy a gun. It's all true. Every word of it's true. Hello? Ralph! I told you never to call me here. No, no, it isn't all right. Arthur brought a gun home last night. Yes, a gun! Claimed he was keeping it for a friend. That's all he'd say. Yeah, I, I think so. Just a minute, I'll look. Ralph, the gun's gone. He must have taken it to work. Oh, but well, don't you see? As soon as he finds out for sure, he'll kill... No, 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 no! I never want to hear from you again! I've got to think. I've got to think. Oh, not the door, Ralph. Oh... Lorraine, well, who'd you expect, darling? Frankenstein? Aren't you going to invite me in? Well, I, I was just going out. Oh, don't be silly. You're not dressed. I'm in a hurry, Lorraine. Well, I... so am I. I'm late at the beauty shop now. But I was driving past anyway, so I thought I'd drop in and give you the latest on the girls at the bridge club. Well, some other day, I've... I've Honestly, been... Margie, this is choice. You know what I heard about Mrs. Dentler? You know, she's the wife of Ben Dentler, the new teller at the bank. The one from Chicago. Lorraine, if you don't mind. Oh, that's right. You haven't met her. Of course, you haven't been around lately. Well, she's kind of a pretty little thing in a plucked eyebrow sort of way. But, but it's... you should hear what her husband told my husband. Lorraine, I... Of course, I promised Ed I wouldn't breathe a word. For crying out loud, Lorraine. Well, what brought that on? I haven't time to stand and gossip. What's wrong with you today, anyway? You're as nervous as a cat. I'm all right, perfectly all right. But here it is, 10.30. 10.30? Good heavens, I'm a half hour late. Well, goodbye. I've got to run. Oh, darling. Be sure and read the Gazette tomorrow. They're running a story about our bridge benefits. Okay, goodbye. Pictures and everything. They didn't have time to take a new picture, but I gave them the one we took at the Valentine party. The one I was in? They're publishing it? Why, sure. I don't want my picture in the paper. But yours was the only flattering one in the group. The reporter picked you out right away. He seemed quite smitten. He? Oh, yes, yes. He asked all about you. Of course, I told him that you didn't come to meetings very often. The Gazette doesn't use men reporters for society? Well, they do now, dear. He didn't sound much like a reporter, though. He kept calling me honey. Tall, blonde, fast talker? Why, yes. And you gave him my picture? Well, of course. What was his name? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah. Funny name. Mm -hmm. I think it was Clusen. Lem Clusen. <laughs> But, Charlie, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get a hold of Lem before noon. Well, like I said, he ain't been in. You sure he never told you where he works? No, he's come short for some private detective outfit. Oh, give me some nickels, lots of nickels. I got some telephoning to do. Acme Detective Agency. Do you have a man named Clusen working for you? Lem Clusen? No? Thanks. <laughs> 
Independent agency? I want Mr. Cluson, Lem Cluson. Oh. Yeah, I guess I have the wrong number. Hawkshaw Detectives, I'm looking for a man named Lem Cluson. No, I don't want to hire you to find him. But you're the last one in the book. He's got... Okay, sorry. No luck? No. I just remembered. Lem said the guy he worked for just opened up in town. Probably ain't in the phone book yet. Go on, kid, get out of here. Bank tell a suicide. Extreme read all Ah, that fresh it. kid, just because I won't let him in here peddling his papers, he yells in the door. Did he say bank suicide? He yells in here every darn day. Oh. Hey, wait, wait. Hey, you didn't finish oh. your drink, hey? Hey, Newsy. Newsy. Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Hey, newspaper. Boy. Give me a bo boy. Read all about boy. it. Bank suicide. Hey, you, boy. Paper lady? Did you say suicide? Right in the second national bank. You want a paper? Yeah. Here. Guy's wife steps out with another joke. So the poor dope says, goodbye, Marge, and pulls the trigger. Here you are, lady. Frank's suicide. Read all about it. Well, well, if it isn't Margie. Get away from me, Lem Cluson. Heard you were looking for me. Well, here I am. Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. Let me alone. I want to read. Oh, that write-up's no good. Here, give it here. Uh, yeah, that's better. Now, come on into Charlie's, and I'll give you the inside. Give me though. back my paper, you, you murderer. Murderer? Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You figure he bumped himself off on account of my report. <laughs> That's a screwy part. He didn't even wait for the report. I got it right here in my pocket. Take your hand off my arm. Oh, look, honey. Now, come on. You're coming into Charlie's if I have to drag you. Why don't you leave me alone? Yeah, I figured you'd be so. Might spouting off the way I did in Charlie's yesterday. But how did I know who you were? Oh, here we are. Hey, Charlie, yeah. two bourbon highs double. I don't huh? want a drink. Should have seen my face this morning when that screwy friend of yours gave me the picture of your bridge club. Oh, never mind. And there you were, as real as life and just as cute. I says to myself, why, you dumb ox, you got that little doll worried sick. And then when I read in the paper about my client giving your husband the gun to keep for fear he'll use it on himself, I think, holy cow. What did you say? And then I think, I bet she figures I planned the whole thing just to scare her. What do you mean? Oh, now, don't try to kid me, Margie. You know you figured that client of mine was your husband. That he was going to bump you off? You mean he wasn't? No, no. Your name's Banning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my client's name was Dentler, Benjamin Dentler. <laughs> Funny thing, his wife being named Margie, too. Yeah, I never thought he'd do it anyway. Oh, well, I think I'd like that drink after all. Well, here's to us, honey. So that's the gossip Lorraine was trying to tell me. Dentler, the teller from Chicago. You know, I've been thinking a lot about you. And Margie. Arthur really was keeping the gun for a friend of his. Hey, I'll tell you what, honey. I know a quiet little spot across town where we can eat, dance, anything we want. You might have told me about Dentler. It's a cute little place, baby. They got a knocked out band, a water floor show. I wonder why Arthur wouldn't talk to me about it. Well, what do you say? Say? Say what? Well, you and me, honey. Our date. Oh. <laughs> You're asking me to step out with you? <laughs> Why not? How about my husband? Oh, that mousy little guy. We got nothing to worry about from him. But I thought you always said, beware the quiet man. You never know what they're really thinking. But this is... No, uh... but. If you'll pardon me, Mr. Lem Cluson, I'm going home and start his supper. <laughs> Thank you, Ann Southern, for a splendid performance. Miss Southern will be back in just a moment. Dora, I apologize. That show was better than a six no trump had. Why, Mary, first thing you know, you'll be in Ed's class, quacking about autolite resistor spark plugs like Donald Duck. Deal me a great big hand, Mary, and watch me get back that 200 we went down. You know, I must get me a set of those spark plugs. Why not? Ask Ed tomorrow to put a set of those Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. Oh, well then, May, will you tell Ed I'll be over tomorrow? I certainly will. My old car is going to get Autolite resistor spark plugs, too. Yes, switching to Autolite is safe, sane, sound, sober judgment, and a sure way to spark plug satisfaction. That's why everybody's switching to Autolite. Autolite means resistor spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car.
now, here again is Miss Anne Southern. Hmm. I've enjoyed this appearance on Suspense very much. And as a regular Suspense listener, I'm looking forward to next week when Martha Scott stars in Crisis, a powerful study in... Suspense. Anne Southern appears by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, producers of Julia Misbehaves, starring Walter Pidgeon and Greer Garson. Tonight's suspense play was written by Toby Hall, with music composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Martha Scott in Crisis. calling the people of the USA. Here's your party, sir. Thank you. This is CARE Incorporated. It's been nine years now, nine years since Europe's people have been able to live decently, buy clothes to wear, get enough to eat. That's a long time. It's far too long. Our government is doing something about it. Its long-range program will help restore economic prosperity. But there won't be any immediate direct help for the people who are hungry today. They can look only to us, to you and me. We can send help through CARE. The 40,000 calories of food, good food, in a CARE package goes a long way. Because CARE is non-profit, government approved, it will deliver your package in Europe for just $10. $10 sent to CARE will supplement rations of a family of four Europeans for a month. Won't you help? Remember the name and address, CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the Cafe Tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. But before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> I made a dry run down the boulevard Barkeel, and sure enough, a stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. Uh, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. First, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? <laughs> Mr. Jordan, 
Would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now, you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then? Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend, but very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? You have a dough with you? Certainly not. It's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan, at the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Moody, Moody. You know, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work night. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. Always wants to know what happened. What oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, 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 that's Morgan. Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosions, salvaging operation. Off the coast of Ras el Had. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. No, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Uh, why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tournay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tournay was arranging for me to give someone a massage at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? i got reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! <laughs> I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Jordan? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Jordan. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fedor Brahms. Nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan, but I can guarantee you he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms under. 
Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? I'm sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Mala wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter and it read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address... 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Svensson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Maury. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh, please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes. Everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. Shh. I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. 
My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier had mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium, and Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? The telephone book. Uh, same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Yeah. Uh, meet Philip Tournier, my bodyguard. Well, we've already met twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside our phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three? Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, you're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe i better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I've... I'm beginning to see what you mean. Seems there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent of your promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Oh, Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can uh... trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. Will you hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there? Oh, sure. Yeah, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. Mm. Yeah. Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm going to show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs trying to decide what I was going to tell fate of Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator when we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there... There he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I'm afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He is missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my dough. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look him up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But um, about that 15 grand, 
Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find the street I'm you speak of, but, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, Jordan? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open-air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have, too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I got to find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open-air market on Farron Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Jordan! I'm coming in, Tournier. Yes, yes, of course. I I thought you were in jail. Well, weren't we all? Here, uh, there is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd start leveling with me, Tournier. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky. But I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus Fader and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Russell Hud. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. <laughs> Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fader Brahms again, or Svensson, or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fader Brahms. Sure I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. Take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Well, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck, and I heard oars fading into the fog. Zangus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get him together. You you know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. 
You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Peter Brahms drove off around the corner, and I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. Wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got... Uh, what, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Sika and Elmo Dar in half an hour, I'll produce him. Jordan, go home and go to bed. Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, Jordan. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it. A quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. Pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Zabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, Sharon again. Why here? We, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. Feather Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, and Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. The... Oh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Morey. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Morey, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. But when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Morey, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. 
Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fedor left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh-huh, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, 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 no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Georgian, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Georgian, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Georgian. You will get your money. You always do. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, there's something about me that is to trouble what molasses is to flies. I never go around looking for trouble. Trouble goes around looking for me. Now, take that afternoon a few months ago when I walked into the press room of the Hall of Justice and found, among others, Clark Ames, the young city hall reporter for the Chronicle, expounding on his favorite subject, a deep hatred for a man named Fred Curtis, nicknamed the Alibi Master. Ames and the other newspaper men had watched Curtis when acquittal for a dozen different clients and always by the same route, unbreakable alibis. This made the clients very happy and the district attorney very miserable. The Chronicle, a crusading newspaper, had, at the instigation of Clark Ames, been running an anti-Curtis campaign, bordering pretty close on libel. And Curtis, who was sharper than a razor's edge and harder to catch up with on the horizon, hated Ames with a wonderful passion. Curtis had won the last round, and Ames was telling me about it. So Curtis goes to Williams, my managing editor, and threatens a libel suit. Well, I had gone a little overboard, I guess. And Williams had to let me go. Temporary layoff until the heat died down. But now I'm back on the job, Brogue, and I'm solid. And you wait until that phony Curtis sees me sitting here. Wait till he finds out I'm back on the job. Huh. Look, Ames, uh, I've been around this town for a while, and if I'm picking out a guy to buck, it won't be Fred Curtis. Huh? How come you decided to make a career of locking horns with the smartest mouthpiece in the business? How do you expect to win? Oh, don't worry about it, Rogue. I got that phony right where I want him. You wait a couple of days, that's all. Mr. Alibi Master Curtis is going to be nailed to the Chronicle's masthead. Oh, uh, hello, Ames. Did I hear you taking my name in vain? Could be. How uninteresting. What are you doing sitting around in the press room? It's reserved for the working press. Hello, Rogue. How are you? How's your trial going, Curtis? Oh, my client will have dinner at home tonight. Jury just retired. Your client is guilty as the devil, Curtis. What's his alibi this time? Now, you know he couldn't have committed the crime. I've just proved to the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time the murder was committed. How are you getting along on your unemployment insurance, Ames? (laughs) 
It was a pleasure getting you fired. Too bad it didn't last. Well, I'm back on the job, which means I'm right back on your trail. That's bad news for you, Curtis. Uh, do me a favor, will you, Ames? When you call in the report of the not guilty verdict the jury's about to bring in for my client, tell your stupid managing editor I'm filing a libel action against him the first thing in the morning. Uh, look, uh, Curtis, let's go in the courtroom, will you? I'm going to be there when the jury comes in. Okay, Rogue. Oh, here, Ames, here's ten bucks. Go get a haircut, will you, kid? And have your suit pressed. And don't forget to spell my name correctly when you phone that story in. Here's your ten right in your face, Curtis. I'll see that your name is spelled right. In the biggest type in the shop, right at the top of the page, when you're tried for falsifying evidence. And that's going to happen to you awfully soon, wise guy. Here, here, here. Take it easy, Ames. Oh, let him talk. Let me give you something to kick around in that warped mind of yours, Curtis. You remember a guy named Don Thompson? Your alibi witness for Ed Harris a year ago. I'm sure you remember Thompson. What about him? Would it put a crimp in that famous poise of yours if you knew that Thompson had given the Chronicle a signed and witness statement admitting that he had perjured himself in that alibi statement for Harris? That is preposterous. Is it? Well, you'd be in quite a spot if the Chronicle happened to have a statement like that, wouldn't you, Curtis? A statement that swears that you paid Don Thompson $1,000 for the perjured testimony that kept Ed Harris out of the gas chamber? That'd sure stop your clock, wouldn't it? Have you been drinking, Ames? You sound even a little more illogical than usual. Oh, that's right. You like logic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, figure this one out. I've been trying for some time to get convicting evidence on you. You got me fired for trying. The Chronicle was scared of a libel suit. But all of a sudden, my managing editor, Williams, doesn't seem to be very afraid of your suing the paper. Now, what could be the reason for him giving me my job back? It could be that that statement from Thompson did it, couldn't it? All right, now, sweat it out, Curtis. You'll be seeing your picture in the Chronicle with bars in front of you and a number on your chest in about 48 hours. Not even one of your phony alibis can keep you out of this rap, big shot. I suppose I should be annoyed by such juvenile threats. But I just don't seem to be able to take you seriously, Ames. And the next time I give you my attention, you'll never work on a newspaper again. Coming with me, Rogue? Uh, no, not now, no. I think I'll stay here and use the telephone. You could see and feel the hate that hung in the air in that press room like a cloud of poison gas after Fred Curtis left. Clark Ames went all to pieces as soon as we were alone, paced the floor, said he'd talk too much. He was as worried as a man with a three-horse parley and two winners. Pretty soon, though, he, he left, and I used the telephone to call a couple of girls I know. They, uh, <clears throat> they weren't home. I was about to give up and go to dinner by myself when I turned around and saw Betty Callahan standing there behind me, looking like a million dollars, which is a nice figure, which is what she has, if you know what I mean. Betty had a funny little quizzical smile on her face. Hello, Richard. What's the matter? Aren't you having any luck? Well, honey, honey, I was just going to call you. You mean that if Alice isn't home and Liza doesn't answer, I'm next in line. Oh, now, you know better than that. You're always first on my list. Remember, Richard, I was standing here when you were phoning. Sure, sure. I was just, uh, just trying to get a substitute, that's all. Uh-huh. Well, what do you want? The names of some girls and a few phone numbers? Now, don't look at me like that, Betty. The only reason I was calling those other girls was because I couldn't find you. Well, I'll forgive you if you'll take me to dinner and then to the theater to see Tallulah Banker. Oh, my goodness, you have such expensive taste. Oh, really, my dear man. I have something infinitely better. I have two passes for the shack. Well, good. I've got two passes for a drive-in. <laughs> Come on, I want to see if I can walk through that door without eating the jam off of it. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. That's the only reason you have a date with me tonight, Well, then you? come on. <laughs> All through that hamburger, I kept dividing my thoughts between how such a little girl could eat so much food and that scene in the press room at the Hall of Justice. I knew Fred Curtis for what he really was, cold-blooded and completely ruthless. I remember that look in his eyes as he left the press room. A little puzzlement, a little fear, and a great deal of malice. Even if nobody else believed the story Ames told, I was sure that Curtis more than half believed it. That meant trouble for somebody. Betty and I finished our dinner at last, and in spite of everything she could eat, I still had money enough to pay for it and a cab to the theater. We were just back in our seats after the second act intermission when I heard my name being paged. If Richard Rogue is in the audience, will he please report to the lobby? 
Mr. Richard Rogue, please report to the lobby. Isn't that a sort of obvious piece of publicity, Richard? Well, how the devil did anybody know I was here? You better go see what's so important. Would you hurry back? I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> I had a bad hunch as I walked up that aisle. Those little chills that always race up and down my spine when I'm walking into trouble were acting up. I didn't know what to expect as I walked out into the lobby. Then I saw Clark Ames standing there. His face was as white as a dove's wing, and his eyes had the strained look that is the aftermath of seeing violent death. Rogue. Yeah, what's the matter, Ames? You look like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something worse, Rogue. You gotta come down to the Chronicle with me. Now get a hold of yourself. You're shaking like a dice cup. What's the matter? Williams, my managing editor, was just killed. Huh? Murdered in this office. Well, that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment, but first, here's Jim Doyle. Romance and soft feminine glamour are back in style. Women are taking off the bandanas they donned in war plants and are again letting their hair reflect moonbeams and stardust. That's why Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is in more demand now than ever, because Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the radiant beauty of your hair. Its fragrant, creamy lather cleanses so thoroughly and rinses out so completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, so no special after-rinse is needed. And best of all... You can wash your hair as often as you like with Fitch's saponified shampoo, and it will never become dry or harsh-feeling. That's because this shampoo is made from pure, natural oils that keep your hair ever soft and lustrous. Ask for Fitch's saponified shampoo the next time you're at your beauty shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now we return to Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, I was working. The publisher of the Chronicle was paying me a grand for putting the long, cold finger on the murder of Williams, the managing editor. I was pretty sure I knew who the murderer was, so it looked like a soft buck. When Ames and I arrived at the Chronicle, homicide was already there. My friendly enemy, Lieutenant Urban, was in charge, as usual. He walked over from where he was ex examining the remains of the late Mr. Williams. Hey, Sam, help me with this. What are you doing here, Rogue? Now, Urban, you know whenever anything comes along you boys can't handle, they always send for me. Who's paying you? The publisher of this paper. Now, shall we go on with the third degree or shall we get the work of the murder? What do you know about it? More than you do. When was he killed? The medical examiner says he got it about two hours ago. Mm. Stabbed the death of his own copy shares, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the last edition had already gone in. No one else was in the city room when it happened. Found a motive? Well, look at the office. Every file's been emptied. The murderer was looking for something, Rogie. Yeah, I wonder if he found it. Uh, you wouldn't know what it was, would you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I might. I might at that. I heard the Chronicle had a signed confession from Don Thompson. They were going to run it tomorrow. Now, what was Thompson's confession? Come on, Rogue. You might as well give me all of it. Well, it seemed Thompson was confessing that he had been paid a, a, quite a sum of money for a job of perjury by Fred Curtis, commonly known as the alibi master. In words of one syllable, so you can understand it, Irvin, Thompson uh, sold the Chronicle information which would have put Curtis away for about ten years. Curtis, eh? Well, looks like this is going to be a simple case. Could be, yes. Hey, Ames, you know where Williams kept that Thompson confession? It was in the top drawer of this file. It's gone. Uh-huh. Well, I guess that settles that, Urban. Ah, oh, it's too easy. Curtis knows every trick in the book. Hello, Urban. May I come in? Yeah. We were just talking about you, Curtis. You're very welcome. I figured I would be. Why did you kill him, Curtis? You knew you'd be the number one on the suspect parade. Oh, that's not very smart, Rogue. If I had killed him, I would have been much more clever about it. I wasn't within a hundred miles of here when he was killed. Well, that sounds familiar. I, uh, I know I'm wasting my time asking this, Curtis, but, uh... You can prove that alibi, can't you? Of course. I was on my ranch in Antelope Valley when I heard over the radio that Williams had been killed. I suppose my friend Rogue has told you of the fantastic story a drunken reporter named Ames was shouting in the press room at the Hall of Justice today. Yeah, I told him. He knows all about it. Oh, incidentally, uh, Thompson's little composition is missing. The man who killed Williams lifted it. 
Very convenient for you, wasn't it, Curtis? Convenient? Oh, there never was such a confession. There couldn't have been. Because there wasn't the slightest background of truth for the wild tale Ames told today. Okay, Curtis. We'll let you know what we think of the story after we've checked your alibi. You were on your ranch in Antelope Valley when you heard the report of William's death. Yes. That's about a hundred miles from here, right? Approximately. As soon as I heard the report of the death, I knew I would be a suspect. So I started the town. I stopped in a bar in Palmdale for a drink on the way in and then came directly to the Chronicle office without stopping. My car's at the curb now in front of the building. Ryan, check those alibis. Oh, they'll check, Lieutenant. I'm sure they will. The alibi master would never slip up on his own alibi. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Rogue. Uh Uh-huh, and uh, I'm sorry to be disappointed, Curtis. You sure you don't know anything about this murder? You you didn't hire someone to do it for you, did you? Of course not. I had nothing against the man. Why should I want to kill him? You can go, Curtis. We'll try to break that alibi or find the boy you hired. Until we do, take it easy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Oh, you can reach me at my office if I can be of any further use to you. Oh, uh, Curtis, are you going back toward the Biltmore Theater? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to get back there. I left my car there. And, oh, brother, Betty. Ooh, she'll massacre me. <laughs> I'll give you a lift. Come on, Rogue. This Curtis guy was strictly the deluxe type. His car was a long, sleek, black job a few sizes smaller than the Queen Mary, but with approximately the same amount of power. We got in, Curtis turned on the ignition, and the gas gauge swept clear across to full. Curtis had said he drove directly from the bar in Palmdale to the Chronicle office without stopping. Uh About 70 miles. Mr. Curtis's carefully planned alibi was not so carefully planned. I was enjoying a short ride with a murderer. He saw my eyes on the gasoline gauge, followed them with his own, and then put his hand in his coat pocket. I knew there was a gun in it. As we drove away from the curb, I picked up a copy of the Chronicle, which had been lying in the seat beside me. I thought perhaps if I could hide my thoughts a little better, I, uh, if I pretended a great nonchalance, with no part of which I felt... Curtis was not sure that I'd attached the proper importance to the story the gas gauge told. He, uh, he was being nonchalant, too. I, uh, had a little dough riding on prevaricator seventh today. When I came out. Ought to be in that paper. Final results. Where'd you get it? I bought it in Farmdale. Then? Oh, this is the Bulldog edition. Oh. The Bulldog edition is sold only on the streets in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake, huh, Rowan? Yes, I'm afraid you've made two of them, Curtis. This paper and that full gas tank. You didn't drive 70 miles in this gas eater without stopping and arrive here with a full tank, did you? You're very observant. Looks like you're cracking my alibi, huh? You killed Williams, didn't you? Yes, I had to. I had to get that confession of Thompson's that would have ruined me. I owe that impetuous reporter a great debt for tipping me off to the Chronicle's plans for crucifying me. You, uh, have any plans for me? Yes. Yes, I think I have it worked out. I'm going to drive you out to the suburbs to a spot I know that's probably deserted by this time. Now, if you were found there, shot. Aren't you overlooking something? If I'm found there, shot, Urban is going to pick you up fast. (laughs) You're going to do better than that, Curtis. Well, if there were signs of a struggle and your wristwatch had been set an hour ahead and smashed to set the time of death, and I was at Lincoln Heights Jail talking to a client at the time the police would figure the murder took place. That might do it, don't you think, Rogue? No. It's no good, Curtis. You're slipping. In the first place, there's always the possibility that a shot would be heard. The district I have in mind is deserted by now, or will be, before I consummate my plan. And Urban is no fool. You'll be awfully suspicious. Might give you the paraffin test on your gun hand. No, I, I, I don't think you're going to handle the situation that way, Curtis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be kind of hard to handle, even for you. You know, Rogue, it's amazing how fascinating crime, I mean the actual act of committing a crime, can be. Have you ever killed anybody? No. Now look, Curtis, I suppose you know that you're going to get caught. I know nothing of the kind. Successful crime is nothing more than planning, careful planning. Oh, I'll grant you, Rogue, that I'm going to be suspected of your murder. But I'll never be convicted for it. I won't take any chances. You're wrong, Curtis. You talk like a sick man. You can't beat the law. If you commit a crime, you're going to pay for it. 
Let's go down to police headquarters and talk this thing over with Urban. What do you have to win by adding another murder to your score? The rogue, I love life too much, and I love success too much to let anything stand in the way of my life as I live it. You, you just can't understand that, can you? You think that a man of my background and position must be horrified at the thought of taking the life of another human being. Well, you're wrong, Rogue. I have my own code, my own ethics. You know and I know hundreds of reputable businessmen in this town who spend their days and nights, their lives, grasping for money, for power over the lives of more and more people. Well, when one of them wrecks another man's life or his business, it amounts to a victory, which is celebrated by the record at his club that evening. If the victim commits suicide, and he often does, they're sorry. That's all. It's just business. What are you trying to prove, Curtis? I'm explaining why I killed Williams. Why I have to make sure that you and the knowledge you have of my affairs are disposed of. It's a matter of business, Rogue. No, you're crazier than a coach. You know that, Curtis. You're not talking like a rational person. You're going to pay for this crime. Don't move. Put your hands back in your lap. I think you know that I won't hesitate to kill you here on the road if it becomes necessary. Set your watch up an hour. One hour, Mr. Rogue. Okay. You got a new plan? Yeah. We're on the outskirts of town. I'm going to stop the car when I come to an advantageous place. Then I'm going to knock you unconscious with a tire iron, smash your watch, throw you onto the road and run over you. To all appearances, your murder will be the result of a hit-and-run accident. I will have an alibi which will make it impossible for me to have been in the vicinity at the time of the accident. That, I think, is a perfect plan. Ah, it's full of holes. In the first place, Urban will check the tread on your tires, and in the second, he'll never fall for that smash watch trick. You'll never get away with it, Curtis. You've been buying up juries and alibis and evidence for so long that you've forgotten that they're honest people. People who can't be bought. Urban's one of them. He'll stay with you until he gets you for killing me, Curtis. Now, you'll have to come up with a much cleverer scheme than what you've thought of so far. Maybe you're right, Rogue. What are you doing? What I'm going to do now, Mr. Rogue, won't need any alibi. Look out, you fool. Curtis! Curtis! Give me that wheel! Sit back there, Rogue. Get your foot off that accelerator. You're going to hit... Turn that wheel! Give me that wheel, Curtis! Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. Let go of that wheel. Let go or I'll shoot! <laughs> We'll continue in just a moment, but now here's Jim Doyle. Time is a valuable thing these days, and no man wants to spend any more of it than possible on shaving. So you busy men who want to cut down on your shaving time, use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. This swell cream gives you a close, comfortable shave in a hurry. It's an expert blend of three important shaving ingredients. These ingredients enable your razor to fairly sail along without nicking or scraping. The creamy, non-greasy texture of Fitch's No Brush saves you time, too, for it won't clog your razor or the drain. And with all your speed in shaving, you'll find that Fitch's No Brush leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. You men who prefer a lather cream will find Fitch's Brush Cream also gives quick, comfortable shaves. It makes lots of rich lather that stays moist all during the shave, then rinses off easily. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. For shaving speed and shaving ease, switch to Fitch. Now back to Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I saw what that madman Curtis was going to do. I knew I had nothing to lose. He had that big, powerful car wide open and heading straight for a stone wall. I tried to grab the wheel and turn it. He fired at me just as we crashed into the wall. I only remembered turning the wheel enough to deflect the shock a little. And then... Oh, then I was on cloud number eight. Hugo was there, waiting for me. <laughs> oh, Chief, you had a close call there. Hey, hey, Hugo, where have you been? Well, I had a little trouble with the old PA about Cloud 8, and I had to go and see them. Oh. Then I had a tough time getting a reservation back. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, Rogie, with your usual bump on the head. Oh, 
Am I dead? <laughs> Only the good die, young Rogi. Hey, you got company. An old friend of yours is up here. Look, over on cloud nine. See him? Oh, Curtis. He isn't dead either, huh? Oh, no. But I sure thought I was out of a job when I saw you slamming into that wall, Rogi. You ought to take better care of yourself. For me. Yeah. Look, I gotta get out of here, you go. How badly am I hurt? Oh, you're okay. That car was built to take it. <laughs> you won't be playing any gin rummy for a while, and you can't collect on your insurance. Give me a little boost over the side, will you, Hugo? I gotta get downstairs before Curtis does. Sure, Chief. Here you go. So long, Rogi. <laughs> Rogie. Rogie. Uh, hello. Hello, Irvin. Mm, fancy meeting you here. Receiving hospital? Yeah. What have you been up to? What were you trying to do? Kill yourself? No. No, no. Is, uh... Is Curtis here? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll ask the questions. What happened? How badly is, uh, Curtis hurt? Leg broken, that's all. He's still unconscious. Look, uh... Irvin... He, uh, he killed Williams. He, he, uh, he tried to kill me. Yeah. He admitted it, eh? Yeah, after I caught a couple of flaws in his alibi. You got enough dope on him to make it stick? I don't know. I don't know. It would, uh, be my word against his. But I got an idea. An idea that might sense the deal. Yeah. Every once in a while, you do have a good one. Get the, get the chief surgeon over here, will you? I'm going to need his help. Okay. Here, here, here. Lie down there. I, I don't want anything to happen to you, Rogie. I was worried about you. You're such a pest. I'd miss you like the devil. I'll get the doc. When I outlined my scheme to the chief surgeon, he looked for a minute like he might call him the head of the psychiatric ward. But with Urban's help, I finally got him to agree to play it my way. He bandaged Curtis from head to foot, put constricting straps across his chest, and cinched him down like a saddle on an outlaw horse. Then they put him in an oxygen tent and brought him out of shock. Urban pulled out all of the stops as he stood by the side of the hospital bed and talked to the murderer. Like a father. Curtis, can you hear me? Yes. Who is it? Lieutenant Urban. Did the doctor give you the bad news yet? Yeah. Crushed chest. Nothing they can do, I guess. No. You haven't got long to live. Anything you want to tell me? Might as well go with a clear conscience. Did you kill Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. I had to do it. I killed him. I killed him. Well, that was the end of the case. Brilliant piece of work on my part, I, uh, I thought. Going through that little tableau of making Curtis believe uh, he was on his deathbed and had nothing to lose by confessing the murder. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that urban. He's so proud of the fact that he confined his remarks to the truth when he was talking with Curtis. All he said was, you haven't long to live. Remember? Huh? That, uh, that was true enough. Curtis was executed a few months later. Which proves that the theory about perfect crimes is as foolish as a sure way to beat roulette. And, uh, Betty... Well, I, uh, I left her in a theater when I started out on this case. It cost me about, uh, oh, just about what I made, a thousand bucks, to get her over her peeve. So I broke about even on the deal. Oh, well, you know the old saying, a fool and his money are some party. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. 
Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about uh, the last time Rogue saw prison. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Yes. This is me. Is this Mr. Spade? Yes, but is this Miss Perrine? Well, yes, but... Why are you eating a peanut butter sandwich at this time of night? Why the allusion to Poe's raven? Was your assignment among the literati? It certainly was. There was uh, Rowena from Ivanhoe, a lost Lenore, a no-place Ralph, and a Boris from the Karloff of the same name. Oh, how distinguished. Have you got a cold, F? No. Well, uh, then there was a carnivorous plant. A hideous, meat-eating specimen of the botanical world. Trying to take two fingers off me. <gasps> well, I've got three fingers all poured out for you here. Ah, oh, pretty hep. I can see you intend to be terribly amusing tonight. But even so, I intend to come right down and dictate my report on a stopped watch caper or time stood still. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Well, in a few weeks, many of us will be going bareheaded now and then, meaning we'll have to pay more attention than ever to the appearance of our hair. The best way I know to always keep your hair in trim is to use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, removes loose dandruff, and relieves dryness, which may be even more prevalent when your hair is exposed directly to the wind and sun. So right away, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I'm looking over a <laughs> That's a mighty sharp routine you give a purine on the phone. Where's Effie? Who are you? Sam, don't you remember me? Buffy! Certainly not. I never saw... Buffy, Buffy, wait a minute. Do I uh, sense a certain family resemblance? No, you can't be Effie's little sister, Buffy. Yes. Big girl now. But thanks, anyway, for the tinker toys you sent me last Christmas. i kill myself. <laughs> I intend to start having children of my own just as soon as it's practical. Hmm. Where's Eff, Buff? She had to go to L.A. to visit a sick friend. A likely story. No, really. Chapter and verse, please. St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank. They went to school together, and her name is Louine Tuttle. She's an actress. Yes, I know. A very fine actress. Is it serious? I hope not for Effie's sake. They're very close. Yeah. 
Well, uh, what now? Uh, you uh, take shorthand, Buff? Sort of. Spoken like a true farine. Come on in. <laughs> well, I hope it's good and gruesome. <clears throat> Uh, I take it back. I meant the caper, not what you're drinking. Okay, Buff, you win. Ready? <laughs> Why not? Uh, date April 10, 1949, to uh, Deputy Sheriff Bill Whittington, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California, from Samuel Spade, license number... Uh... 137596. Oh, steady listener. Uh, subject, the stopped watch caper. Dear Bill, here's how it turned out. And if I ever phone you for advice again, I'll take it because you were right. She was loaded. About those threatening letters, Sam, don't give another thought. Old Lady Raven's had me up there a dozen times the last six weeks. She got threatening letters, she got prowlers, but when I got there, she can't find the letters, and the way that house is tucked away in the woods, I don't think a prowler could find it. How do I find it, Bill? Huh? Well, the Gray Line bus goes right by the gate. Mount Tama Valley's Road, about three miles this side of Rock Spring. Well, that sounds pretty rugged. You, uh, say she's a crank. But she's got money, Sam. Oh, the poor old soul. And she got a niece. Oh? Yeah. Over 23, but she's stacked. Hmm, the old lady's loaded, the niece is stacked. Who else lives there? Well, there's a butler. Somebody flattened his head when he was young, and he wears bangs to call attention to it. Sort of shuffles around the house. But you ought to see him out in the woods chasing them old ground squirrels. Quick as a deer hound. Yeah, and, and, and then Never there... mind, never mind. You sold me. All these marvels I have got to see. It was only 3 in the p.m. when I skulked in through the gates of Ravenswood, but it was so dark the hooty owls hadn't gone to bed yet. The fog snaked in and out through the dripping trees, the long, chill ribbons of ghastly fog borne on a sobbing wind. I mushed on into the deepening gloom of the forest primeval. After 10 minutes of that, I began to wonder if there was any house there. When I saw it, I still wondered. It looked more like a fungus growth. Chilly, isn't it, sir? Won't you come in? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I expected that. If you'll be so kind as to wait here, sir, I'll inform Miss Rowena of your arrival. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy Stewart. Forrest, who's out there? Is it the man with the hemlock? Answer me, you brute! I... Oh, where is it? Did you say hemlock? Oh, you must be my aunt's detective. Spade, was it? It is, right. I'm Ralph Raven. Come along with me, Spade. I have something interesting to show you. Ralph Raven was the one member of the household you hadn't described to me, and no wonder. The wasted figure that looked up at me from the wheelchair was more like a ghost than a man. His face was chalk white. So white it seemed almost luminous, and the skin clung so close to his skull there seemed to be no flesh beneath it. And his wide, staring eyes looked like two cups of black coffee on a snow-white tablecloth. I followed him into a glass-enclosed room only slightly larger than the garden court at the plaza. The humidity was several points higher than the dripping woods, and the temperature was several degrees lower. But the plants he had growing there seemed to thrive on it. As I edged nervously through the dense, quivering foliage, I noticed a strange-looking yellow-green pod about the size of a milk bottle at the end of a long, tubular stem. It leaned over, opened its red mouth, and said, Hey, what is that thing? Oh, that's my Sarancenia gigantosa. Meat eater. Carnivorous plant. Don't be frightened. I just fed it. Uh, don't tell me. You know what it eats? Uh, acts like it needs a dose of bicarb. No, perfectly healthy. Merely part of the digestive process. Even as you and I. Not me. But over here, you're a detective. These plants should interest you. Oh, oh, don't touch that mandrake. Never thought of it. It won't cry out. No vocal cords. Oh, I see. It's very sensitive. Oh, sensitive. And deadly poison. Oh. And, and see here, these pretty purple blossoms? Yes, yeah, very pretty. Source of an alkaloid poison favored by the Borgias. And these, white hellebore. Watch your language. I use it in compounding veratria, 
Uh, the poison's so ancient it would probably go undetected in the police laboratories of the day. Mm -hmm. And here, here's a charming one. Both a killer and a medicine. Belladonna, or deadly nightshade, source of atropine. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, commonly known as Nux Vomica, mm -hmm. produces not one but two deadly poisons. The well-known strychnine and the rare and not easily detectable brucine. Yeah, well, it's uh, quite a hobby, Mr. Ray. Well, it's uh... not a mere hobby, Mr. Spade. It's a practical science. All the plants in this conservatory have their fatal properties, and all have played a role in the great times of history. Did my aunt get another threatening letter? So she says. Odd that she should fear death at her age, and odd that she should hire a bodyguard. How does she know how it'll come? It might be poison. Speaking of poison, brother dear, it's time for your medicine. Oh, Spade, my sister, the lost Lenore. How do you do, Mr. Spade? How do you do? Here, Ralph, drink up. Why does it always have to be in milk? And look here, it's not time anyway. Oh, this confounded watch has stopped again. Spade, what time do you have? Why, it's uh, three, uh... Oh, that's funny, my watch has stopped too. I didn't know then what that meant. In fact, if you look on the last page of this report, Deputy dear, you'll see that the stopwatch was the key to the whole puzzle. I protest that my failure to realize its significance at that moment had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that my client's niece, Lenore Raven, was, as you so roguishly put it, stacked. About there, uh, Boris the butler bobbed up and beckoned me from the balustrade. I followed him upstairs and was ushered into the austere and regal presence of my client, Rowena Raven. That would be all, Boris. Yes, madam. Oh, Boris, I just remembered. Yes, madam. There on the occasional table, my watch. I want you to take it around to the watchmakers in the morning. It's on the fritz again. Yes, madam. Mr. Spade, I must apologize for keeping you waiting. Oh, that's all right. My watch hasn't been keeping proper time ever since those threatening letters started. Would that be a clue, Mr. Spade? Uh, maybe we'd better start with the letters, Mrs. Raven. I can't find them anywhere. I think that young man from the sheriff's office must have pinched him. Bill Woodington? Oh, I'm sure not. Well, all the same, it's very odd that every time he comes here, he can't find them. Uh, well, where did you put him, Mrs. Raven? Right there on the occasional table. Yeah, well, uh, Mrs. Raven, sometimes uh, people have very vivid dreams. Huh? It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with their minds or anything like that. You but... talk just like Dr. Slosser. That young sawbones my niece sent around looked my sciatica. Sciatica is nothing but a pain. How can you look at it? It's a lot of bull. Yeah. Uh, what did the letters say, uh, Mrs. Raven? That's why I wondered about my watch, Mr. Spade. The letters always contain some reference to time. Your time is running out. Beware when time moves slowly. Soon it may stop altogether. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. You think there could be a connection? I mean, has there someone been tampering with my watch? The repairman doesn't know what's causing it to lose. Yeah, did he think it might have been tampered with? No. He thought it was something in the mountain. Magnetism or something. Well, that sounds logical. That's now, a lot of hooey. I lived here 40 years and my watch never lost a minute. Something in the mountain, my eye. Something in this house, more like, or somebody. You ask me, he's not half so sick as he pretends to be. Your nephew? Uh-huh. What do you think? Well, I think he's a very sick man. No wonder. Sitting in that damp conservatory day after day, pattering over those fiendish poisonous plants. You see the one that eats mice and hamburgers? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, what's supposed to be the matter with your nephew, Mrs. Raven? Oh, he was in an auto accident. Injured his neck. He had to remove part of a gland or something. His neck. But Dr. Slosser says he's in good condition, aside from that. And if he takes his medicine faithfully, there's no reason why he should Come in! Ah, Mrs. Raven, how is that pain this afternoon? Worse, thank you. Dr. Slosser, this is Mr. Spade. Ah, yes. The detective you engaged to investigate those uh, letters you've been receiving. Mr. Spade thinks it's an inside job. Don't you, Mr. Spade? Uh, well, that depends on what you mean by an inside job. There, you see? Inside that romantic imagination of yours, my dear lady. Hold still now oh, while I give you your shot. I loathe being jabbed. Oh. Now, now, oh. that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, uh, can I look now? Oh. How is Ralph getting on, Doctor? Not well, I'm afraid. He doesn't oh. seem to be responding to the... the... Oh. Mrs. Raven, what is it? Uh, poison! You poison me! Oh. <laughs> The 
cry she uttered was only half as terrible as the expression on her pain-contorted face. She pitched forward in her chair with both fists clenched and shaking as if in anger at the doctor standing before her. He put down the empty hypodermic on the occasional table. Yeah. Help me carry it to the couch. Yeah, sure. The, take away that pillow. Yeah. She must lie perfectly flat. There. That's better now. She's relaxing. I'm dying. There was poison in that needle. Please, Mrs. Raven, it was only sedative to make you sleep. 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 The time is running out. The poor woman. Malignant condition. Only a matter of time. Does she know? That she has only a short time to live? Oh, yes. Well, I have another call. Do, do you have the time my watch seems to stop? Another one. I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. I left my watch at home. Oh, Ludwig. well, I... Ludwig, something terrible Shh. is happening. Your aunt is sleeping. You'd better come down to the conservatory right away. Ralph is in terrible pain. What kind of pain? He keeps saying he, he's been poisoned. What? Well, come along. Take that hypo to the kitchen and on. Sterilize it. Where is it? On the table there. I... He stopped on his tracks. His mouth fell open and he gave to the tabletop where he put down the hypodermic. In its place, it appeared two items. An old-fashioned lady's watch and a note written in green ink. The note said, time must have a stop. I picked up the watch and held it to my ear. You guessed it. It wasn't ticking. I had a hunch my client wasn't either. And I was right. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, back to the Stop Watch Keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Ralph? Ralph, where are you? Where did you leave me? Oh, oh. Hey, wait. Oh. Over here. Oh, Spade... Keep them away from me. Oh, Ralph, I came as soon as I could. T tell me your symptoms. No. I phoned for another doctor. He's on his way now. Spade, my aunt. Take me to her. I must tell her. Tell her what? I'm afraid we have some bad news for you, Ralph. Your aunt is dead. Oh. So you poisoned her, too. Oh, Ralph, you're sick. You don't know what you're saying. She's been to every specialist in the country. They all said the same thing. They all said she was good for another three months. My dear boy, in these cases, any doctor's guess is as bad as the next. No. Oh, please, Ralph, you're very sick. Please let Ludwig examine you. If it's what you think, the other doctor may be too late. <laughs> Why not? Why should I fear death? That's better. Now let me see your eyes. Uh -huh. So? So, open the mouth. So... What is it? What is it? He's right. It is poison. You see? You, you know, see? my dear. Yes? When you sterilized that needle for Ralph Sharp this morning, did you pick up the wrong bottle? Of course not. Strange. Very strange. But don't worry, Ralph. There's a very simple antidote. Oh, thank heaven. You should, my dear. Indeed, you should. <laughs> That was that, Deputy dear. Two doctors in the county coroner took one look at my late client's medical history and decided on death due to natural causes. 
I didn't think so, and neither did you. So there really were threatening letters. I saw one. You sure now, Sam? Sure, I'm sure. Where'd you say it was? On the occasional table. Yeah. What was it doing when it wasn't a table? Not occasionally, occasional. Oh, just any old table. No, Bill, now, Bill, get this. It's real deep. An occasional table is a table that a woman picks up at a bargain and puts into a room under the mistaken impression that it may come in handy someday. Mrs. Raven used hers as a catch-all for her unanswered correspondence, threatening letters included. And what happened to the one you saw? I don't know. I put it right here in my coat pocket along with a watch. It just disappeared. Well, that might be tampering with evidence. Listen, Bill, things were disappearing from that table almost as fast as other things showed up. Yeah, sounds like pack rat. You follow that up, Bill. I'm going to pack up and rat out of here. Now, look, Sam. My client's dead. It's officially okay. I haven't made a penny out of the caper, and now I'm not likely to. So do you give me a lift back to the toll gate, or do I hitchhike? (laughs) There's your answer. Come on. When we reached the second bedroom, whence the scream had come, we found the lost Lenore looking well found and something comfortable. She's standing center stage, regarding herself with horror in a full-length mirror. She looks awful pale, Bill. You better get downstairs and get some ice water. She might faint. You think so? Yeah, hurry up. I'll stay here and keep up her circulation in case anything happens. Yeah, you're right. I... Beat it. Oh, oh, it's you, Sam. I thought... You thought what? Look. Look, I found these on my pillow. Mm. One watch, one threatening letter. Whose watch? Mine. I left it on the dressing table when I went in to clean my face. When I came out, somebody had slipped this under. On the dressing table? No, under my pillow. You said on your pillow. I meant under. I mean on. I don't know what I mean. What are you trying to do to me? Just trying to get things straight. But the note. Look at it. It's exactly the same as the one he left in my aunt's room. Why do you say he? Oh, I don't know. Yes, I do. It's because I don't trust Ludwig. Dr. Schlosser. That figures he doesn't trust you either. But he pretended to think I might have picked up the wrong bottle. Uh-huh. Oh, he was acting. Couldn't you see You're him? not doing a bad job yourself. I'm not acting, not anymore. Listen to me. Listen, he's acted strangely ever since I foolishly said I'd marry him. I would myself. Oh, Sam, darling, don't joke. I don't mean like that. How did you meet him? He, he got me out of a jam once. The accident, when my brother was hurt. I went for a doctor, and he happened to be the nearest one... Well, I'd been drinking, and he took over, and he sent me home before the police arrived at the scene. Didn't Ralph know? He blanked out. He doesn't know to this day. But Ludwig never forgot. He forced me to recommend him to my aunt. He got into her good graces, practically moved into the house. Then he pretended to make love to me. Pretended? He didn't care about me till he found out about my aunt, didn't have long to live. He knew half her money would come to me. Sam, do you think he poisoned my aunt? Officially, she died from natural causes. But you said she spoke about being poisoned. And Ralph, too. What's that medicine you give him in milk? I don't know. It's it's a prescription, just some drops that come in in a metal container. Where do you keep those drops? Here. They're in my room. I have to hide them. They make Ralph feel so much better. He used to overdose when the doctor trusted him to dose himself. Let me see that medicine. It's just here in this cabinet. Here it is. It's right... Don't tell me. It's empty. There, there was a glass bottle inside the container. Mm, small but heavy. Lead yet. Hey, what are you doing with that gadget? The thing with the dials and the speedometer. Oh, that, that, that's something medical. I have to make a test on Ralph every day to see how he's getting along. Do you know what that actually is? Yes, I do. It, it detects anemia. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but a Geiger counter is generally used to detect something else. What, what, what are you going to do with it? I'm going prospecting for that missing medicine. Ah, there you are. I've been looking everywhere for you. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Lenore. Ralph? My diagnosis was correct. Pernicious anemia. Dead. What is that you are carrying, Mr. Spade? Oh, uh, nothing special, Doctor. Just an old Geiger counter. Lenore, did you let him take it? He said he was going to use it to find Ralph's medicine. What happened to Ralph's medicine? I don't know. It's just gone. Mr. Spade, that machinery is my property. I must ask you to hand it over. No gun necessary, Doctor. Here, take it. Take your gun, too, sir. Lenore, carry the machine this way. Walk ahead of us. First, we try the conservatory. He was an amateur with a gun, but I didn't jump him for it because I'm an amateur with a Geiger. I did notice that the indicator on the dial got nervous the minute we walked into the conservatory. 
Ralph Raven's body was still in the wheelchair, no paler in death than in life. His sightless eyes were fixed on that obscene plant. The plant looked sick, too. It was drooping, and his red mouth was hanging open. As we walked past the wheelchair, the indicator on the dial of the Geiger counter moved forward and then slipped back again. Then it took a sudden big jump. Ha! Ah, so that's what's his hiding place. The more of that disgusting carnivorous plant. Well, it's not pleasant, but there's only one way to get it. Don't move, either one of you. My eye is on you. Yes. Yes, it's here. No, At first, I thought the plant had bitten him. But then he pulled his hand out, and I saw what had happened. There was a hypodermic outfit stuck in the heel of his hand. Surprising him, no end, but he still managed to hold on to that gun. He swung it away from me and was holding it on Lenore. You, you knew. No. No, I didn't. You must have. Ralph knew. He must have told you. No, I swear he didn't. What do you think I did this for? To, to die and leave you behind? To enjoy the money I got for you? No, you will come with me. Oh, no, you don't know what you're doing. There's someone Shut right Shut up. Here. What are you looking at? What's behind me? Don't bother to rush him, Sam. I've got it. Hold it, Bill. Yeah. How's that for shooting, Sam? Yeah. You find a bullet hole in him, Bill, and I'll call it good. And that, Deputy Deer, is the crop. And it's all carnivorous. In case you're still wondering what dropped him when your shots missed, it was the poison in that hypodermic needle which Ralph had planted there for that very purpose and then baited the trap of the all-important missing medicine. Later on, I learned that what the doctor had been feeding him was the right medicine for what ailed him, an isotope of iodine. It seems it's radioactive like uranium, but if you take too much of it, you die. Not of poisoning, but of pernicious anemia, which is how the doctor planned for Ralph to die. It also magnetizes watches so they don't keep the right time. And if they're cheap ones, like mine, they may stop altogether. Uh, period and a report. Got all that, Buffy? Mm-hmm. I got it, Sam. But I don't get it. Uh, Buffy, people have studied all their lives to learn about atomic stuff like isotopes, and you expect me to teach you everything in one easy lesson. Oh, no, Sam, I know about that. But who killed who? Whom, dear? The doctor killed everyone, but Ralph loaded the needle. And they were accomplices? No, Buff, get this. It's real shallow. Ralph knew there was no way in the world to prove that the doctor was killing him and hastening his aunt's demise. So he saw to it that she got a dose of detectable poison and did himself the same favor. Oh. Now, uh, like a good girl, go type that up, hmm? And now, listen to this. More and more millions agree every day. Wild Root Cream Oil has become America's favorite hair tonic because of the neat, natural way it grooms the hair, because of the quick, easy way it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Get non-alcoholic wild root cream oil with lanolin right away and ask your barber for a professional application of wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. that butler was brought to justice. What for? His dialect? Oh, for helping to deliver the threatening letters and then stealing off the occasional table. A brilliant deduction. How did you deduce? Sam, that's for kids. <laughs> if Ralph was too ill to walk, then somebody had to push him upstairs in the wheelchair. Well, wouldn't it have been easier just to carry him? That's how he did it? Or uh, just go up himself? That's how. Possibly, and then again, we may never know. But uh, do we care? Hmm? Yes. I hate loose ends, Sam. Then keep it up. <gasps> Good night, Sam. Spoken like a true perine, so I'll say to you, good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. 
Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Renee and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil... Union Oil Company present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco, and Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, Instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that, well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney... And he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. <laughs> we pass the buck to you. <laughs> I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery. I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. <laughs> Don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself, if I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective. Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Reporter homicide, Inspector. A man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. <laughs> the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you, if you just found a body? 
Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Oof. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here. Here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I, I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open... And that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and when I saw he was dead, I I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back, and... Oh, I I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all. I I walked back and forth, and I walked downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. Oh. No signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Angel. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. But why don't you suggest something? All right, I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it, and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. (laughs) 
Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Uh, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen, I've warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Sign. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Well, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that B.T. didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And B.T. told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill B.T. Over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Watch out, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, huh? We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. No. Oh, well, if Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here, and I uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... Uh... Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? He doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. 
You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, you want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. is hoping it's more than just a rat trap, a man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. The place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look-see. not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You notice how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? Mm. It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a... Like a seal? Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now... The chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil, will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Mm Mm-hmm, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, J.J. Beattie. Driver's license, age 52. Mm-hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook. Balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clipped with $25 in loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray, J.J. Beatty, from fellow workers, Wadsworth, Plant, Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it. Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay, the same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint. Just one. 
But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just 10 cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> it's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only hush, one Hush, 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 kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? The ex-Mrs. Beattie. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beattie? Yes? Mrs. Beattie, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beattie? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but... Someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Well, yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A boss from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah. yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver, they didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike. But until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector. But Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, you can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. B both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true. But to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah. But, Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, yeah, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. 
Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had. What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beater's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do Oh, mean. that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Will I get a stand by Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But Mr. Beatty has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first. Although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No, no mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There, you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. <laughs> early in the evening, and we're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just, uh, Mike. Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. Tune in again.
again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed. Later this evening, the unique Mr. Monty Woolley stars once again in the new comedy series, The Magnificent Montague, the delightful saga of an embittered Shakespearean ham. After many triumphant years on the stage, The Magnificent Montague now portrays Uncle Goodhart, the hero of a radio serial, and his trials and tribulations are 30 minutes of delightful listening over most of these NBC stations. And today being Friday means another visit to Duffy's Tavern, where Archie the manager presides over another sparkling session of mischief and madness. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Yes, this is Nero Wolf's office. The mountain of a man in the oversized armchair staring at Archie with a beady eye is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf is in. Mr. Wolf is always in. Would he stay in until... He would. Archie, what on earth? Boss, she sounds blonde. Phooey. Don't believe I can tell over the phone? Okay. Excuse me, miss, but are you blonde? Oh. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Wolf will see you. Goodbye. I did not say... No, but you will. Besides, she wasn't blonde. And I want you to see red. Oh, Archie, better think of some new ones. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case of the girl who cried wolf. In the old brownstone house in 35th Street, my boss, Nero Wolf, with all his 300 pounds, sits at his desk from which he runs his world. We have been patiently waiting for the lady client. Then there's a knock at the door, and I admit her. A beautiful, frightened, and red-headed girl. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Nero Wolf? Not by 160 pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin. Oh, yes. I spoke to you on the phone. I'm... I'm Mary Dunning, Mr. Goodwin. I was wondering if... He's in. He's always in. Come on. We'll try getting him to admit it. This is Mr. Wolf. Miss Mary Dunning. How do you do, Miss Dunning? Here, take this red leather chair. It's a nice match for your hair. You know, as old Dr. Titmouse has said to me, beware of a red-headed woman. But I never could believe Thank them. you, Mr. Goodwin. Your business, Miss Dunning? Do you mean what I do or, or why I've come to you? Both of you, please. Well... I'm Mr. Stevens' secretary at the Tolliver Ecological Foundation. Our offices are down on East 12th Street. Uh, ecological? Field research as to factors operating on plant and animal development and survival, Archie. Animal development, huh? Miss Dunning, the foundation has several agricultural research projects throughout the country, hasn't it? That's right, Mr. Wolf. And Donald Stevens is executive director. Or was until... Was? He's disappeared. It's been three days now... He's not been near the office, nor his apartment. No message or... Apartment? Stephen's been living alone? He's a bachelor. He's engaged to Laura Tolliver. She's a cousin of the original Tollivers. But she doesn't know where he is either. 
Have you come to me on Laura Tolliver's account or on behalf of the Foundation? Well, well, neither, Mr. Wolfe. I'm just worried, and and I'd heard of you as one of the finest private detectives in New York. You heard of me, Miss Dunning. We see that you're here. I still fail to understand why. But I've told you, Mr. Stevens has dropped out of sight. And there's another thing. The last time I saw him, he had a caller with him in his office. Caller? Male? Female? I don't know. We're in a converted old brownstone house, and... Well, the way the offices are laid out, I don't see all the people who come in unless they make a point of coming to my desk. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. All I know is that Mr. Stevens stepped out for a moment, looking either scared or angry, I couldn't be sure which, and asked me to see if there was a policeman at the corner. Which corner? (laughs) Archie, continue, Miss Dunning. Well, I started to go, and there were low voices arguing from the inner office. And then Mr. Stevens called me not to bother. Then what? He said I could go ahead and take my lunch hour then. So I did. And when I came back, he was gone. Leaving no message? Leaving no message. And you've neither seen or heard of him since? I've tried all over. By phone, going out myself. Miss Dunning, has Mr. Stevens been in the habit of making extended business trips? Well, once in a while to our research stations in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or up in Vermont... But not without letting me know. I have to make out his travel vouchers. Has there been any recent trouble at the foundation? Trouble? Financial trouble? Personal trouble? No, there's been no trouble. Miss Dunning, you're wasting my time and yours. This is a problem for the police, if there is a problem. Oh, oh no, Mr. Wolf. I, I'd have gone to the police, except... Well, if there should be an innocent explanation... It didn't seem fair to the Foundation to risk the unpleasant publicity of... I said for the police. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. It's your say-so, but when a girl walks in here and asks... A young lady can depart by the use of the same rather trim legs that carried her here, Archie. Oh, now, look, boss, just because I look at... Miss Dunning, I can think of a dozen reasons that might take your bachelor director out of town for a few days without the formality of explaining his actions. Then you won't look into this? Despite Mr. Goodwin's frowns, no. Should Mr. Stevens not turn up tomorrow or so, I suggest you advise the police or whatever attorney acts for the foundation. There is such a person, of course. Yes. Jonas Dowd is counsel. He's also a coat trustee. Consult him, then, by all means. But you don't seem to understand. If you'll excuse me, I'm overdue for an important conference with my cook. We have just received a shipment of truffles from France. Well, of course, if Mr. I... Wolf, if you ask me... Precisely I... what I have refrained from doing, Archie. Would you be good enough to escort Miss Dunning to the door? To the door, Archie. Good night, Miss Dunning. Good night. Good night. And thanks, just the same. Look, Mr. Wolf, it's your shop and you can get as surly as you please. But can you give me one excuse for that high-handed brush? One thin shred of an excuse? Miss Dunning was sitting in the this chair... The girl was lying, Archie. Lying? How can you say At that? At least twice. And possibly from the moment she opened that undeniably pretty mouth. Now, if you would excuse me, Archie, I have an appointment with a truffle. <laughs> Say you have a surprise for me, Archie. Enough to yank you three inches out of that chair. Remember the girl who was here last night, Mary Dunning? You seem unwilling to let me forget her. Well, I took off on my own this morning to check up on that foundation setup. Good, Archie. I ventured a small bet with Fritz that you would. All right. See if your bet included this. I found Stevens down there right in his office. Missing executive director? Yes, and the missing Mr. Stevens claimed he had just been on a business trip. Delayed getting back because his car had been smacked by a hit-and-run driver in New Jersey. Now, here's the payoff. He even tried to make out that he'd been thinking of calling you in on a problem. A hit-and-run accident? No, no, something about the foundation. But I didn't waste time letting him cloud it up for us. The point is... Archie, you brought him here, of course. Stevens? No, he's still down there. We'll want to grab him before the day is out, but I had something more important to run down first. It took me three calls on the way up here, but you can take it as confirmed. We've still got a disappearance case, and this one you're not sitting out. Indeed. And who has disappeared now? Mary Dunning. Stevens is back, but Mary's gone. 
Not at the office, not at her rooming house, and none of her clothes are taken. How'd you get going? Put a police call out on Mary? Back to 12th Street and get Stevens out of that office and up here as fast as you can. I'll phone him. You are on the way. Hello? This is Donald Stevens? Yes, this is Donald Stevens. This is Nero Wolf. I understand you've been thinking of consulting me. Well, as a matter of fact, I have, Mr. Wolf. I started to explain to Mr. Goodwin, but... Uh... Are you alone there at the office? Why, well, yes. As it happens... Be careful. I don't think your car smash up as an accident. I've just sent Mr. Goodwin to ask you to come here. Meanwhile, I'd suggest... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Wolf. There seems to be someone coming in now. Wait, Mr. Stevens. There hasn't been time for Archie to get there yet. Excuse me, Mr. Wolf. Don't. Just hold the wire a moment. Wait, Mr. Stevens. Uh, come on in. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, what? No! No! And that's all Inspector Kramer has been able to make of it, Archie? Not to hear him tell it, but that's all he's got. Stephen dead and the girl still missing. Did you find anything helpful at the office? I think the murderer started to tear up some account books and project ledgers, but I must have scared him away when I rang the bell. Couldn't have been more than three or four minutes after the shooting when I got there. But you saw no one? Hmm. The murderer can cover a lot of ground in three or four minutes. You were uh, naturally by accident, since it is mildly illegal. You had a good look at the dead man? A very good look. Not to mention his pockets. Anything particular? Well, there was a half-eaten package of lifesavers in the left-hand trouser pocket. What's particular about that? The flavor was lime. I hate lime. Foy. <laughs> Archie, I uh, called Jonas Dowd last night. The foundation lawyer? Yes, he set up the original charter under which Donald Stevens operated with an annual fund of $90,000. Ecology has its attractions. 90,000 attractions, to be precise. It indicates a possible reason for Stevens' murder. He was in sole charge of that money. Somebody donated three thirty-eight caliber bullets to him. Hardly a token of appreciation. Perhaps not. However, the shooting followed the attempt to stage an automobile accident. Archie, I sent Saul Panza on an errand for me. Saul, huh? He's expensive. True, he's the best man in a shadow job there is, but... You've got something, huh? Possibility. An angle I can't handle? Apart from your natural preference for curves... You more than work enough here in New York. Finding Mary Dunning for a starter. Or uh, her body? Or her body, as it may be. Is that what Saul's on, picking up a line on Mary? Among other chores, Saul's is buying me some special groceries at the city market. You frown, Archie. I glower. But okay, play it cozy. You can send Saul off to Stockholm for smorgasbord for all I care. I'm still asking what about Stevens and what about Mary? Where do we start? I'm expecting Laura Tolliver, the heiress, and the son of Jonas Dowd here within a few minutes. Jonas Dowd himself proved as difficult to pry from the office as... As you generally are from this one. Oh, good for old Jonas. Wait a minute, though. You said a son was coming. Would that be Peter Dowd? It would be. Could I trouble you to pass that second bottle of beer? It's your third. Stop auditing me, Archie. You reacted to the name of Peter Dowd. May I ask why? Kramer is ahead of you on that pitch. He's had Peter Dowd downtown already. And learn? Playboy, used to be in love with Laura Tolliver, now in line to take over Stephen's tidy 20000 a year salary as executive director. To take over Fui. Peter Dowd's no ecologist. He's got more important qualifications. His old man and Laura Tolliver are co-trustees under the Tolliver will, and the director can be anybody they name. Archie... You sound prejudiced against young Mr. Dowd. Yeah, that's what Kramer said. I'm just naturally suspicious of anybody who stood to pick up 20 grand a year, plus a whack at the 90,000 a year in house money, just by throwing 338 caliber slugs into Stevens. Particularly after getting rid of Mary Dunning to clear the way. The police still have no leads on Miss Dunning? A for effort, Z for results. Now, the way I see it, boss. Was... Leg work now, Archie. Guess it's later. You might try Miss Dunning's landlady again for one, and try Peter Dowd's apartment. Now? Yes. I'd say go along and keep after the missing girl. Instead of sifting through the names in Stephen's appointment book you were asking about? It's two legs of the same animal. The names may help on the girl. Now, Archie, on your way.
Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes, come in, Miss Tolliver, Mr. Dowd. Sit down. Yep. It's good of you both to come. Miss Tolliver, I'm profoundly sorry of your loss. You were to marry Mr. Stevens, as I understand it. Yes, three weeks from today. I was trying to warn poor Stevens just as the murderer came in. But he evidently knew his caller well enough to feel no alarm. The uh, police told us that, Mr. Wolf. We've just come from Inspector Kramer's office. I know, Mr. Dowd. Did you gather the inspector meant to see you again? Why should he? How could anyone think that, well, that, that Peter could have anything to do with this, this horrible business? I see that you have no doubts about Mr. Dowd here, Mr. Oliver. Easy, Laura. Yes, Mr. Wolf, I, I gathered that Kramer was interested in me. He's got a man outside here watching us now. You're alert, Mr. Dowd, or... Or what? Or aware that Inspector Kramer may have grounds for keeping you under surveillance. Look, Mr. Wolf, I didn't come here to be put through the jumps again. First Kramer, and now you. I'm acting for the Tolliver Foundation, Mr. Dowd. I have been since your father retained me last night. Well, why jump on me, then? Young man, at my age and weight, the chances of my jumping on anyone are about as likely as, uh, well, as unlikely as to expect that you are not still in love with Miss Laura Tolliver here. Yeah. Mr. Wolf, we haven't admitted that, that we... Miss Tolliver, Miss Tolliver, your concern a moment ago at the possibility that this young man might be charged with Stephen's murder... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Climb back on me if you want, but let Laura alone. If you're trying to... to make... I'm no longer trying, Mr. Dowd. You both confirmed the point for me. All right. I am still in love with Laura. And I think Laura's known ever since she accepted Stephen's ring that, her... well, that their engagement was a mistake. What are you going to make of that? Did Stevens know you hadn't given up on Laura? I told him twice. I even went down to the foundation and just... Just when, Mr. Dowd? This morning while I was telephoned Stevens, for example? I... I... I haven't been near the foundation office for days. I, I've... Well, I, I've been out of town. Mr. Wolf, you've no right to twist and turn everything Peter says. I do love him, but I... Laura. Well, that's, that's the first time you've come right out with it since... I'm sorry, Peter. I've wanted to tell you a thousand times. But, well, you kept going away on all those trips, and I never knew whether it was for some other girl or... <clears throat> Mr. Dowd, Miss Tolliver, could this tender exchange be postponed till you two find yourselves alone? Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Ask anything you want, as long as I know it's all right with Laura here. Roundly spoken, Mr. Dowd. May I ask about Mary? Ma What's Mary Dunning got to do with this? I am glad you're aware of the Mary I meant. Well, well, I, I, I've met her at the foundation, of course. We've all heard she's missing. You couldn't suggest where she might be. How would Peter know? Let's return to Mr. Stevens. Can either of you explain his three days' absence from the city? Well, I've been out of town myself. Mr. Oliver? He could have been inspecting any one of the research plants. He didn't tell me, if that's what you mean. Stevens said this morning he had been wanting to consult me. You can't suggest why? Well, no, I can't. About foundation business or personal business? Three thirty-eight caliber bullets kept Mr. Stevens from making that clear, Mr. Oliver. Mr. Dowd's father is sending me over some material, but as yet, it's not in my hands. Are you familiar with the personnel at the research stations? There aren't any more than four or five project managers. Halsey in Vermont, Schwartz in Pennsylvania. Excuse me. You hear a wolf? Archie. Yes, Archie. You can take it back about Mary Dunning. If she's a liar, she's just gone to a lot of trouble to make it look good. Dead? No, but knocked out with chloroform and stuffed in a closet in a man's apartment. And uh, guess whose apartment? Spare me your charades, Archie. Peter Dowds. That's where I'm calling from. Is he still with you? As it happens, yes. You better hang on to him. There's been another development. Inspector Kramer's got hold of a man named Schwartz. The Pennsylvania project manager. Right. Schwartz was at the foundation office this morning, and he says Peter Dowd was going in as he came out. When? Within minutes of your call to Stevens. Kramer's on his way to your place now to pick up young Dowd. Any uh, instructions? I'd like more company. Well, the ball game is all wrapped up, isn't it? I'd still like more company. Right, Mary and Schwartz? If you can get them here. And Archie. Yes? Get them here. I'll have that fifth bottle of beer, Archie. Seventh and quarter for the night. And when do you get around to calling in Mary and our friend Schwartz? In a moment, Archie, in a moment. After all that scramble to get him here. I've been studying these project 
reports that Jonas Dowd sent over. Fascinating field ecology. I know. The factors playing on the development and survival of living organisms. Too bad poor Stevens didn't figure on a factor named Peter Dowd. Archie, I'm ready for Mr. Swartz now. No, Mary? I'll risk you in the next room with Miss Dunning for the time being. Okay. One Schwartz coming up. I'll come in, Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Wolf? How do you do, Mr. Swartz? My apologies for this long wait you've had. And I'll try to make our business brief. Yes, sir. Mr. Swartz, you managed the Tolliver Agricultural Research Station in Pennsylvania for some time. Two years. I am not sure I didn't once enjoy a shipment of mushrooms that came from your place. You've experimented with Maya Arenaria. Maya Arenaria? Yes, of course. Yes, we've done some work with mushrooms. They were excellent. Uh, by the way, I understand you saw Mr. Stevens just before he was shot down. If I'd stayed ten minutes longer, he might still be alive. May I ask the purpose of your call? I was delivering the monthly reports. No special trouble you came to discuss? No, sir. You met Peter Dowd coming in at the foundation as you were going out. How did he look? In a hurry. How so? He just pushed past with his face turned away. You're sure it was he? Yes, I had seen him at the foundation maybe two or three times before. Were you aware that Mr. Stevens and Mr. Dowd were both apparently in love with the same young lady? I'm a research worker, Mr. Wolf. I wouldn't know about Mr. Stevens' personal affairs. Just an hour ago, before Inspector Kramer took him from here, young Dowd admitted that he'd been there today. I didn't think I could be mistaken. But he said only because Stevens had phoned him to come. Were you there when that call was made? No, there was no call to Dowd while I was there. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Swartz. Yes, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Saul Penza. Yes, Saul, you're still... Yeah, uh... still down here at the city market. Looks as if you were right. Indeed? One of their trucks just pulled in with a load of full crates. Top quality produce. I'll uh, try not to wince when you send in the expense sheets. Any other confirmation? Internal revenue records show no taxes paid on income by the Tulliver Foundation. Thank you, Saul. Phone any information as you get it. You'll forgive me again, Mr. Swartz. Archie! Yes, boss? Would you ask Miss Dunning to step in now? Coming up. Come in now, Miss Dunning. Good evening, Miss Dunning. You've quite recovered from the chloroform? Mr. Goodwin's been helping me. He's been rubbing my forehead, and I'm beginning Spare to... me any further details. Miss Dunnings, would you mind telling me again how it was you came to find yourself in Mr. Dowd's apartment? Well, it was the phone call that got me to go over. It was a man whispering. He didn't give his name, but he said if I came to that address, apartment 4C, I could learn something about Mr. Stevens. You went to apartment 4C, and then? That's really all I know. Just after the door opened, before I could see him, this coat was thrown over my head, and... Then he must have given me the chloroform. It was Peter Dowd, of course. Dowd? Who else could it have been? It could have been Mr. Swartz here. Mr. Wolf, you're joking. Am I, Swartz? Joking or drunk? Why should I... Uh... For the ancient reason, Swartz. Money. For the racket you had and wanted to keep. Racket? Mr. Swartz was in... Swartz is no more of an ecologist than Mr. Goodwin here. A moment ago, he accepted Mara Arenaria as a mushroom. It happens to be a common clam... Common on nearly any beach. Rare in inland Pennsylvania. Well, Stevens knew I didn't go in for all that Latin stuff. I could understand that you might be useful without it, Swartz. But to get away from your station operations, you faked the scientific knowledge you never had. All right. Suppose I am more of a farmer than a fancy scientist. Our job at the research station is to raise vegetable crops, isn't it? As you worked at Swartz, of course. You turned an agricultural research project into a commercial farm. All expenses met from tax-free funds, and not a cent of return shown for the produce sold. So that's why Saul Panzer drew the rutabagus run. Stephen had the innocence of a specialist interested in his own field only. But even Stevens finally began to get onto those doctored reports of your Swartz. And when was it the Internal Revenue men began asking questions? Look, Goodwin, is this fat guy out of his mind? You had to get rid of Stevens after the last inspection trip. Were you even counting on taking over his job after Peter Dowd was put away for Stevens' murder? Mary, if you'll just explain to this lunatic... Watch it, Archie, watch it. I've got his gun. 
adroitly done, Archie. Now, wait a minute. This is a 32, and it was a 38 that did the murder. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, that's my bat. You can't... Take this pistol from it, I have, my dear. In this extraordinary effort you put me to of actually leaving my chair to secure this weapon, we'll add that to the score against you. Mr. Wolf, if you aren't too Tucker to answer, that gun from Mary's bag... It's a thirty-eight. It may be the one used on Stevens. But Mary couldn't. She didn't. The ballistics tells us that this is the weapon. Then Swartz must have passed it to her for safekeeping. Till it could be planted in young Dowd's apartment or car or whatever. I didn't have anything to do with it. Miss Dunning, you had to do it more than you know. Do you realize that if Mr. Goodwin hadn't found you at the Dowd apartment when he did, that you might not be alive at this moment? You were the one person who knew Swartz's crime. Mary, don't listen to him. She's listening, Swartz. Miss Dunning, you thought the chloroform scheme was directed solely against Peter Dowd. And so you let Swartz talk you into it. Mr. Goodwin tells me the door of that closet was sealed with scotch tape. I didn't know that. Schwartz actually tried... Your chloroform sleep was meant to turn into a permanent one, Miss Dunning. That I was trying to cover for him. All right, here it is. Schwartz planned it all. He did try the hit and run, and he did shoot Stevens. He's a liar. Mary, you've been juggling those books since... Say the details for Inspector Kramer, Schwartz. There's guilt enough to be divided between you and guilt enough to burn you both. You're being noble and not rubbing it in. Don't I merit a full explanation? Archie, I'm concentrating on truffles. Do we dig out a bird, or shall we have them in an omelet again? Mr. Wolf, look, I've got a white flag up, and I'm asking. All right, Mary and Schwartz wanted Stevens out of the way. And all right, they tried to hang it on Peter Dowd. But why'd Mary come here and try to get you into it in the first place? As far as she knew that night, Archie, Stevens wasn't to get back to New York alive. Swartz's hit-and-run ambush in New Jersey was supposed to take care of Stevens on his way back from Pennsylvania. By luck, Stevens survived the accident, and Swartz had to follow him here to finish him off. Yes, but I still don't see why... Mary came here to establish her innocence by pretending to seek her help. Oh. And she thought to keep suspicion from Swartz by creating the imaginary figure of a threatening caller at the office several days before her. She knew Stevens meant to consult me about Swartz, and she could guess Jonas Dowd would call me in eventually. Well, Stevens said he wanted to consult you that morning when I... That morning when you couldn't hear Stevens out because you were seeing him as Mary Dunning wanted us to see him. Oh, a trick operated with two vanishing acts to explain, Stevens's and Mary's. There you have it, Archie. And both fake. A straight business trip branded a run-out or a snatch only by Mary's account, and then the chloroform act at Dowd's apartment. You have it in full. Mm Mm-hmm. Except how you knew she was lying to start with. Point one, the girl offered no fee, no prospect of a fee. Mm Mm-hmm. Stay at that. Could anyone claim knowledge of my reputation, Archie, and still seriously expect that I would take an arduous labor for the love of it? (laughs) Oh, Hmm. I'm ashamed of myself. Point two, she told us of a caller coming to see Stevens. Of Stevens asking her to fetch a policeman, then changing his mind. When asked to call a policeman, what woman's curiosity would be satisfied by being told not to bother? (laughs) How utterly brilliant you are. Hmm, Yes. Archie, a bottle of beer. All right. And now back to a serious problem, you know. I think I see a compromise on these troubles. Between bird and omelet? Archie, why not both? Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Charles O'Neill was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Charlotte Lawrence, Howard McNear, Mona Keneally, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Butterfield. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Slaughtered Santa Clauses. 
Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie the manager and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant, Duffy's Tavern. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's prison evidence on Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight robbery. Pardon me, uh, could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Oh. What? Oh. I wonder what's wrong with her. Oh. I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? Oh. Can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder. Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes, Oh, it's awful. Now, you shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come, let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No, I, I just saw him lying there in a pool of blood. Then I, I, I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. <laughs> there we are. Now, if you'll show me the library. He's, he's in there. Oh, yes, I see. He's dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and saw a light still on in here. And she looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I... I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head. Close range. Well, it looks as if he did it himself. No. No. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, 7 Dunner Street, City. Do you know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam... You've been a widow, in fact, ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will, which leaves everything to you, the repentant husband, Enos Jarbeau. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? No, I, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting. And he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. 
This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write. And I've had it ever since. Is there another key to this desk? No. And Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are, I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbeau using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Jarbeau. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Jarbeau. Oh, the poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I, I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston, and on the way he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station, a messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman, and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbo. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And goodbye. Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything she told me. But somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Oh, I think I'll... Pardon me. Uh, would you let me have a light? Yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, come along, Pets. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? I've met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute. Watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she's still... Yes, I know what I know, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy, I want you to find out what you can about old Eno Jarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. If that man leaves before Scubby gets here. I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. <laughs> Is it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of the big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbeau. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from state's prison. Ah, pardon me, Scubby. Want to speak to the desk clerk? Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to speak yes. to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank oh, you. Oh, Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have him remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I want him to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks. I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office because I'm going to be out of town for a few days. And I want to have everything straight before I leave. 
Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter, except that Mrs. Jarbo has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me, and I know she'd like me to leave. Well, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is in Uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. Well, nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbot and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Forged will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note, which Jarbaud didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And Ella, I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I... even if I have to go to jail to do it. Oh, you're the new man. Yeah, Warden. What's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? Thirty-three. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory. Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What'd I get you for? Cracking a safe. There's four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure, know him well. Great guy. Yeah, sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. He's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. I thought her name was Sarah. No, oh, no, his wife's Addie. Sarah was his sister. Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but he left her flat. I don't know what happened after that. Addie's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out a few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. Yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy's on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. Hey, Barney. Yeah. Look, you've known me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know, I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, the big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. Haven't seen her since, though. So. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. All right, you get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed robbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Oh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> The 
All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set? Sure. Mike's with us all the way. Same as before. Hey! You over there! That's us. Come on. Yeah, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once more. Well, come on, get it going. We ain't got all day. Heave. As soon as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look. Bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You all right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. Watch out, Max. The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at him pour it out. <laughs> well, we're out of jail now. And for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. Now, tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now, let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned... This Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Martin, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. Well, that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbeau was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Betsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. He and Mrs. Jarbeau were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. Hmm. And then Mrs. Jarbeau said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jarbeau. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> we'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. <laughs> Mr. Carter. That you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure there's no one around? Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarbeau has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. It may be seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me. Does Mrs. Jarbeau know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. 
I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? Uh, there was talk about chloroform and poison. And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm-hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, now it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. <gasps> Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Chabot. Ella. What are you Barnaby doing Barnaby Coy, you... Max Herbert, by all this holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Well, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jarboe, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you. I, uh... What are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I... Saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. They're both lying. Get out of here, both of you, immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back, either of you. Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah. I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you, so don't try to have it right. right. There, there you go. Sit down. Let go of me. Stop. 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 Oh, shoot. No, you don't. No. Hey, you let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yeah. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But, what? You know me? Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over under the street light. All right. You know me now? Uh, well, Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd pass two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even give us their names, too, well, so I... Well, that now, Ben. Listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarbeau place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me, because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Jarbeau. <laughs> Are all the men posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. What's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm-hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarboe estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addy, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? That's well, if I point. can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't going to bother us. Yeah. So we bet... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering it. Hey, somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were no. up here? Anybody here? Mike! Come on. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? 
You did, McCoy. You're crazy. I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Sharp Old House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay. Very important. And it's signed, Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, you mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now, I was baby. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept you out of it. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just... Shut up, you just get it right off. Come on, kids. It's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Come on. You gotta get out. I'll take it easy, sir. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max, what are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, I Nick's got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Addie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, you found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then. But you arranged with the guard Mike here to help McCoy escape when the time was right. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him. And between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbeau and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Addy got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbo ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time... Another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern War Time. This is mutual. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Seven years ago, remember? 
Or in Vance. Oh, the, the Zeman case? Now you got it. You know, Della, I thought a lot about coming out and killing you. Instead, I'm going to do you a favor. What's on your mind, Vance? I did all my time, and people don't like to hire ex-cons. I think maybe you and I can work out something. I haven't got any jobs, Vance. I'm not asking for a job. It sounds like double talk to me. I don't think you... Don't you give me any routine, Del. I've heard them all. You can help me and make yourself some money. It's legitimate. What do you say? I don't know what it's all about. I suppose I can come over and tell you. Okay. I'll be waiting for you. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to All States Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. Attention, Mr. Don Freed, Chief Investigator. Since your office authorized me to conduct certain inquiries based on information supplied by Oren Vance, I am billing you accordingly. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Baltimore matter. Expense account item one, 295. A phone call to Prisoner Dismissal Board at Sing Sing Prison, where I was informed that Oren Vance had been released three days before the above date. He had completed seven years of a seven to fifteen year term for grand theft. It was an unparole release. The chaplain described him as a model prisoner with a better than average chance of remaining out of prison for the rest of his life. For that reason, I was willing to listen to his story when he showed up an hour later. Hello, Dollar. You haven't changed a bit. Come on in, Vance. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Ah, nice place you get. I like it. Sit down. Tell me what's on your mind. Dollar, look. Don't treat me like a con, even if I am one, huh? I'll sit down. I'll have a smoke with you. I'll talk with you. Forget the other part for a while, will you please? Okay. Have one? Thanks. Nice. Just that everybody's doing that. Even my wife. Went over to see her the first day I got out. You know what? What? Katie wouldn't let me in the house. Gave me $40, told me to go out and get a decent job. Told me she had it all worked out. Work hard, she said. Six months, if everything's okay and you're not in any trouble, you can come home to me and the kids. If not, she said, I'm going to divorce you. What do you want me to say? I want you to offer me a seat. Invite me to sit down. Sure. Thanks again. You know, I thought about it a lot. If you hadn't been out to get me seven years ago, I'd have had you over for dinner. Maybe we would have been friends. Maybe. Look, I can't get a job, and I'll have to go in business for myself. I need a steak. That's why I'm here to see you. I talked to you maybe 20 times while you were working on that Zeman case, and I think I got to know you. I called you today because... of. What I saw of you, then. I think you're an honest man. Thanks. You ever hear the Towner case in Baltimore? Towner Loan Company in 1946? Yeah. Everybody's heard about that. Million dollar theft. The insurance companies still have a reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction? It was never solved. I suppose they do. I can help you help them solve it for half of that reward. Can you? I know two of the men who did it. Two of the six men. I talked to one of them yesterday. I'll tell you who they are, where you can pick them up, but I want my name out of the picture. Can you fix that? Yeah, probably. But I have to talk to the police sooner or later. Oh, look, this is a good thing, Dollar. And all I'm asking is you promise to keep my name out of it. Tell me how good before I make any promises. That's fair enough. They had some of the serial numbers on part of the take. Here. This is one of the bills. Why don't you check it with them? Then we'll take it from here, huh? Expense account item two, $14.85. A long-distance phone call to Chief Investigator Don Freed, All States Insurance, who verified that the serial numbers on the $10 bill Oren Vance handed me tied in with the Towner Loan Company theft. I explained the information I had at hand and the source from which it had come 
leaving out any mention of names. Freed talked with his boss and phoned me back half an hour later, giving me the go-ahead. Okay, Vance, you're in business. All right, how does it work? You tell me who they are, I'll handle it from here. I mean the money part. When we have something, you'll get paid for it. All I've had so far is talk. This bill could have come from anywhere. You might have picked it up at a cigar counter. Look, I got it from a man named Leonard Torpy. He lives in New York. He's one of them. Leonard Torpy? Yeah. I met him my second year at Asni. He was up on an old petty theft charge. He did 18 months. He told me to look him up when I got out. Now, this part may sound crazy, but we had a few drinks together in his place yesterday. I was weeping on his shoulder about all my hard luck, and he said, You think you got hard luck? And then he marched me into the bedroom and showed me a stack of money in a bureau drawer. He said he couldn't spend it. He gave me one of the bills. Well, must have been pretty drunk out. Yeah, it was. I got to thinking about it. I checked the bill, found out it was in the town of him. I looked up the story in it. Torpy fits the description of one of the hold-up men right down the line. Now, we'll see. You say you know two of them. Who's the other one? Harold King. He lives in Reno, Nevada now. He runs a filming station there. He used to come see Torpy on visiting days. I saw him several times. What makes you think he had a part in the town, I think? Just from what Torpy said while he was drunk and the general description of the other hold-up men in the story. See, while Torpy was drunk, he mentioned his old partner, Harry King. He told me where he was living and so forth. Did he say anything about the hold-up? No. I told you I found that part for myself. But King is the other man. I'm sure of it. King have a record? I don't know anything about him. Okay. Where'll you be? I'll phone you. Two days be long enough. Oh, I should know something by then. Remember, my name's out of it. The police or anybody else. Sure. You afraid? Yeah. I'm a stool pigeon. Well, haven't you noticed? I'd noticed, and it worried me. So I followed him when he left my place. I was buying a package of cigarettes at the corner drugstore while he boarded the streetcar for downtown. I tagged along in a taxi to the main business section, watched him get off and head for the bus terminal. I bought another package of cigarettes while he bought a one-way ticket to New York. In the half hour before departure time, I telephoned a private detective friend of mine, Pete Florian. He appeared at the bus terminal 15 minutes later. What's the rumble, Johnny? A man over there in a gray overcoat. His name's Orrin Vance. Uh Uh-huh. He's on his way to New York right now. Maybe you better tag along, see that nobody kills him. Oh? Uh-huh. If what he told me is true, somebody might try to do just that. Stay close till he settles somewhere. I see. I haven't got any more to tell you, Pete, because I'm just starting to look into it. Find out where he's living there and contact me at this number. I'll let you know what to do then. All right. Anything else? Don't let him out of your sight, Pete. Expense account item three, 100 bucks. Retainer for private detective Pete Florian for explained purposes. I stayed at the bus terminal long enough to watch Pete board the New York bound bus and take a seat across the aisle from Orrin Vance. <music> Item four, $8.85, plane fare, Hartford to New York. Item five, four fifty, cab fare to hotel and then to Metropolitan Police Station, where I explained my business to uh, Lieutenant Randall. Who gave you this tip, Dollar? I'm afraid I can't tell you that, Lieutenant. Why not? Because I promise not to disclose any names. But I can tell you that the source is a man who couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the case, since he was in prison at the time of the holdup. Mm-hmm. But you want me to stick my neck out and get up a search warrant and maybe take this bird Torpy into custody on your say-so? Huh? Well, you have plenty to start with with that $10 bill. Should be enough for you to look into it. That's why you looked into it? Frankly, yes. Prima facie evidence. But no name? No name. I've told you all there is to know. Believe me. Let's get busy. The mug folder on Leonard Torpy showed a balding 40-year-old man with a long record of theft and burglary. There was no record for a Harold King, although he was listed as an associate of Torpy's. Lieutenant Randall wired Reno authorities requesting they locate King and hold him for possible questioning. Once these preliminaries were accomplished, Randall and I went out to the address Orrin Vance had given me. But this turned up a blank. The landlady informed us that Mr. Torpy had lived there, but had checked out the preceding morning. No forwarding address. 
The good lieutenant and I parted company outside the apartment house, and I walked back to my hotel. I was going to change clothes and grab some dinner. But the clerk waved me over to the house phone. A call had just come in. Johnny Dollar. Hi. Pete Floney, it's Johnny. How'd it go? Your boy got in town. I trailed him to a place on 155th Street. He's got a room with a view. It's up there now. Alone? I think so. Any visitors? No. Light went out about an hour ago. Might be sleeping. What's the number? Uh, 680. His room's in the back. First floor, number 10. Where are you? Drugstore, right across the street. Expense account item 6, 160. Cab fare to the drugstore where Pete Florian was keeping a watchful eye on my nervous informer, Oren Vance. I found the drugstore, but Pete was nowhere in sight. The girl behind the soda fountain recognized him by my description and said he'd stepped out a few minutes before. I glanced up and down the block and then spotted him standing just outside the shadow of a streetlight across the street. I walked over. Hi, Johnny. That's a room back there. Lights on? He's got a couple of visitors in there with him. Showed up about five minutes ago. Car? Taxi. They look like? One's thin, medium-sized, dark suit. The other's stocky, dark suit, too. Both in the early 40s. Chopin wears glasses. Didn't make either one. Yeah. This one of them? Let me see. Yeah, he's in there. What's his name? Leonard Torpy. We better go in. Okay. Right back there. Yeah. Who's uh, Leonard Torpy? That's somebody who might want to kill Vance. Wish I knew more about what this is all about, Johnny. Yeah, so do I. It's all talk so far. I see. Better cover me. Come over there. Okay. Okay. Who is it? Mr. Vance? Who? Orrin Vance? You must have the wrong number, buddy. Nobody by that name lives here. Well, are you sure? Positive. Why don't you try the manager? Well, I did. He said Mr. Vance had this room. And he's all wet. Good night. Just a minute, Toby. What? Hey! Tell me down! Before I went down, I heard it go off a couple of more times. Must have been six inches from my head. My eyes couldn't see and my feet wouldn't move. But I could hear. There was someone very close to me. And he was dying. Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Sign up. Enroll now. Join the 7 million strong who buy United States defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where they work. The bonds you buy help keep America strong. And now, Series E bonds earn more. They give you a quicker return on your investment. Through the payroll savings plan, you'll save the sure way before you spend. So sign up. Invest more in United States defense bonds. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I won't talk about my operation, but I had one at the police emergency hospital. As a matter of fact, I had two. They prodded a 38 slug out of my neck and another one out of my shoulder. It was 48 hours before I was allowed to sit up in bed and talk. Naturally enough, my first visitor was Lieutenant Randall. He looked haggard, tired, worried. You say you hired this Pete Florian? Yeah, to keep an eye on Orrin Vance. This your tipster? It's okay to tell it now, I suppose. Yeah. Well, thanks. Florian died right there in the hall. Four slugs hit him. Vance is on the floor beneath you, still hanging on. You keeping track of all this? What about Torpy? Did you get him? 
Uh, we didn't, but Florian did. Torpy's in the morgue. The other man got away. Quite a night. Yeah. Look, darling. You're the only one who can give me the story now. Vance isn't able to talk and won't be for another three days. If then, everybody else is dead or gone. Now, what happened there? I don't know. I didn't see anything, Lieutenant. I was trying to push into the room past Torpy, and the whole world caved in. Any, uh... Any line on the man who was with Torpy? Good descriptions, but no luck so far. He heisted a car outside Vance's place. Found it two hours later, no prints on it. Some blood. He might have one of Florian's slugs in him. Yeah. We gotta land that bird. Hey, you all right? I felt awful. And Lieutenant Randall left me alone for the rest of the day. At 3.30 the following day, Orrin Vance regained consciousness long enough to relate what had happened. I was wheelchaired down to his bedside. Statement enclosed. That was Harry King with Toby. King flew here three days ago from Reno. He came to my place to find out what I'd done with the $10 bill Toby gave me when he was drunk. They told him I spent it. But they didn't believe me. It was King who shot me. I've got reward money coming. I'm not going to die. He was still hanging on two days later when I left the hospital. Expense account item seven, $14. Ambulance ride. From emergency hospital to my hotel. The doctors told me to take it easy for a month and I'd be all right. I had a phone call a half hour after I started to take it easy. Johnny Dollar. Are you interested in finding Harry King? Who's this? My name's Milva King. I'm Harry's wife. Oh. You want him or don't you? Sure. I'm at Shiraz Restaurant on 42nd off Broadway. Can you meet me? Yeah. How'll I know you? You won't, but I'll know you. The rich has been in the paper for the last three days. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. King? Yes. Hey, you look pretty weak. I feel that way. Maybe we better sit down. The small, pretty brunette woman in the nice clothes looked like anything but the wife of a bank bandit and murderer. She looked more like a housewife on a shopping tour or a schoolteacher on a New York vacation. I listened while she cleared up some questions I had in mind. There's a reward posted, isn't there, for that holdup in Baltimore? $10,000, Yeah. Will I get it if I turn Harry over to the police? Sure. How much? Half. Oh, that isn't much for giving up your husband. They'll get him sooner or later, Mrs. King. The other half's spoken for. And this Vance man? Yes. Wait, I'm just trying to figure. What about you? I'll pass it up. $5,000 for Harry. Providing he was tied in with the Baltimore holdup. That's what the insurance company's interested in. He was in it all right. I want to get something else straight. What happens to me? What do you mean? I'm his wife. I only had a part in that holdup for the last six months. I haven't said anything. Does that make me a party to it or something? Well, you could have informed, but you couldn't have testified, being his wife. I'm arraigned. I don't want to spend all the money hiring lawyers to keep me out of jail. My company will cover that. Where's Harry? Oh, not yet. What now? I'd better get something in writing from you. Something that says your insurance company will pay me the reward and give me help if I get in any trouble. All right, I'll talk to him. This time I'm thinking of the future. I'm going to have one once this is over. I hope so, Mrs. King. I know so, Mr. Dollar. Did Harry have money he couldn't spend, too? Forty-five thousand dollars. Where is it? I can give you that when I give you Harry. Well, you thought of everything. I tried to. Harry and that torpy man were fools. 
All they ever got out of it was the marked bills. Worthless money. You don't happen to know who the other four men were, do you? No. I suppose that's what you'll ask Harry when you get him. That's the idea. <laughs> Poor Harry. How long will it take you to get things arranged? Not more than an hour. I can do it by phone. I'll call you. Okay. I gave her a 50-second start before I left the table and went out in the street. I was just in time to see her climb into a cab. I was trying to hail one to follow her when a black coupe pulled up to the curb. Come on, Johnny. Hey. Hustle it up. Light will change. How do you feel? Terrible. What is this? Well, Vance told us it was King. We checked the airlines and found out he had his wife with him when he flew in from Reno. That is Mrs. King up there in that cab, isn't it? That's who she said she was. She wants to sell you her husband for part of that reward, doesn't she? Yeah. Well, what's the delay? She wants to make sure she'll be handled all right. The money and all. Yeah. So did Vance. Don't needle me, Randall. I don't mean to. This all figures thought she might try to get in touch with you for just that reason. I don't get it. Well, that's why I put a man on your hotel. He followed you when you came to meet her today, and then he phoned me. We looked her up. Her name was Melba Thaler before she married King. Her old man had a lot of money in Minnesota, but she couldn't keep herself out of trouble and got disinherited. Money's always been her problem. It's everybody's problem. Not the way it is with her. Now King's worth a lot of dough to her. If you pay off, he's no good to her now lying somewhere with a slug in him, and he hasn't been any good to her with the marked money he got in the town or hold-up. There's something else, Randall. What? She's stalling me, I think. She said she didn't know who they were. But if she was lying and she does know who the others were in that town or hold-up, King would be worth even more money. They'd want him dead instead of with the police talking his head off. That's right. <laughs> We followed Melba King's taxi for better than 45 minutes, all the way through the Holland Tunnel and into Jersey. She finally left it at a train station in Bucks County. We watched her buy a magazine and sit down in the waiting room and begin to read it. Fifteen minutes later, she stepped into the phone booth. When she came out, I went over to the filling station phone to see if she'd phoned my hotel. Well? She wasn't trying to get me. Well, that settles it. She's contacted the others. She's going to sell to you or them, whoever pays most for him. Some operator, isn't she? Well, when you have time, look at the file we picked up on her. Sixteen arrests. One conviction for narcotics when she's 18. Well, we'll see what we will see. Didn't take long. Green Cadillac pulled up at the station. Melba King stepped out on the platform and greeted the two men who were in it. She sat in the car with him, talked for a short time, then got back out. When the Cadillac Eight, rolled away, seven, Lieutenant seven, Randall was on the radio five, ordering seven, a pickup. Seven, Yale, 596. I'll pick him up right away. We'll stay with him. When Melba King caught another taxi, we were right behind her. She took it to an auto court about a mile from the station. We saw her go into the cabin marked D. Randall radioed in our location. We were about to check the auto court office when the door to cabin D opened. Standing beside Melva King in the doorway of the cottage was a pale, stocky man who looked as though his legs wouldn't support him another minute. Then she saw us get out of the car. You're hurt, King. You can't go far. I've come this far, and I'm still going to keep going. Lord, baby, move. It was all ready for her when she got back. Yeah. Boys, no, I shoot. You especially. But you'd be dead now. Now, I... That's funny. I thought the same thing about you, King. Please, don't do anything. Please. Shut up. Oh, no. King, listen to reason. I can tell you're hurt bad. You need help. Why don't you give it up? How much were you going to give her for me, Dollar? I wasn't... How much? Tell me. Half of it. Please, Harry. And please. how much were you have want to give her? I didn't talk to oh, you. Oh, yes, you did. I passed out this morning. You got real busy. How much were you? Oh, no. 
You're dying on your feet, King. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to die. On your feet. Maybe I won't make it. You'll still be here. You're going to hurt No. Harry, please. No! Yell if you want to. King, don't add another one to the... Expense account, item eight, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Item nine, eighty-five dollars, doctor bills. Item ten, miscellaneous, forty-eight dollars while in New York. Expense account total, $294.60. Remarks. As you know, the two men Malva King contacted were also part of the six who had held up the Towner Loan Company. They made a full confession and named the other parties involved. As far as the reward money goes, I think Orrin Vance deserves his $5,000. And I think Pete Florian's widow deserves my $5,000. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Time now for Rocky Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan, and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> I had spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. A guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front pay phone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the pay phone? Hmm. Shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh, and there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? No, uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Don't take the phone to see the manager. Not in there. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Our specialty. 
Now listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Thomas King. Thomas King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Enough, sir. I will show you what I think of the Café Tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin, now we go bye-bye. Come on. Stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine... I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I've forgotten about you. I am a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, Willoughby, told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh. Well, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I... sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting? Oh, very, very. Uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hiding behind every lamppost. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... Uh, if you'll be... excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk, and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one inside except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. Hey, hey Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you've got to remember. I left you here to watch the money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. And I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. We'll have a look. What do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had to look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Greco of the Cairo Police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Greco? Where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. One moment. I must make a full report. Now. How much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but if somebody... If you please, I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you, Mr. Byer. Now, if you'll just Now, leave... Mr. Jordan, did you strike... No, I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch... Uh, I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Oh? Oh, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, he is not at all cooperative. What? Uh, so? Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. 
Yes, I will handle everything at once. Because... Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? You don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino. Shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan... Here you are, Greco. And you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? He has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Wait. Uh, another gun, Jordan. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Uh, two shells missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. So bland if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances... You, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour, each Sunday evening, is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. I was on my way to an Ace High Straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack, who didn't wait for me to answer. A loud Egyptian named King, and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my straight. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic, recently fired, turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sabaya sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, Sam? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <coughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the front yeah. phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tom and King started a phony one-man riot in the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tom and King. And the third? Well, after I get rid of King... <clears throat> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, Jordan. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Sabaya speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught a mouse, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. I'm surprised. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you for the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam could change his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. 
I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen. As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Hey, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. I could phrase it a different way. You see, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things in my mind. Like murder? Oh, please, worries. Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. It's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. Would uh, 100 pounds be sufficient? 100? That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Then, well, uh, give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell no one? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, uh, Maxie. Uh, oh, hiya, Rock. Watch your thirteen coming up. Watch it. See? Thirteen. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Or something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fish to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know that. Ace is dead? Yeah. Twenty-three this time. Watch it. What do you know about the killing? I tell you, Rock. Uh, watch it now. Twenty-three coming up. Twenty-three, just like I said. Come on, what do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who were his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He met her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband to show up. You know what the husband's name was? Let's see. Uh... No, I forgot. Poor this time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King, that's it. How do you know? I didn't. Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Deal. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back to back with a king. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of piastres, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. You like my rock? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thing of it. Ah, no, not interested, sorry. I see you bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother oh, me. Stand there, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait, wait, come back. By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere. I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. Across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. Why, why, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this, uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but 
He had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No. No, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque Al-Azhar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm I was wrong. It was the Ahmed Ibn Tulun. Stupid of me, though. But think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. Well, I found Tom and King's address, a large brownstone modern apartment house. But King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, survey. Ah, right, just a minute. He said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten dollar beer. Ten dollar beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace eye straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. And I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabi at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. Who is it? The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I... Sorry, Blue Eyes, i got to talk to you. Who did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight, it's... Oh, well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but uh, you see, my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh, why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? <sighs> to uh, find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, uh, well I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. Uh, you had better go, Mr. Jordan. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Oh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? A camel stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer... I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry-up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam is Rocky. Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King at 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? This is news, George. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain that? Sam, if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time, still following me. The veiled native woman, limp. But this time I figured I knew who she was. 
She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cards collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. This time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step, I picked up another native bent on mayhem. There we went. The veiled woman, followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims, right through the bizarre pirate. Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top-flight adventure mysteries. Rocky Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler, top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the beggars and the steak charmers and the street vendors of the crowd of bazaar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path, pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and 30 more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let's go. Let's go. Turn around. Turn around and face me. No. No. My veil. Cut it off quick and everything. Oh. Yeah. Look her over, folks. She's not a native and she's not a woman. He's uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. This is most convenient. I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Nathan, what Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. A natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The husband doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. So you killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angel's planning to kill her after I left. You were a little slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Well, just to you... clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen, your shy little nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. <laughs> I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, Nathan, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh, what? Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail? No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I told you. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dragged him to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Sabaya started pounding on the front door. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open, open up, window. Sir. Open up! Jordan, you 
here? Where is Milton Green? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Draco, get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Draco. Uh, uh, all right. Suppose... Don't worry, Greco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about the angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. Just passed out. I must have stepped on her sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She is suffering only mild shock. No, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as Johnny Dollar. My name's Elgin, Mr. Dollar. Claims Division, Delaware Mutual Life. What can I do for you, Mr. Elgin? Would you be free to work on a case for us? Well, I might be. What kind of a case is it? It involves a man named Patterson and a claim we paid off to the tune of $40,000. Uh-huh. You see, Patterson died in 1947. All the routine procedures were followed... There was no reason for not honoring the policy at the time. And there's reason now, Mr. Elgin? That's for you to find out, Mr. Dollar. A lifelong friend of the deceased swears he's still alive and kicking. Oh. I'll take the case, Mr. Elgin. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, Hartford, Connecticut. To Controller's Office, Delaware Mutual Life Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Walter Patterson matter. Expense account item one, $78.14, fare and incidentals between Hartford and Wilmington. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon, found a room at the Chesapeake Hotel... Stowed my luggage and went directly to your headquarters, Mr. Elgin. Of course, reports like this cross my desk ever so often. If I ran them all down, I'd get nothing else done. And ten times out of ten, the report's wrong. Yes, I know that, but this report bears investigation. I can remember three years after my father's death, I saw a man on a subway train to New York who... Well, he looked exactly as I remembered my dad. I finally walked up and asked him his name. The minute he spoke, I lost the impression altogether. I think a lot of people have had that same kind of experience at one time or another, don't you? Yes, I suppose so. We all have a double somewhere, they say. An old friend saw this man, Patterson? Yes, in Tucson, Arizona. Her name's Virginia Collier. I'd have her here now to talk to you, but unfortunately, she's en route to Europe. Oh, I see. Two weeks ago, Mrs. Collier stopped off in Tucson on her way back from Los Angeles. She claims that she saw Walter Patterson as big as life sitting in a bar at the El Conquistador Hotel. Is that all? No, she managed to talk to him. He told her his name was Euler, William Euler. Mrs. Collier says he pretended not to know her at all. Uh huh. Now, here's the first point, Dollar. I wired authorities in Tucson to run a check on William Euler. In their conversation, Euler told Mrs. Collier that he'd been born and raised in Tucson. But from all we could gather, he'd never bought property or made a financial negotiation there until June of 1947. Oh, wait. This uh, Mrs. Collier, do you consider her reliable? Well, that's another point. If it had been anybody else, I don't think I'd have bothered to make even a cursory check. But Mrs. Collier practiced law here for a number of years and sat on the circuit bench for two terms. She's most reliable, and she knew Walter Patterson all of his life. Okay. Go on. 
The next thing is that Mrs. Collier distinctly remembered Patterson's limp. He was a pilot in the war. One leg was about half an inch shorter than the other from injuries he received in the crash. Mrs. Collier said this man, Yoler, had an identical limp. Well, with the similarity of features, it would be easy for her to imagine that part, don't you think? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I know what you're driving at, but there are some other things, too. Mrs. Collier asked Yoler if he'd ever gone to Amherst. That's where Patterson went to college. Yoler denied it, said he was a Notre Dame graduate. That didn't check out either. Now, we can assume that William Yoler merely looked a great deal like the late Walter Patterson and told some inaccuracies in a conversation at the bar. Or we can assume that he's really Walter Patterson, covering rather badly in the face of an old acquaintance who recognized him. At any rate, this is Mrs. Collier's entire statement duly notarized. All right. Now, this is a copy of the original policy on Patterson. How long with this company? Since 1936. Started with two $5,000 policies and built up to a master over a period of years. I see. Here. $20,000. Patterson was killed in a plane crash, and we paid double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. It happened in April of 1947. Patterson took off on a rented plane one day and crashed offshore down the coast. Part of the plane wreckage was recovered, but his body was never found. The appellate court declared him legally dead after the usual three-year waiting period, April 5, 1950. Patterson's lawyer uh, filed claim for the widow April 17th, and we issued a full check April 30th of that year. Investigators' reports? Uh, right in this folder. Now, this is the last picture ever taken of Patterson, and these are his vital statistics. Uh-huh. I didn't know exactly uh, what you'd want to do first, so uh, I thought they might prove helpful. If we had a body to exhume, it could all be handled rather simply. Is Patterson's widow the beneficiary? Yes. Gloria Ann Patterson. Uh, incidentally, uh, she knows nothing about this report yet. Oh? Well, where'd these things come from? Pictures and fingerprints aren't stock material in insurance files. Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, gathered them for me. He's been very helpful. Oh. Has Patterson's widow been checked? As far as the money goes, she simply banked it in a savings account. Hasn't been touched at all. Well, on the face of it, that would eliminate the probability of any fraud on her part. Yes, for the moment. it would. Well, I want to look this all over. Sure. Uh, you'll keep in touch with me, won't you? You bet. I spent the remainder of my day in and about Wilmington talking to the principals connected with the plane crash death of Walter Patterson. Number one was the radio operator who'd spoken to him last. Number two, a mechanic at the flying field. And number three, Lieutenant James Craigson, Coast Guard, who had conducted the search in the bay. See attached statement. We both agreed that an unreported rescue was possible but highly improbable. And when I left for Tucson that night, I was more or less convinced that all I'd find there would be a lot of desert sunshine. Expense account item two, $202.25, plane fare and incidental expenses from Wilmington to Tucson. I settled for a motel room out by the Veterans Hospital, slept six hours, then looked up Sergeant Tyler at the police station. Yeah, sure, Mr. Tyler. What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Elgin said you sent him a little information on William Yoler. I wonder if you have anything to add to that, Sergeant. No, nothing much. Of course, I don't know what you folks are driving at exactly. I just checked up on him a little bit. Well, he resembles a man who's supposed to be dead. And that's why I'm here. I see. Well, there's nothing much I can add to what I sent Mr. Elgin, Dollar. Yola's never been in any trouble around here. Gets along fine. You were the one who checked out the residency business? Yeah. According to Vitals, Yola wasn't born in this state, and I, like I said, no one knew him around here until five years ago. What does he do? Nothing. Always oh, seems to have plenty of money. Bought a nice little house out in Sierra Vista. Paid $42,000 for it. Is he married? No, lives alone there. Putters around with clay and painting. You know if he flies? I couldn't tell you that. He might. How about his friends? Lots of them, Mr. Dollar. A little town like this, you get to know people fast. Now, really, you folks might be spending a lot of money for nothing. Will Yola don't seem like the kind of fellow who's hiding out from anybody. Yeah, I agree. But I'll have to talk to him anyhow. Yeah. Here's his address. Sure pretty day, isn't it? Mm, sure is. Mr. 
Mr. Yoler? Yo. Who are you? My name's Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Well, come on in. Oh, thanks. Take a chair. Anywhere. Oh, what's, what's on your mind? Oh, I'm just making a routine check, Mr. Yoler. I thought perhaps you could help me. No, what about? Well, I'm running down a report in the home office. Now, tell me, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were out at the El Conquistador Hotel? I'm out there all the time. What about it? I steal something? No, uh, you met a woman named Carlier. Did I? Yes, it was at the bar. You had a drink with her. No, I might have. I still don't understand. Though. Well, I know it seems confusing. Uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll admit you look a great deal like the man in the picture. Yeah, I suppose I do. Be darned, I, I, I'd do it that. Well, that's why I'm here. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. He was lost in a plane crash five years ago. The Mrs. Collier, who saw you here, thought you were him. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. Oh, I wasn't in the Army. You want to smoke? Oh, thanks. No. She was a lifelong friend of the man, Mr. Yoler. I have her sworn statement about the identity. Well? What years did you go to Notre Dame? I didn't go to Notre Dame. What is this? Well, that's what you told Mrs. Collier. Oh. <laughs> oh, now I remember that woman. Well, that was um, on Sunday. Yeah, well, I, I might have told her anything, Mr. Dollar. You know, she was one of those inquisitive kind. I never could make out what was on her mind. Oh, now I get it. You, uh... She thought that I was this man. Yeah. Mm. That's funny. Uh, did you go to college? Yeah, Tulane. I got out in 36. You haven't lived in Arizona all your life. Where else have you lived? Uh, Mr. Dell, I, I don't want to be unpleasant, but do you have any right to uh, ask me questions like this? Well, no, I don't. But you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them, Mr. Yoder. All right, why not? Well, I've lived in Cincinnati, Buffalo, around the country. I came here a few years ago for my health. I, I got a little asthma that bothers me. Ever been married? Yeah, once, 1944. Didn't last very long. Anything else you want to know? Well, are you in a hurry? I can come back no, later. No, no, you... not exactly. I, I've got to go downtown today, that's all. Look, uh, you seem like a nice enough guy, but it makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. Well, and I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Yoler. Please understand, it's just a matter of identity. Well, you know who I am. I just told you. Mm, that's true. Uh I don't like this business much. Is there any way that we can eliminate it? Uh, I have a birth certificate and some other papers. You can have them. Make photostats if you well, like. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Yoder. Well, they're in my safety deposit box down at the bank. I'll get them for you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, my job is to check them. Sure. Sure, it's okay by me. Well, how do you like Tucson? Well, it's a lot different from Connecticut. Yeah, I'll bet. The uh, birth certificate and whatever else you have will help a lot, but... Wonder if I could ask another favor. Sure, what is it? The most positive identification would be fingerprints. Oh? The other, I'm not so much interested in who you are, but simply in proving that you're not Walter Patterson. If you volunteered a set of prints, it'd save me a great deal of digging around. Could you drop in at the police station? <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Dollar, why not? Well, that'll be fine. That's all right. Nice meeting you. Same here. <laughs> If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversation or his actions. He was almost too anxious to help me. By five o'clock, I had made reservations to return to Wilmington because the set of fingerprints he attached, which Mr. Yoler made at the Tucson police station later that day, in no way matched the right thumb and index prints recorded in your file for Walter Patterson. In short, the report seemed erroneous. William Yoler might not have been William Yoler, but he certainly was not Walter Patterson. Johnny Dollar. Will Yoler, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the prints. Dollar, I I've got to talk to you. Something wrong? Plenty. Do you know how to get to the Arizona Inn? Well, I can find it. All right, I'll be there in 20 minutes. In the tone of his voice, I felt compelled to get there in half that time. I sat down at the bar and ordered a drink and waited for him to show up. 
An hour later, I was still waiting. I called his house three times and received no answer. I began to get worried. Finally, I left word with the bartender and took a cab out to his house. I arrived there at 8.35. There were no lights on and apparently no one around. I walked up to the front door and found it partially open. Yola? Yola? Mr. Yola? Operator? Give me the police, please. One moment. Sergeant Tyler speaking. Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Hi, how's it going? Thought you were leaving. Not for a while, Sergeant. I'm at Will Yoler's house. He's been murdered. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Every Saturday on CBS Radio, Theater of Today brings you fresh, gripping drama, well-acted stories of human relations. Sometimes it's comedy, sometimes serious. Always, Theater of Today strikes a chord of response in listeners who readily identify the stories with their own experience, past or present. Remember to hear Theater of Today every Saturday in the daytime on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Turned out to be a long night. Sergeant Tyler and several homicide officers arrived at the murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the matter at hand. Yola had been beaten to death. There were signs of a violent struggle having taken place all over the house, kitchen, bathroom, living room. As far as the police could determine, nothing was missing. The motive, the name of the killer, and any probable suspects were all up in the air. As Sergeant Tyler drove me back to my motel room. The whole thing's a mess, Dollar. You sure he didn't say anything else to you on the phone? Just asked to meet me. I'll admit he sounded frightened and worried about something. But I don't get it. Our business was all finished. He wasn't the man I was looking for. You going to be around for a while? Well, if I can help you, I'll stick around, sure. Otherwise, I'll get back to Wilmington as soon as I can. I'd like to have you around for a day or two. You have a particular reason, Sergeant? Yes, I do. What? I want to find me a killer, and I think you can help. Nobody walks into a man's house, fights with him, breaks up furniture and lamps, beats him to death without making a lot of noise about it. Well, the wind was pretty strong. I don't care if a hurricane was blowing people fight like that, there's always noise. Somebody heard something. Somebody saw something. Somebody saw someone. My men will cover every house in Sierra Vista if they have to, to turn up a witness. Bound to be somebody, somewhere. The dogged Sergeant Tyler turned out to be 100% correct. In fact... 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murder of William Mueller. One of them, a Mrs. Lucas, gave us what turned out to be our best lead. I take a walk every evening after dinner. The nicest part of the day. And you were out walking last night, Mrs. Lucas? Yes. I told the officers everything. Would you tell us, please, Mrs. Lucas? I walked past Mr. Yoler's house on my way down the Arroyo. What time was that, Mrs. Lucas? Between 7.30 and 8. And I saw Mr. Yoler standing in front of the house talking to this man. I spoke to him, and he spoke to me. Can you describe the man he was talking to? Yes, I saw him very well. He was a very large man, bigger than Mr. Yoler. And Mr. Yoler always struck me as a big man. Uh, Go on. This man was a good two inches taller he had on a top coat, a tweed one, and he had his hat in his hand. His hair was red. How old would you say? Not over 40. Have you ever seen him before? No. 
I noticed him when I walked by on my way down the arroyo, as I said. And then when I was coming back, I could see through the window, and he was still there. With the lights on in the house? Oh, yes, in the living room. And the porch light was still on, too. Would you know this man if you saw him again, Mrs. Lucas? Well, yes, I would. I'm sure I would. He was so big. Was there a car out in front of Mr. Yola's house? I didn't notice one. There could have been. Was there a bus service that runs oh, up there? Oh, no. Everyone who lives in the Arroyo has to have a car. No buses up there at all. Sergeant Tyler issued an all-points bulletin according to the description given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to William Yola's house at 6.30 the previous evening. The cab driver verified Mrs. Lucas's description of the suspect and the important information that he had picked up the suspect at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had arrived on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Roger Bales. But except for a strong case against him... The whole thing was still very confusing from our point of view. Expense account item three, $6.50. Long-distance telephone charges to your office. Well, I'll be darned. You have to stay there? Well, they've asked me to, Mr. Elgin. Well, as far as the insurance company is concerned, it's really none of our business, is it? That's right, Mr. Elgin. If I'm going to... Dollar. Oh, hold on. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Oh, yeah? Here. Let me see. Mr. Elgin. Yes? It is our business, after all. Huh? The War Department has a better sample of Walter Patterson's prints than you gave me. Please check out. Uh, Slow down. I still don't understand. I wired a sample of Yoler's prints to the War Department this morning for a positive identification. They just answered me. Yoler was Walter Patterson. Uh Uh-oh. Where did you get those prints that were in the file you gave me? Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, got them for me. From a pilot's license. Uh Uh-huh. I'd better call Mr. Brennan. Oh, don't you dare. Well, what can I do to help you, Dollar? Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Expense account item four, $42.85. Expenses while in Tucson. And item five, same as item two, traveling expenses from Tucson to Wilmington. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, called you, obtained lawyer Brennan's home address, and went directly there. The house was English, conservative, expensive. And the fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Yes? Good evening. I'd like to see Mr. Brennan, please. It's rather important. Uh, My name is Dollar. Bob's been ill for the last two or three days, Mr. Dollar. He's up in his room reading now. If you're sure it's important, I'll disturb you. It is, Mrs. Brennan, very important. I'm not Mrs. Brennan. I'm Mrs. Patterson. What? Is there something wrong? Oh, no, no, Mrs. Patterson. Come here, Mr. Dollar. You'll excuse me, please. I'll see if he can see you. I watched Walter Patterson's widow disappear up a column stairway. I hadn't been ready to meet this attractive, well-groomed woman. But after I had met her and seen her for that brief moment, I was partially prepared to meet Robert Brennan, attorney at law. Mr. Dollar, Bob. Oh, hello, Mr. Dollar. You're a late caller. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Bob, I'll run along. It's almost seven. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Patterson. Brennan, I just flew in from Tucson, Arizona. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Well, good night. Uh, Gloria, you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Bob. Let's go into the living room. Come on, dear. Are you sure you want Mrs. Patterson here? Yeah. Gloria, I didn't get these bruises falling down a flight of stairs. I got them in a fight. I flew to Tucson the day before yesterday to see Walter. What? Yes, Walter's been alive all this time. Bob. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When you get me in court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brennan? Gloria, Walt didn't die in that crash. He was picked up in the bay by a fishing boat on its way to Florida. The first port they came into was Charleston. 
He phoned me long distance from there and told me all about it. This was ten days after we all thought he was dead. Gloria, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? He hated you. You know how often he asked you for a divorce? It was the idea he had when he phoned me from Charleston. He said it was his chance to get away from you. He knew how I always felt about you, and he said I could have you. For a price. You've been supporting him wherever he's been since then? 25000 a year, regular monthly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Gloria. Did he tell you he hated me? Did he? He just wanted to be away from you, from everything. The war changed him that way. Uh, about the day before yesterday... The man at the insurance company called up making inquiries. I didn't know if he'd sent an investigator out there or not, but I gave him a lot of information and material that, well, it should have helped throw you off. It threw me off, all right, especially the fingerprints. Mr. Dollar can tell you, Gloria, how Walt didn't want to be here with you. Isn't that right, Dollar? Didn't he do everything he could to make you think his name was Yoler? Uh-huh. You see, Gloria? Where is he now? He's dead, Mrs. Patterson. Truly dead now. Oh. That's all I have to say, Dollar. You fought with Walter. You killed him. It was him or me, Gloria. I... He phoned me two days ago and said that the police had been checking on him. I told him what it was all about, not to get scared. But he was scared, and I got a plane the first chance I had. What did you argue about? Apparently, you'd been there that morning. He was going to tell you the truth and claim he had amnesia. He said he had a date to meet you. You didn't answer my question. What do you mean I didn't answer? I just, I just told you he was going to blow the whole thing. Oh, Bob. All I wanted out of this was you, Gloria. He didn't want you. I did. Last week you said you decided to marry me. It took you five years to decide that. And it took him one lousy afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. I realize that the confusion is set down in this report is worthless as evidence both to the police and your insurance company. The proof that Brennan killed Patterson will be a matter for the courts to decide. The proof that Gloria Ann Patterson is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent claim is a matter for you to decide. At any rate, she is a widow now. And I personally am convinced that she had no complicity in the matter of claims, murder, or collusion. Expense account item six, same as item one. Expenses from Wilmington to Hartford. Expense account total, $610.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yes, Roma wines taste better because only Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Roma Wines presents... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Dan Durier in The Will to Power a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Dan Durier in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! I walked over to the safe and began to dial the numbers. Before I snapped it open, I turned round to look at him. 
He was leaning back in the easy chair at the end of the room. His greasy face was covered with a shrewd smile. And he poured a revolver in his right hand. Come on, get it open. The gun looked like a model they stopped making in 1900. A 22 with a two-inch barrel. There were about 40 feet between the safe and where he was sitting. Unless that guy was an Annie Oakley, he couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from that position. And with that gun... All right, fix Stalin. Open it. I snapped open the little safe. And there it was. I could see special Super 38 automatic stamped on the blued surface of the slide. The hammer was back, just as I knew the old man had left it. I picked up that beautiful precision instrument. I turned, not too quickly, snapped off the safety and brought the sights in line between our eyes. Hey, wait! Wait, don't! Don't, the letter! Ah! The letter! Ah. He lay there on the floor. I looked at him, and I had that strange feeling that I'd overlooked something. Something important. I walked over to where he was lying. He'd pitched forward, landing in a disjointed heap. The letter. What had he yelled about a letter? It meant nothing to me. A letter? Had I slipped up somewhere? No, it was impossible. I must have stood there over his body for ten minutes, for the blood was soaking its way across the carpet. I tried to think of how I stood now, of what I had to do next. But my mind wouldn't let me. It kept slipping back, slipping back to three months ago. Three months ago. Three months ago. Old man Donovan was in a pretty bad mood that night. He and his wife, Roseanne, were scrapping. They stopped as I came into the living room. And that's final... Uh... Oh. Oh, Charles, come in. Hello, Charles. Hello, Mrs. Donovan. I finished going over these papers, Mr. Donovan. Ah, good. Ah, uh, uh, they look okay. Yes, sir. Uh, have you seen Mrs. Donovan's bank statements around anywhere? No, I haven't run across them. Oh, she's been overdrawing again. We've got to get this straightened out once and for all. I tell you, I haven't been overdrawing. How many times do I have to tell you? Don't argue with me. Charles. Will you see if you can find them somewhere? I don't know where they are. Well, of course you don't know where they are. Look for them. What do I have a private secretary for? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to bed now. I want those statements in the morning, do you understand? Oh, good night, Roseanne. Good night, John. Charlie. Come here. I, I can't stand it any longer. I can't live in the same house with him and see you around every day. Now, now, is that a nice way to talk about your ever-loving husband? I tell you, I just can't stand it anymore. Yeah, this is no good. He's going to talk down to me once too often. I've got to get out of here before that happens. That's what I've been telling you. Charlie, let's run away. Take a plane to South America tomorrow. We could be together from then on. Let's do that, Charlie. I, I have a little money and, and I have my jewels and the furs we could get along. Let's do it. Let's call for tickets now. Run away? Look, Charlie, isn't our happiness together the most important thing? L let's just leave him. We, we could go to Mexico. He, he loves his bank books and bank statements and stocks and bonds more than me anyway. Can't we do it that way? Can't we? No, baby. We can't. Well, what are we going to do? I, I, I can't go on with him. What can we do? I... I... Charlie. Yeah, baby. That's it. You're reading my mind. Oh, Charlie, that... that that's... That's the only way. Is that what you want to say? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I... But I know, baby. You haven't got a thing to worry about. You look beautiful in black. <laughs> wasn't much time to waste. I couldn't take any chances on him catching on. If we were going to do it my way, we'd have to do it soon. I began to make plans. I told her we were going to push him out the window. I told her everything, everything except about the poison. I was ready. I bought the poison and now only had to slip it into the old man's medicine. At six o'clock that night, the phone rang. I knew that was Judge Peters. I'd picked him to establish my alibi for me. Hey, uh... 
A phone job. Yes, sir. It's uh, probably Judge Peters. He told me he wanted to see me tonight. Ah, but if I'm to finish your letters... Well, sir, uh, could you perhaps tell him that I'm not here? Huh? It'd be simpler, and I, I, I have so much of your work to finish that I... <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Hello? Hi, Judge Peters. The old man uh, swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. No, I... He liked little intrigues. Yes. They were the uh, only I adventure know. in his life. Yes. Except for uh, Rose. I'm sorry, Judge. Uh, uh, Charles isn't here. I haven't seen him all day, and I don't expect to see him tonight. <laughs> all right, Judge. Yes, I'll tell you. Good night. <laughs> we fixed that, huh? Yes, sir. I think it's better this way. Now I'll be able to finish those letters for you. Oh, fine. Oh, uh, say, fix me my medicine first, will you, Charles? All right, sir. Mm. You want uh, soda with it? Uh-huh. Enough? Uh, a little more. Ah, that's it. No. Ah, that's good. You're only a fair secretary, Charles, but you're a swell butler. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, I'll get busy on these reports. <clears throat> oh, uh, take them down to your room? Yes, sir, I can work better down there. All right. Oh, I say, make a note to dump my consolidated steel bonds tomorrow. Yes, sir. Don't you worry. I'll take care of everything tomorrow. As I walked out the door, I saw him take a sip out of his glass. The next couple of hours, I'd have a lot of work to do. I walked down the stairs instead of taking the elevator. No one had seen me enter, and no one was going to see me leave. My whole plan hinged on leaving without being noticed. I went out the side door. She was waiting for me outside just as we'd arranged. It was exactly 15 minutes after 6. So far, my timing was perfect. I took her through the hotel lobby, over to the elevator. Will you be all right? Uh, I'll be all right. Oh, boy. Yeah. Will you see that Mrs. Donovan gets off at her floor all right? She's not feeling too well. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks. Oh, say, do you happen to have the time? My watch must have stopped. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's uh, 20 after 6. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll be up in about an hour, Mrs. Donovan. Going up. That was that. Now all I had to do was to stall for time. I walked around for a while. Between 6.30 and 7, I went into some stores where I was known. I said hello to some people, just in case anyone checked. Then I walked around some more. The minutes dragged by. I must have looked at my watch 50 times during that hour and a half. At 8, I went back to the hotel. As I stepped into the elevator, I really noticed the elevator man for the first time. He was big and greasy. I had to make sure he wouldn't forget what time I went upstairs. He made the first move as the elevator began to go up. That was luck. Eh, uh, get your watch fixed, sir? Hmm? Oh, oh, sure. Says 7.30. <laughs> it's still not working. No. It's almost eight now. How do you like that? It must have stopped again. Almost eight o'clock, hmm? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Charlie? Uh, Charlie, where have you been? Oh, There's something wrong with John. Uh, he, he keeps moaning and holding his stomach. He wants me to call a doctor. Uh, Stall him for a minute. What can be wrong with him? Uh, Search me, uh, baby. Uh, I'm so glad you came. Help me to my bed, Charles. Call a doctor for me, will you? Relax, old oh. man. I'll get him in a minute. Oh, Are you going to do it now? Do you think we'd better do it now, Charlie? Oh, Charles, for the love of heaven, get a doctor. Don't just let me die here. Roseanne, please get a doctor. Charlie, I can't. Oh, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to lose my nerve. Oh, Help me get him over to the window. No, I... Oh, Charles, what are you going to do? No, no, Charles. No. That's it, Roseanne. Up, up on the sill. No. Now, push. Push. You know everything now, don't you? I just come in. He fell. He fell. We were on the other side of the room. There was nothing wrong with him before the accident. Get it? Get it? Yes. Yes. I looked at her standing there. She was shaking. 
frightened half to death. And yet her face had a reddish glow, like something warm and mellow. The kind of stuff you feel in your dreams. At that moment, I wouldn't have traded her in for anything. Anything less than a million dollars. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Dan Duryea in The Will to Power. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. A friend famed for her enjoyable little dinners recently told me her secret of gracious hospitality. Because she's usually busy in the kitchen after guests arrive, her husband keeps their friends pleasantly entertained until dinner time by serving Roma California Sherry. Yes, she's a smart hostess. For better tasting, Roma Sherry is the favorite of millions as the perfect first call for dinner and for entertaining any at any time. For Roma Sherry, like all Roma wines, begins with choicest grapes. Then Roma Vintner's skill and America's finest winemaking resources guide this luscious grape treasure unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection. Later, at peak taste richness, Roma selects from the world's greatest wine reserves for your pleasure. So share with your guests the better taste of Roma California wines. Roma Sherry, Port, Muscatel, or Tokay. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, by America's Greatest Vintner. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, Dan Durier, in The Will to Power, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. inquest there was some talk of an autopsy, but the old man's prestige and a crew of lawyers preserved the body in a state of unmarred dignity at the request of the grief-stricken widow. Hmm. <laughs> That's just the way they put it, too. The day after the funeral, we were married, quietly, no publicity. Well, there I was. I had all the old man's dough, and I had her. I don't know what it was that made me go on. Maybe it was the reading of the will that made me go through with my original plans. A million? Well, now we know better. In one safety deposit box alone, there was over 400000 in cash. And then there were the estates. Compared to that kind of money and what it meant to me, she was just another dame. <laughs> James Donovan was poisoned and then pushed out the window. I suggest you dig up the body. What? Who's this speaking? I, uh, I work in the hotel. The night before Donovan kill, was killed, his wife threatened him. Ask anyone on the floor. They'll tell you how Donovan and his wife always fought. Now, look, suppose you come down here That's and... all, Lieutenant. Dig him up. <laughs> The second part was in the works, and now all I had to do was to sit back and wait. I was on my way to being the sole owner of the Donovan Millions, standing alone on top of a mountain, with everyone looking up at me. Everyone looking up at me. What's the idea dragging us down here, Lieutenant? Treating us like a pair of common criminals? What, what is it you want of us, You'll Lieutenant? get the idea in just a minute now. Just don't get excited. Not get excited? Why, of all It's a... mighty strange the guy falls out of a window with two people in the room. What do you mean, strange? We were on the other side of the room. Accidents will happen. Sure, sure, I know. I was at the inquest, too. What I uh, really wanted to ask you was, uh, where were you before he fell out 
I told you, I'd just come in. I see. You were out before. Why, yes, I'd gone... Can you prove that? What? Can you prove that you weren't in the apartment any length of time before the accident? Yes, I I guess so. I, I hadn't seen him all day. Sure, I guess I could prove it. But why? Mm. And how about you, Mrs. Donovan? I... Why, well, I... Listen, I... Lieutenant, if you have something to tell us, let's hear it. Otherwise, let us go. Okay, brother. We, uh, dug up old man Donovan. He had enough poison in him to kill an ox. Poison? Poison? Well, I... Why, that's impossible. He couldn't have been poisoned. Mrs. Donovan was up there with him all the time. Oh, she was. Of huh? course. He couldn't have been poisoned. I see. Can we go now? Yeah, sure, sure, you can go. Mrs. Donovan will have to wait, though. We're booking her for murder. It was perfect. They indicted her for second-degree murder. That was a smart move on the part of the DA, because he couldn't conclusively prove whether the fall or the poison killed him. And then she swore to high heaven that she didn't see him drink anything while she was there. The lawyer who was trying to prove suicide almost broke a blood vessel. The best part came when the prosecution tried to get me to testify for them. I showed them our marriage license then. It convinced her that I was trying to protect her. But it gave the DA all the motive he needed. The jury finds the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree. Oh. There was only one more step left. I had to face her in her cell. You got five minutes, mister. Darling. Charlie. Oh, Charlie, I've been waiting for you to come. I'm still in a daze, Roseanne. How did it all happen? The trial, the conviction, it all went so fast. Oh, I don't know how it happened, but... Maybe it's better this way. At least part of what we did has been paid for. When I get out, we'll be able to live a free life together. But ten years. No, darling. I'm going to tell them. No. I'm going to confess everything. I'll do that rather than see you wasting away in prison. No. No, you're not. You, you'll just be trading places with me. It'll be punishment enough if we're deprived of each other's love. No, Charlie, this is the only way it can be. And ten years isn't so long. And I know you'll, you'll always be mine, no matter where I am. Yes, darling. No matter where you are, I'll always be yours. I really felt bad about it, too. But you've got to compromise in life. I traded in a thing I wanted for something I wanted more. Money. And power. It was right there in the palm of my hand. And all I did was make a fist. I headed up to one of the old man's hideouts in the White Mountains then to let things cool off. There I wanted to plan all the things I'd do during the coming weeks. It would have been a great time except for that phone call. Yes? Hello, Mr. Ross. I was uh, reading about Mrs. Donovan's trial, Mr. Ross. Who is this? The old man was really poisoned, huh? You uh, running off, leaving your wife to take a rap. Who is this? Tell you what. For uh, 25 grand, no one will ever know about you sneaking out of the apartment that day. <sighs> I think you'd better come up here and see me in person. Tomorrow night at nine. Why not tonight? You'll be there if you know what's good for you, brother. Blackmail. I knew what to do, and paying him wasn't the answer. Once I began to pay, he'd then have the power that belonged to me. He'd pull the strings. This man, whoever he was, could degrade me and humiliate me more than I'd ever been degraded while serving the old man. I heard the car drive up at a little after nine. I'd left the front door open and sat in the living room, waiting for him. He walked in. Hello, Mr. Ross. It was the elevator man. 
Well, well, Mr. Ross. Got a pretty classy setup here. I might. Poor Mr. Donovan. Sure is a shame when a guy has to leave all that money behind. Get to the point or get out. Brother, from now on, you're going to treat me with respect. What I know can send you straight to the chair. Keep talking. I saw you sneak out of Donovan's apartment a couple of hours before he died. I saw you pull your act in the lobby so the dame would be alone with the old man. It's pretty clear the way you framed her at the trial. But you didn't fool me for a minute. What's the count? Well, I, I figure you're working the babe for plenty, so, uh... See, the paper said that Donovan left the flock of millions. Uh, well, uh, 25000 will do for a start. You know I haven't got that kind of money here. How much have you got? Well, I guess there ought to be uh, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars in the wall safe. But look here, if Get I... it! Then what do I get in return? I'll keep quiet for a while. For a while. That's it. Seeing I'm such a valuable guy, I figure you ought to put me on a payroll. Make me, uh... Sort of a private secretary, like you was the whole man Donovan. <laughs> I think I understand. Now. Yeah, yeah, you bet you understand. Now get the dough, and fast. Yes, I see now. I think I see the whole picture. I walked over to the safe and began to dial the numbers. Before I snapped it open, I turned round to look at him. He was leaning back in the easy chair at the end of the room. His greasy face was covered with a shrewd smile, and he was pawing that silly little revolver in his right hand. It looked like a 1900 Ivor Johnson 22 caliber with a two-inch barrel. I took that, and the fact that there were about 40 feet between us in at a glance. Unless that guy was an Annie Oakley, he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn from that position, and with that gun... All right. Fritz Stalin, open it! I snapped open the little safe, and there it was... I could see Colt Super 38 Automatic stamped on the blued surface of the slag. The hammer was back, just as I knew the old man had left it. I snapped off the safety and brought the sights in line between our eyes. Hey, wait! Don't! The, the ladder! Ah! No, the ladder! He lay there on the floor. I looked down at him. And I had this strange feeling that I'd overlooked something. I'd hidden his car in the garage and gotten rid of the body. In the cellar under two feet of dirt. Maybe I should have left him alone. I could have pleaded self-defense. But no, no. After Donovan, another trial might not have turned out so well. Now I had to get away. I was really in the clear. Nobody would ever look under those boards in the cellar. Nobody would ever dare to snoop around Donovan's place. My place. Not unless they suspect something. And why should anyone suspect anything? Not in my house. My house. In a minute I'd be off this dirt road and on the highway to New York. Yes, that's it. Back to New York. Then out of the country. What the... Hey, you. How about pulling out of the road and letting me by? You seem to be in an awful hurry, mister. Who is it? Why don't how you... How about letting me see your driver's license, huh? Well, 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 if it isn't Mr. Ross. Why, uh, uh, Lieutenant Braddon, uh, what's the trouble? Oh, no trouble at all. As a matter of fact, I just came up here to talk to you. Sort of a social call. Well, uh, right now I'm going to New York. I, I, I mean, I can't. You see, you see, uh, Lieutenant... You know, Mr. Ross, I never had a chance to talk to you after the trial. I, uh... I got a little theory about Donovan's death. Oh, it's too late to do anything about it now, of course, but I thought it might be nice if we could sort of uh, discuss it. Sure, sure. Any time except now. I'm in a great hurry. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. What? Well, some crank sent me a letter, see, saying he was coming up here to see you. It, <laughs> it seems he thought that you might kill him. A letter. Yeah, oh, it probably didn't mean a thing, but, well, you're a rich man now, Mr. Ross. You'll just have to get used to being a target for cranks. A letter. That's what he meant. A letter. What's the matter, Mr. Ross? You look, you don't look so good. Yeah, there's nothing to be afraid of. Ah, I tell you what. Your, uh, your house ain't far from here. Let you and me take a little stroll up there and see if that crank has arrived, huh? It'll make you feel better. Oh, I'm all right. I'm all right. 
Just let me go. No, 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 no. I insist. It'll set your mind at ease. Okay? Come on, let's go. The cop didn't have any trouble finding him at all. I guess Roseanne will get the money after all now, when she gets out. It's too bad, really. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma, America's favorite wines. This is Ken Niles returning to our suspense microphone with the star of tonight's play, Dan Durier. Dan, I've noticed in your last few pictures that you've forsaken the cloak of villainy to play the hero. Yes, Ken, I have managed to qualify for a love scene or two lately and of my wicked reputation. Well, then I'm afraid we've done you wrong tonight, casting you as the villain. No, no, on the contrary, Ken. I don't want to be a hero on suspense. Look at what happened to the good guy tonight. Poisoned, pushed out of a window in a couple of minutes, flat. <laughs> well, maybe you're right, Dan, but heel or hero, for your fine performance tonight, you rate a reward. So here's a gift basket of Roma wines with thanks from Roma, America's greatest vintner. Oh, thank you, Ken. And Roma... I'll be glad to be a villain on suspense anytime. And you'll be glad to have Roma California Sherry on hand when guests drop in. Just serve the Roma Sherry in your gift basket and watch the smiles of enjoyment appear at the first sip of this better-tasting Roma wine. Remember, too, Roma Sherry is the perfect first call for dinner. A delightful treat anytime. I, uh, I know that about Roma Sherry, Ken. But do you know why Roma Sherry tastes better? Well, to begin with, Roma selects and presses the choicest, most luscious grapes in all California. Then the ancient skill of Roma vintners with America's finest winemaking resources guides this rich treasure unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection. Later, at peak taste richness, Roma selects from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines for your pleasure. That's why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. What better reason? Thank you, Ken, and good night. Thank you, Dan Durier. Dan Durier appeared through the courtesy of Universal International Studios and is currently being seen in their production, White Tie and Tales. Tonight's suspense play was written by Frank Talbus. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Joan Bennett as star of Suspense. <laughs> Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Our detective friend, Mike Shane, solves most of his cases by a combination of clues, shrewd thinking, and daring action. But he's also a great student of criminal files and case histories of famous crimes. This morning, Mike is at his desk, deep in study of the latest exploit of another well-known detective, Mr. Dick Tracy, when suddenly Mike's useful and very ornamental associate, Phyllis Knight, opens the office door. Psst. Mike. Mike. Hmm? Huh? Uh, yes, Angel? Hide that funny paper. There's a client in the waiting room. Oh, just when I was getting to the... Come on, come on. Okay, okay, show him in. Uh, Mr. Shane will see you now, Mr. Carter. 
This is Mr. Shane, Mr. Nelson Carter. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Won't you sit down, sir? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Mr. Shane, I'll have to be very brief. I'm an attorney, and I'm on my way to see a client. It's uh, it's about him, about Mr. Dixon, that I've come here. Mm-hmm, I see. The situation is so uh, fantastic, really, I'm afraid Mr. Dixon's life is in peril. I fear for him. I really do. Is it a case that the police department should handle, Mr. Carter? Well, no, no, I, I don't see how the... Mr. Shane, three days ago, when Gregory Dixon walked into my office, I... I screamed in terror. I almost fainted. Fainted? But, but... Yes. What? Two months ago, we had buried Mr. Dixon. Oh, you had buried Mr... What? Yes. Oh, oh yes, it was a perfectly proper funeral. Hmm. Well, I thought I was seeing his ghost. We'd received word that Mr. Dixon was killed in an accident down in Mexico, in Yucatan. Imagine, imagine my consternation. Here he walked into my office while I'm administrating his estate. Uh Uh-huh, that would make anybody do nip-ups. Yet you say you buried him. Oh, it was a mistake, a horrible mistake. Oh. Somebody died in Yucatan. They thought it was Mr. Dixon. The coffin was shipped to Mr. Dixon's cousin. We held a funeral and I was appointed administrator of the estate. But, uh, uh, just a minute, sir. You started off by telling us Mr. Dixon's life is in danger. Yes, his heirs have received his bequests. Now, they'll have to refund the money, and, uh, <clears throat> well, with all respect for Mr. Dixon's relatives, I must say several of them are extremely unsavory. Well, that's no reason for thinking that they will uh, try to kill him. Well, I think there's every danger they will, Mr. Shane. One of his cousins came into my office yesterday. He was absolutely furious because he was cheated out of his inheritance. Hmm? He asked me about Mr. Dixon's health and how long I thought he might live, and so So you on. want us to protect your client? Yes. Now, I'm going out to his house right now. I... I'd like you to come along and talk to Mr. Dixon. Well, I would rather prevent a murder than solve one. Then you will come with me? Yes, Mr. Carter, we will. Well, well, Carter, you're an old worrywart. A good attorney, but an old worrywart. Now, now, Mr. Dixon, you don't appreciate the serious danger with your name. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, feel that I'm a man about to be murdered? Well, we really don't know, sir. You see... I uh... can understand Carter's feelings. He doesn't want to have to probate your will a second time. Every time you die, you make more work for the poor man. <laughs> Clarence, than you heard. <laughs> As I was coming in from the garden. I'm Clarence Fisher, Mr. Dixon's cousin. How do you do, Mr. How do Fisher? You do? Of course, Carter may be right. I'm worth considerably more to you, Clarence, dead than alive. I can talk like that to Clarence. He's got a fine sense of humor. Not like his cousin Howard. Howard is sober as a judge with a toothache. Assuming Mr. Dixon's life is in danger, who would be the most likely suspect? Why, several. Before I left the office, I made a list of Mr. Dixon's beneficiaries. It, uh, well, if you care to read it now, I... Thank you, sir. Clarence Fisher. Oh, that's me. Oh, yes. Uh, bequest uh, $10,000. Howard Connell, 20000 William A. Wilkinson, 25000 And a farm at Redwood City. Various charities, 200000 Mm-hmm, I see. Apparently, Mr. Carter's modesty made him omit his own bequest to the tune of $25,000. Well, uh, <clears throat> but uh, after all, uh, surely I couldn't be a suspect. You know, there's one thing which puzzles me and which none of you gentlemen has explained. Mr. Dixon is here alive and well. But uh, who is buried out in the cemetery? You know, I've wondered about that myself. You see, when I was down in Yucatan, I fell ill of a fever. I'm still about 30 pounds underweight. It ruined my eyes, and I had to get glasses. But that's beside the point. When I got up from my sickbed, I found my wallet had been stolen. So had most of my papers. I assumed the thief was later killed. Uh, suppose somebody down in Yucatan received orders to kill Mr. Dixon. Suppose the person who did the killing, or uh, ordered the killing, now realizes that a mistake was made. Yes, he may try again. Mm, That's a grave thought, and no pun intended. May I ask, who received the coffin here? Uh, Mr. Dixon's cousin, Howard Connell. Actually, the body was not buried. It was interred in the mausoleum. We followed the instructions in Mr. Dixon's will. Say, you brought up a good point, Phyllis. If we could find out whose body's in that coffin, it just might be a clue. We might even find out if the man had been murdered. Yeah, and if it were murder, we would know definitely that Mr. Dixon is in real danger. Well, then I suggest you have the body exhumed, if that's possible. It is possible, Mr. Dixon. I'll ask the inspector of homicide to use his influence with the coroner's office. Sometimes dead men tell very interesting tales. No, that 
But I can think of a lot of things I'd rather do, Mike Shane, than visit a mausoleum. Yes, but we'll make it as short as possible, Angel. Now, let's see. According to the superintendent, it should be down this next corridor. All right. Hello. Oh. <laughs> to shave, Miss Knight. Oh, hello there, coroner. Mike, I'd like to know what's going on around here. What's wrong? Take a look in the coffin. There... There's no body in it. You're right, Angel. Nothing but gunny sacks and granite rocks. Mike Shane and Phyllis have dropped in at police headquarters to talk over their problem with the inspector. With them is Nelson Carter, their client's attorney. The whole situation is completely screwy, Inspector. A man is reported dead. Uh -huh. His coffin arrives from Mexico. He has a funeral. His property's divided. Two months later, the fellow turns up alive and kicking. And his coffin is filled with gunny sacks and granite rocks. It's a new one on me, kids. Unless this Gregory Dickler think he was dead. Well, then why would he come back at all, Inspector? He almost lost all his money and property. Uh -huh. Well, I don't see you need worry, Mike. Dixon is alive, there's no corpse in the coffin, nobody's dead. No, but it's got our curiosity up, Inspector. You know, Mike and I do handle other cases besides murder. This time we've drawn a completely wacky mystery. Well, you can make light of it, Miss Knight. But since finding that empty coffin, I'm more convinced than ever that there's something diabolical afoot. All right, diabolical what? It's only three days since anybody knew Mr. Dixon was still alive. Several of the heirs would stop at almost nothing to hold on to their inheritances. You said that before, Mr. Carter. Now, let's see, you gave me a list of the bequests. Uh, which man stormed into your office yesterday? The uh, one who wanted to know how long you thought Dixon might live? Yes, that was Wilkinson, William A. Wilkinson. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's listed here for $25,000 on a farm near Redwood City. Yes, he's living there right now. He was furious because he'll have to turn the farm back to Mr. Dixon. And then this Howard Connell, he's down for $20,000. Uh, what about him? A cousin of Mr. Dixon. He gambles, plays the horses, will do anything to keep out of work, and can't hold a job anyway. Well, I suppose we might interview those men. Though I don't know what we could ask them. No crime's been committed. Well, you won't be able to get hold of Howard Connell. He left for New York after Mr. Dixon's funeral. Well, we might start him with a little talk with Clarence Fisher, the uh, cousin we met in Dixon's house. Uh, if I were doing it, Mike, I know where I'd begin. Yeah? Where, Inspector? Well, you say Cousin Wilkinson lives on a farm near Redwood City. Yes? Well, it's a very pleasant sunny day outside, and twice as pleasant down country. I know a tidy little inn on King's Road west of Redwood City... They serve swell hamburgers, and there's a cute little Irish waitress with a green apron. Ah, oh, say no more, Inspector. Say no more. You've sold us one trip to Redwood City. If you don't mind, Mr. Shane, we'll sit and talk under this apple tree. Uh, Got to keep my eye on Alec, the hired hand. Laziest man you ever seen. Whatever you wish, Mr. Wilkinson. Oh, an old-fashioned hammock. That's for me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, when I got Carter's letter about Dixon being alive, I couldn't believe my eyes, so to speak. Sort of upset my plans for the future. By the way, it's sort of a warmish day. You folks like a drink? Uh, you, Phil? Huh? Not now, thanks. Maybe some water later on. Well, we'll make it apple cider. Water here doesn't taste right to me. Dixon just got done putting in pipe water. Bricked up the old well over there and went modern on it, so to speak. Uh, well, what'd you folks say you came down here about? Uh, we didn't say, sir. Mr. Carter seems to think Mr. Dixon's in some sort of danger. Now, we'd like to ask you if he has any enemies who might, uh... Carter? I told that lawyer yesterday... Well, I guess maybe he repeated it to you, Mr. Shane. You can see this is a very nice little farm, and I was expecting to make myself a piece of money off it, so to speak. Handing it back to Dixon now is going to hurt like pulling eye teeth, so to speak. Maybe you could buy it back from Mr. Dixon. Did he make much use of the farm? Oh, spent all of his weekends down here, and I haven't got the cash to buy it from him. Mr. Wilkinson, you say that Dixon bricked up the water well? Uh, yes, he did it a couple of months ago. Left it in an unsightly mess. Alec cleaned it up for me, dug a new rose garden, and shoveled the dirt down in the well. Quite a number of stones missing from the coping around the well. Oh, Mike, I know what you're driving at. Yeah. You and I, Angel, have seen those stones before. The identical size and shape... In a coffin in a mausoleum. 
I've broken through. Mike? Mike, can you hear me? Mike, have you found anything? Yeah. Yeah, plenty. A body. Jiminy. Jiminy Christmas, Mr. Wilkinson. This is bad. Awful bad. Oh, stop your jaw, and Alec. You make me nervous. Mr. Wilkinson, do you know whose body this is? Of course not. How do you suppose I could tell? Mike, there's a ring on one of his fingers. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A gold ring. The band's in the shape of a snake. There. Let me look at it. Mean anything to you, sir? No. This hole in his head means something to me. He was murdered. Mike, we'd better get hold of the inspector. Yeah. Yes, we're heading back to San Francisco and pick up the inspector, and then... Yeah? Then we're going to have another talk with Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Say, when I suggested that you kids take a little run down country, I didn't expect you to come tearing back to me with a body. No, and now that we've found it, the question is, whose body is it? Yes, and until we know that answer, we're not going to spill the news to Dixon. Remember that, Angel. All right. We've got to tiptoe very cautiously. There's Dixon, out in the garden, talking to Mr. Fisher. Yes. Look, Inspector, if you don't mind, I'll do most of the questioning. Mm -hmm. We've got to approach Dixon downwind. Suits me. Well, Mr. Sheen, Miss Knight, I was wondering what had become of you. We uh, brought along a friend of ours, Mr. Dixon, the Inspector of Homicide. Inspector of Homicide? Yes. You see, if anybody should succeed in killing you, this is the man who will lose his sleep over. Well, glad to know you, Inspector. And may your slumbers be unbroken. Uh, this is my cousin, Clarence Fisher. Well, how do you do? How do you do? I suppose we go into the house so we can sit down. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Dixon, we just got back from a little drive down to Redwood City. We talked with another of your cousins, William Wilkinson. That's so? Hates to give up the farm, doesn't he? Oh, very much. He's put in a new rose garden. We noticed that the old water well behind the house has been bricked up. Oh, really? Wilkinson changing things around his suit, huh? Then then you didn't fill in the well yourself? Me? Why, no. Why should I? Uh, Mr. Dixon. Yes? Did you have any people visit you down on your farm from the, uh, the, the past few months? Oh, a few. Howard Connell, Clarence here, Wilkinson, old fuss budget Carter, and a few others. I see. Well, sir, if I'm to properly protect you, I'd like to know what those people look like. Do you have any photographs? Photographs? By the hundreds. I've got a scrapbook of snapshots. It's right over there on the wicker table. Here, uh, this is what you want? Oh, that's perfect. How about this uh, group picture here? Oh, that's me wearing the straw hat. Really? Girl, yeah, uh, girl's Joan Brooks. Uh, the man behind, I... Uh, can't remember his name. No, I can't either. Some chap was on his way to Canada... Uh, the last fellow on the far right is Howard Connell. Howard Connell. He's mm -hmm. the cousin who's gone to New York, isn't he? That's right. Last time I saw Howard was when he drove me to the airport when I went to Mexico. Does he live in San Francisco? Uh, right next door. I'm living in his house till he gets back. And when will that be? Well, I can't say. He left for New York right after Dixon's, well, funeral. The last letter I got from him didn't mention when he'd be back. Hmm. He was one of the beneficiaries under Mr. Dixon's will. I should think he would stay here in town. Oh, not Howard. He's always on the move. No telling where he is now. Here's another photo of you in the scrapbook, Mr. Dixon. A close-up. You're wearing a large, rather peculiar-looking ring. Why, yes, yes. I lost that ring some time ago. Lost it? Hmm. Have you any idea where? Why, no. It just uh, slipped off my finger one day. No idea where I lost it. But I don't see what that matters. <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, thanks very much for letting us see the pictures, Mr. Dixon. And now we'll be running along. Oh, but Mr. Shane, you were hired to protect me. You're always running off somewhere. We're working on the case, sir, I assure you. In fact, we're going to police headquarters right now, just on your account. <laughs> Now, this is the way I dope it out, Inspector. Check me if I'm wrong. Okay. First of all, we may be up against a colossal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. 
The attorney Carter comes to Phyllis and me and says Dixon's life is in danger because Dixon was reported dead and now turns up alive and his heirs hate to part with their ill-gotten gains. Then we find that Dixon's funeral was a fake. Yeah. We find his coffin filled with stones from Dixon's own water well, and we find a murdered man hidden inside the well. And that murdered man, Inspector, I'm convinced is the real Gregory Dixon. The fellow who says he's Dixon is an imposter. Yeah, I know what you base that on, Mike. The fact that the ring on the dead man's finger is the same ring we saw in Dixon's photograph. Correct. But perhaps the ring really was lost, and the person who later found the ring is the man you hauled out of the well. Well, that's possible, Inspector, but I'd like to go one step further. I'll say that the man who calls himself Gregory Dixon is actually Howard Connell, Dixon's cousin and beneficiary. I was beginning to suspect that myself. Connell very conveniently disappears on a trip to New York. Nobody knows exactly where he is or when he's coming back. But Dixon's relative ought to be able to recognize the fake unless they're all in on the deal, too. That may be, too. But there was a strong family resemblance between Dixon and Connell. Mm -hmm. I noticed it in those photographs. Mm -hmm. That's why the story about Dixon falling ill, losing 30 pounds, having to put on glasses. An alibi in case anybody began to suspect. Okay. But who killed Dixon, Phil? Mm. Who threw his body down the well and bricked it up? Both Wilkinson and Con Connell denied they closed the well. Yes, Sergeant? Mr. Shane's call to Redwood City's waiting, sir. Thanks. Take it on this phone, Mike. Thanks, Inspector. Hello? Hello, Alec? You calling me, Mr. Shane? Yes, uh, I want to ask you a question, Alec. How long have you worked for Mr. Wilkinson? Why, about a month or so. Mr. Wilkinson hired me when he took over the farm. And uh, when you were making the new rose garden for him, Alec, did you dump all that dirt down the well? Yes, sir. The well was bricked up anyway. I didn't see no harm. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Alec. Well, Wilkinson told us the truth. Yeah. The well was bricked up when he got the farm. Well, then Dixon, I, I mean, Connell lied to us. Practically everything he told us was a lie, Angel. Well, Inspector, what do you say? You make out a pretty strong case, Mike. But we don't have any real proof that Howard Connell killed Dixon and then took his place. Don't worry. We'll get the proof. Okay. I'll take your word for it, Mike. Let's go out and pick up Connell. Mr. Shane, Inspector, I just telephoned for you. Oh, why? What for? The very thing I hired Shane to prevent. It's happened. What are you talking about? You don't mean to tell me... Yes, I do mean to tell you. Mr. Dixon is dead. At the home of the late Gregory Dixon, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have found another body, the body of the man whom they were about to arrest. The dead man lies sprawled in the bushes directly beneath an open window on the second floor. Well, I don't understand. He fell from the window. We, we heard him fall. Mr. Wilkinson, what are you doing in San Francisco? I just got here from Redwood City. Carter and I came out to talk to him. Inspector, take a look at the man's head. Yeah, I see. A deep gash in the back of the skull. He must have hit his head on a rock. Hold on, hold on. Here's something else. A revolver in his coat pocket and a sheet of paper. It's a note. A typewritten note. To the authorities. I cannot go on. You know the truth by now. I killed Gregory Dixon. Then a typewritten signature. Howard Connell. Connell. Then it's true. I, I I can't believe it. Good heavens. So he committed suicide. All right. Suppose you all tell us what happened. Starting with you, Mr. Fisher. Well, I was next door in my house. Wilkerson and Carter rang my doorbell and asked if Dixon, er, uh, I mean Connell, had gone out. Yes, we'd been pounding on his door and got no answer. Yes. I was sure he was in, so I came over with him and let him into the house with my key. Wilkinson was all excited. He said he had some terrible news. He said the real Gregory Dixon was dead, and we'd all been tricked. How did you know that, Mr. Wilkinson? Yes, we just discovered that for ourselves, but you never told us. I, well, when I saw that body from the well and the ring on his finger, I recognized it. You told us it meant nothing to you. I know, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I wanted time to think it out. Then I drove up to the city and, and, and told Carter. I thought Wilkinson was crazy. I phoned Dixon, I mean Connell, and told him we were coming right out. I still couldn't believe it. That's why I jumped all over you, Mr. Shane, for letting the man get killed. 
I didn't know it was suicide and that he was a fake. Believe me, I didn't. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But uh, to get on, uh, what happened after you three were in the house? Well, Wilkinson was trying to tell me his discovery, and Carter was arguing with him. Connell wasn't downstairs, so I went up and called him. He shouted from the bedroom that he'd be down in a minute, and I went back to the living room and started asking Wilkinson questions. He told me about the ring. Yes. And we kept waiting and waiting. The living room windows were open, and I complained about the cold wind blowing in. Fisher went over and started to close the windows. He shouted, and we heard Connell crash to the ground. I saw the body falling past the window. Connell must have known he was trapped. He couldn't face us. Those open windows on the second floor, are they in Connell's bedroom? Yes. Now, let me get this straight. All three of you men were in the room when Connell fell? Yes, yes, sir. Right. That's uh-huh. right. Okay. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I'll ask you to step indoors for a few minutes. We want to examine the ground around here before you trample all over everything. Oh, yes, all right. That's all right. All right, kids. I know what you're thinking. Yes. One or more or all three of them are lying. Mm-hmm. It was not suicide. It was deliberate murder. Right, Mike. That bedroom window is less than 20 feet from the ground. Ten to one, that fall wouldn't kill a man. If Connor was really planning suicide, he wouldn't take that chance. He'd do it properly. Right. And he wouldn't be so cagey about writing his signature on the, the note uh, on the typewriter. Well, I can't believe he got that deep gash in the back of his skull from hitting one of these rocks. Well, they're not much bigger than pebbles. If you ask me, Angel, that gash was made by the butt of his revolver. One terrific blow. Then the gun was stuck in his pocket. Kids, I'm worried. We know it's murder, but hang it, were those three guys swearing they were all in the room together? We're going to have a devil of a time proving a case against any one of them. Yes, yes, but remember the old rule, Inspector. When all suspects have alibis, none of them have alibis. We've just got to get in and do some good head work. Well, while you're about it, maybe you can explain one thing to me. Huh? Explain what, Phil? Look, these rose vines. Rambling rose vines cover the whole side of this house, clear up to the roof, you see? And yet when you look at Connell's suit, there isn't a single tear or a snag... It's not even a broken rose petal on his clothes. Well, that could be because he jumped or was thrown clear of the vines. Well, then how could his body fall right against the foundations of the house? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The upstairs windows and the downstairs windows both open outwards. That's it, Angel, you've hit it. You're darn right she's hit it. Absolutely, Inspector. Now we've got some business indoors. Killed? Murder? Why, that's impossible, Mr. Shane. We were all here in the living room. We all saw the body fall. Of course you saw it fall, but Howard Connell was already dead. And he did not fall from the second floor. He did not fall? I'll uh, show you what happened, gentlemen. Now, when you three men were here in the living room, these windows were open. They were open outwards. The body was laid across the tops of both halves of the window. When Mr. Wilkinson complained of the cold, Mr. Fisher closed the windows. That took the support away from the body, and you saw Connell fall past the window. Why, that's idiotic. I'd have seen the body. You did see it, Mr. Fisher. You put it there. You killed Connell with the butt of that revolver. You murdered him because you had helped Connell impersonate Dixon. You were in the deal with him. No. No, he tricked me, too. No, Mr. Fisher. You told us that you'd gotten a letter from Howard Connell in New York. Connell never went to New York. He was right here. All right. All right, I admit it. I killed Connell when I discovered he'd murdered Dixon. He murdered my cousin. That sounds like a very lame attempt to plead the unwritten law. But that was not your reason. You killed Connell because you knew we were closing in on him. You knew Connell couldn't take it. You knew Connell would confess and that he would tie the noose around your neck, too. But I'm afraid that you've done a perfect job of that yourself, Mr. Fisher. Well, how about it, Inspector? Why are uh, so quiet, Angel? What are you thinking about? Hmm? Oh, I was just thinking about that whole fantastic scheme. What a cockeyed motive. Yeah, but it almost worked, Phil. Connell and his cousin Fisher saw a way to get a hold of all of Dixon's money, instead of just the amounts he intended to leave them in his will. First, they had to kill Dixon, get his estate distributed, then bring Dixon back to life. All the heirs and beneficiaries would then have to return their bequests to him. Oh, and Connell and Fisher would have the whole estate for themselves. Well, I've heard of killing a man for his money, but never bringing him back to life to get his inheritance. When I see a case like that, I'm almost glad I haven't got any money. Poor but honest and alive. Mm-hmm. Money is the root of all evil. 
I'll still take plenty of the root. Mm. The uh, correct quotation, honey, is the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh. Yes, it's the, uh, the love that causes the trouble. Oh, love. Well, I'll take plenty of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for Union Oil Company and reminding you once again to get your application for your Union Oil credit card this week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Like most people, Pam and Jerry North don't consider it a crime to be mixed up in a murder. And in some cases, the mix-up takes place before the murder even happens. For example, let's take a look into a theatrical office in midtown Manhattan and find out why a popular baritone like Victor Stefano is seeking the advice of his manager, Gilbert Spire. I tell you, I'm going out of my mind, Gilbert. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can't even sing anymore. No, no, calm down a minute. Calm down, he says. How can I be calm when this hangs over my head like a sword? Well, uh, just what is the trouble, Victor? What makes you think your wife is trying to murder you, huh? I told you before. It's the little things. Like her staring at me. Like waking up in the middle of the night and finding her hovering over my bed. I'm afraid to let her out of my sight. But uh, what has she actually done, eh? That's just it. Nothing. Nothing I could put my finger on. If I could only catch her at something, my worries would be over. If I could only fathom what is going on in her mind. Now, look, Victor. You've been working too hard. Too many appearances at the opera. Too many concerts. What has that to do with it? You think I'm imagining all this? Well, if you seriously think your wife is trying to kill you, uh, why don't you go to the police, eh? Because there is nothing to tell them. There is no evidence. That is why I thought of the Norths. They might be able to help me. Mr. and Mrs. North? Why not? They have had experience in murder cases. Perhaps they can prevent one from taking place. But you hardly know them, and they've never met your wife. All the more reason for calling them in. He is a publisher, and I can introduce them to Yvonne without arousing suspicion. Now, wait a minute, Victor. No, uh... no. I can't afford to wait any longer. It may be too late. I'll invite them to my house tonight. All right. All right. If you want to bring in a couple of amateur detectives, go ahead and invite them. But if I were you, I'd get the police. Are you sure this is the right apartment, Jerry? Darling, there's only one Victor Stefano in this building. Although I must say I can understand why he insisted on inviting us over here. I hardly know the man. Well, aren't you going to publish his memoirs or something? I will if he'll write them. But the last time I broached the subject, he... Yes? Oh, uh, good evening. How do you do? I don't believe we've ever had the pleasure of meeting you, Mrs. Stefano. I'm Jerry North. Who? Jerry North. And this is Mrs. North. How do you do, Mrs. Stefano? Uh, how, how do you do? Well... Shall we go in? In where? Inside. I mean, we're Mr. and Mrs. North. Weren't you expecting us? Oh, no. Mr. Stefano didn't say a thing. Oh, now, isn't that just like a man? He invites people over for an evening and then forgets to tell you about it. Jerry does it all the time. Oh, wait. Wait, huh? wait Mrs. North. Oh, wait? Yes, uh, uh, 
I'd rather you wouldn't go in just now. The place is a mess. Can't we make it some other time? Oh, but uh, Mr. Stefano insisted on our coming tonight. Oh, that's strange. He's not home. Well, for Pete's oh. sake. I, I'd ask you to come in, but I'm late for an engagement downtown, and I still have to dress. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Well, we'll just forget about the whole thing. Well, I'm terribly embarrassed. Oh, don't be silly. We don't mind. Come along, Jerry. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Good night, Mr. North. Uh, good night, Mrs. Stefano. Nice to have met you. I don't get it, Pam. I don't get it at all. What, dear? The fact that Mr. Stefano wasn't here? No, the fact that you insisted on coming back home. Oh. And the other night, you'd have tried to make a big mystery out of something like this. Well, it is a mystery in a way. But it seems so personal, I didn't think we had a right to investigate it. Besides, I just know that Mrs. Stefano is innocent. Innocent of what? Anything. Well, I don't know who's responsible for the mix-up, but I had a feeling she was lying to us all the time we were at the door. Uh, that's why I believed in her. She lied so badly. Hmm? Well, isn't it true, Jerry? Bad liars are usually nice people. Sorry, but I don't follow that one. And if I... Uh-oh, there's a telegram on the floor. Oh, who's it from? Wait a second now, and I'll see. Well, here's the answer to the mystery. Please cancel engagement for tonight. Wife has theater date and can't be home. We'll call you tomorrow morning, signed Victor Stefano. Well, I knew it'd be something like that. Only Mr. Stefano should have called up instead of sending us a telegram. Maybe he did while we were out to dinner. After all, I'll get it, dear. Hello. Hi, Bill. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Something on your mind? Well, it isn't exactly a blank. Say, how soon can you and Pam get up to the Lordo Apartments? Lordo Apartments? Why, we were just up there to see Victor Stefano. That's why I'm calling you, Jerry. Victor Stefano is dead. What? He was murdered less than an hour ago. <laughs> What's the story, Bill? How did it happen? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to find out. What are you acting so mysterious about? Is he still there? No, no, the body's been removed. Oh. But he was murdered in this apartment. Oh, Bill, when? Who killed him? Hey, have you got any leads? Oh, uh, Pam. But we have to know, Bill. We were here before, and we... Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I didn't know anybody else was here. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. North, this is Gilbert Spire, Mr. Stefano's manager. Oh, how do you do? How do you yes, do? how do you do? I'm glad you were able to get here, Mr. North. Although I don't understand why you weren't here before. But we were. When? I told you on the phone we were here just before you called up. Are you sure you were in this apartment, Mr. North? Why, of course. Mrs. Stefano answered the door. Oh, she did, did she? Well, what'd she say to you? Well, she acted very peculiar, Bill. She wouldn't let us in. Did she say why? Well, uh, she... So what is this? Why are you cross-examining us? Don't you believe we were here? Of course they weren't, Lieutenant. I told you they were lying. What? I don't know what they're trying to do, but it's a good thing you had me waiting in the other room to hear their story. What story? This lie you're telling about being here talking to Mrs. Stefano. Yes, why are you lying, Mr. North? Who's lying? If you don't think we're telling the truth, just get Mrs. Stefano and we'll prove it. Mrs. Stefano? Are you crazy? I am Mrs. Stefano. Now, wait a minute. If this woman is Mrs. Stefano, who's the one who answered the door for us? That is what I would like to know. How did she get into this apartment? And what was she doing here? Well, it's beginning to look as if she was here to murder your husband, Mrs. Stefano. Oh, now, Bill, uh, don't jump to conclusions. I'm sure that sweet little girl had nothing to do with it. She couldn't have. Why not, Mrs. North? Uh, well, uh, this may sound silly to a man who manages business affairs, but there was something about her, Mr. Spire. Something very soft and, and frightened, like Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, there was, Bill. She had such a, a gentle expression and such big, open eyes. Anything like the ones in this picture, Pam? Oh, what picture? The one I found in this locket. Here, here, take a look. Why, Bill, that's her. Whose locket is this? Well, hers, I imagine. Found it right here in the apartment. Just a minute, Lieutenant. I know who this woman is. Who? Mr. Spider's secretary, Sally Ford. What? 
Well, that's her picture, Gilbert. And if she was in this apartment tonight, she must have killed my husband. Why do you say that, Mrs. Stefano? What do you know about Sally Ford? A great deal more than I want to know. Now, Mrs. Stefano, please. Well, why conceal it, Gilbert? Everybody knows what has been going on. Everybody but me. All I've heard is her name. Well, I wish I had never heard it. She did everything she could to come between Mr. Stefano and me. Oh, it wasn't as bad as all that, Ivan. Wasn't it? Are you going to stand there and deny there wasn't anything between them? Well, it might have been a harmless flirtation, perhaps, but uh, certainly nothing more. Oh, how can you say that, Gilbert? I threatened to leave him if he did not give her up. And this morning he said he was going to. Well, that's how it happened. She came over here tonight and he told her he was through, so she killed him. No, I won't believe it. Just because you found her locket in this apartment... I didn't find it in the apartment, Pam. I found it in Mr. Stefano's hand when I examined the body. Well, that doesn't mean that she killed him. Doesn't it? Now, look at the way this chain's broken. It was torn from her neck during a struggle. Well, Stefano reached out and grabbed this locket in an effort to protect himself. And that's the last thing he ever did. Bill, are you sure you won't reconsider before Miss Ford answers her doorbell? After all, arresting an innocent woman... She's not an innocent woman, Pam. And it won't do any good to tell me about Red Riding Hood. But if you make a false arrest... Pam, will you let the poor man alone? Uh, Yes? Miss Ford? Uh, Yes? Uh, Don't be afraid, Miss Ford. Uh, You remember us, don't you? Oh, no! I I wouldn't try that if I were you. (laughs) Trying to slam the door won't help your case any, Miss Ford. I'm Lieutenant Weigand, homicide. Well... What do you want of me? I want you to come down to headquarters for questioning. I'm taking you in on suspicion of murder. But I didn't kill him. I swear I didn't. He was dead when I got there. Who? How would you know who I was talking about? Well, I knew he was dead. I admit that much. Then you better come with me and admit the rest of it. No, wait. I, I had no reason to kill Mr. Stefano. I was very close to him. Perhaps a little too close. Now get your things, Miss Ford. You're going to be gone for some time. But you're not even listening to me. Won't you give me a chance to explain? Sure. Go ahead. What's your alibi? Well, I haven't got an alibi. Hey, you see, Bill? See what? A good murderess would have one. Who said she was a good murderess? I'm not one at all. Then what were you doing in Mr. Stefano's apartment tonight? How'd you happen to be there just about the time of the murder? He sent for me. I mean, he left a message for me to come there. But he was dead when I opened the door. Is that why you didn't call the police? Well, I, I was so frightened, I didn't know what to do, and then the doorbell rang. Was that and I... us? Yes. I didn't know who you were, and I was afraid you'd think I had something to do with the murder. So I didn't let you in. But you could have told us you weren't Mrs. Stefano. Well, I, I didn't want to get involved with the police. Then you should have picked up this locket before you left the apartment. Where did you get that? I found it in Mr. Stefano's hand. He tore it from your neck just before you killed him. No, somebody put it there. Somebody's trying to frame me. Now, take it easy, Miss Ford. You're in this deep enough already. Hey, what's going on here? Dick, you keep out of this, please. Now, wait a minute. Who are you? Dick Ford. He's my brother. But he doesn't know anything about it. Heck, I don't. You're on the wrong track, copper. Sally didn't murder Mr. Stefano. How do you know? Because I did it. Myself. Dick? you say? I killed him. I did it to get even with him for the way he was treating you. Dick. I know it was a crazy thing to do, but I couldn't help myself. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to beat him up. And what happened? He reached for a gun and I grabbed hold of his arm. We fought for a minute, but he pulled the trigger before I could get the gun out of his hand. Bullet went right through him. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Ford, but you can't protect your sister with a story like that. What do you mean? I killed him in self-defense. Oh, sure, sure. You shot him with his own gun. Only he wasn't shot, Mr. Ford. He was stabbed. It's no use, Pam. Bill's got an airtight case against her, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, I'm not going to let her spend the night in jail just because he arrested her. I just know she's innocent. Well, I don't. That brother of hers looks like a cutthroat that probably runs in the family. Oh, don't be silly, Jerry. She isn't anything like her brother. All right, all right. I'm sorry I mentioned it. Now let's go home and get some sleep. We've been walking all over the city of New York. Oh, but it's so nice out, Jerry. Let's just walk a little while longer. What for? Where are you taking me to? Oh, no place. (laughs) No place, huh? 
Isn't that Mr. Stefano's apartment house on the corner? Hmm? Oh, is it? As if you didn't know. What's the idea of dragging me back here? What are you up to now? Well, so much has been left undone, Jerry. I mean, there's no actual proof that Sally's the one who... What's the matter? Over there at the side entrance of the building. Is that Mrs. Stefano? It is, at that. I wonder what she's doing there. Well, let's ask her. Uh, Mrs. Stefano! Oh, oh, just a minute, Mrs. Stefano. Don't run away. Oh, that's funny. She ducked into that alley as soon as you called her. You think she heard me? Of course she did. Quick, let's follow her. Oh, are you into that dark alley? It probably leads to the basement of the building. Come on, dear. We'll lose her if we don't hurry. Oh. Easy now. She must be around here somewhere. Oh, Jerry. Sort of creepy in here. Nothing but dark walls to look at. Well, don't look at the walls, dear. Look for Mrs. Stefano. She could be lurking behind any one of them. Oh, golly, so sad. I'm sorry I bumped into an ash can. Well, I wish you'd tell me when you're going to do things like that. I, I thought I was dead. Mrs. North. <gasps> Good heavens. It's me, Mrs. North. Mrs. Oh. Stefano. Well, what are you trying to do? Scare the life out of us? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to frighten you. What did you mean to do? Why did you run away from us just now? Well, I got a call to come downstairs. Just now, a man with a mysterious voice called up and told me to meet him here. Just now? Yes. He said he'd kill me if I told anyone about it. So I was afraid to speak to you. Well, where is this man? I don't know. Sounds awfully phony to me. Me too. That that phone call probably was a trick to get you out of the house. Somebody wanted to be in your apartment while you weren't there. What for? I don't know, but we'd better get right upstairs and find out. Anybody inside, Jerry? I don't see anybody. Wait, let's look around. Like there's somebody in the kitchen. Wait, I'll go see. Yeah, this way, Mr. North. The pantry door's right over here. Can you see through the glass? Just about. There's a man in there fiddling around with the refrigerator. What's he doing? Holy mackerel, it's Dick Ford, the girl's brother. Open the door, quick. All right, just let me get my hand on something solid, and I will. Now stand back. There we are, Mr. Ford. Uh, what? There we are, I said, or I'll hit you over the head with this chair. I... I wasn't doing anything. No? What'd you come here for? And why'd you call up Mrs. Stefano and threaten to kill her? Because I... I wanted to search this apartment. Search it for what? Evidence. Somebody's trying to frame my sister. And I've got to prove she didn't do it. Well, that's no excuse for threatening my life. Maybe it isn't. But I'm glad I came here just the same. Look what I found behind the stove, Mr. North. What? The murder weapon. All wrapped up in some newspapers. With a pair of blood-stained gloves. Let me see those gloves. Just a minute, Mrs. Stefano. I'll take those gloves. But they're mine. You bet your life they're yours. They've got your initials on them. Then Mrs. Stefano is the one... Oh, no, I didn't. We'll see about that, Mrs. Stefano. At police headquarters. Yes? Mr. and Mrs. North are here to see you, Lieutenant. Okay, Cinnamon. You want me to go, Lieutenant? Oh, no, no, no. Stay where you are, Mr. Spire. The North will be interested to know what you've been telling me about Mrs. Stefano and uh, her husband's suspicions about her. At least it explains why... Bill, you... I've got to talk to you, Bill. Oh, well, what's all the excitement about, Jerry? We've got the murderer. Oh, really? We have, Bill. She's right outside. You mean she's downstairs in a nice little cell? I've got Miss Sally Ford under lock and key. Oh, well, you'd just better let her out, because she didn't commit the murder. It was Mrs. Stefano. But Mrs. Stefano? That's right, Bill. We've got the murder weapon and the gloves she wore when she used it. Here, look. Hey, what kind of gag is this? No gag. Dick Ford found this package behind the stove in Mrs. Stefano's apartment. Well, he must have planted it there himself, the crazy fool. This isn't the murder weapon. How do you know? Because I've got the murder weapon right here in my desk. I've had it there for some time. Are you sure it's the right one? Well, of course I'm sure. I found it myself, didn't I? Where? How do you know it's the one that killed Mr. Stefano? Oh, I know, all right. Because I found it in Mr. Stefano's body. <laughs> I, 
I just don't understand it, Bill. Well, you would if you'd stop trying to defend the wrong person. You see, Pam, the murder weapon isn't a knife. It's a letter opener with a steel blade five inches long. And now that I've had time to make a few inquiries, I found out who it belongs to. Who? Mr. Spire's secretary, Sally Ford. Isn't that right, Mr. Spire? Now, just a moment, Lieutenant. I never made any such statement. I told you Miss Ford had a letter opener like the one you've got there. But uh, I didn't say that one was hers. Well, it is just the same. Her fingerprints were all over it. But what about the knife and the, and the blood-stained gloves? Yeah, they were just plants, dear. Dick Ford was trying to frame Mrs. Stefano for the sake of her sister. Exactly. Well, I still don't believe that Sally did it. Well, if you need personal proof, I think I can give it to you. You'll see in just a moment. Tom. Yes, sir? Send Miss Sally Ford in here, will you? I'd like to speak to her. Yes, sir? Bill, what are you up to? Well, I uh, I don't usually do things like this, Pam. But just to convince you and Mr. Spire that Sally is guilty, I'm going to confront her with a murder weapon and let you watch her reaction. I don't get it, Bill. What will her reaction prove? Plenty, I think. If she's innocent, she should have no reaction at all. And if she's guilty? If she's guilty, Mr. Spire, this letter opener will make her very uncomfortable. In fact, it might even drive her into a confession. Oh, she won't react to that letter opener at all. Won't she? No, because it isn't hers, and she didn't kill Mr. Stefano. Oh, oh, she's at the door. You wanted to see me, Lieutenant? Uh, Yes, come in, Miss Ford. How do you feel? All right, I guess. You letting me go? Why, no, no. I just wanted to ask a few more questions. About what? About this letter opener, Miss Ford. (gasps) Do you happen to know who it belongs to? Where did you get that? That's my question, Miss Ford. Do you know who it belongs to? Yes, it belongs to me. I thought so. But what's it doing here? How did you get hold of it? I got hold of it when the medical examiner removed it from Mr. Stefano's body. No. Don't say no, Miss Ford. It's the weapon that was used to commit the murder, and you're the one who used it. No, I didn't. I haven't seen that letter opener for over a week. It's been missing from my desk. Can you prove that? Well, I can't actually prove that it was missing, but it was. Don't you see I'm being framed by the one who stole it? I don't see anything of the kind. And if you can't prove what you say, you'll go to the chair for the murder of Victor Stefano. I won't. I won't. I tell you. Bill, she got the letter over. Here, you put that down. Stay where you are. Put it down, I said. My head. Well, that's better. Now, sit down and behave yourself. Well, Pam, are you satisfied? Completely, Bill. Now I know she didn't do it. What? You proved it yourself by what you just did. I don't follow you. Well, it's simple, Bill. When she came at you with that letter opener, what did you do? Reached out for her hand, of course. Well, exactly. And that's what any man would have done, including Mr. Stefano. I still don't follow you. Well, we'll figure it out, Bill. The, your whole case against Sally is based on the fact that her locket was found in the dead man's hand. And according to your theory, Mr. Stefano ripped it from her neck when she came at him with a letter opener. Well, what about it? Well, don't you understand, Bill? When somebody rushes at you with a knife or a, a letter opener, you don't reach for any lockets. You reach for the hand that's about to kill you. Hey, then the locket was planted in Mr. Stefano's hand after he was murdered. Why, of course it was. It was planted there by the real murderer. And the real murderer invited Miss Ford to Stefano's apartment so she could take the blame for it. Then I was framed every step of the way by the only one who could frame you. Who? Oh, don't you know, Mr. Spire? Or were you too busy noticing Miss Ford's reactions to the letter opener? Uh, too busy to notice your own. I beg your pardon? Uh, your little trap worked, Bill. Only it worked on Mr. Spire instead of Miss Ford. He was scared to death she wouldn't react properly. That's a lie. You can't prove anything against me. I had no reason for killing Stefano. He was my best client. And you took him for plenty, Mr. Spire. As his business manager, you were in charge of all his financial affairs, and you could use his money whatever way you please. Don't be a fool. Don't you be one. What I'm saying is the truth. Mr. Stefano suspected you of misusing his money, and he told me so. He told me he was going to to ask you for an exact accounting. And you were afraid to face that accounting. So you killed him and framed your own secretary. Watch him, Bill. Oh, no, you don't. You're not getting out of here just yet, Mr. Spire. You let me go. Not for a long time, Mr. Spire. Until we've had a chance to take your fingerprints and see that they match the ones on the inside of this locket. Come with me, Mr. Spire. You're going to have your picture taken. (laughs) 
Well, Pam, your hunch about Miss Ford was absolutely right. Spires, the guilty man, and his account books furnished the motive. He swindled Stefano out of almost half his property. Uh, well, Pam's hunches are always right, Bill. Oh, not always, dear. Well, almost. You know, I don't know why I bother about clues and things when you're around. I should just blindfold you and let you point to the murder. Oh, I don't think I'd have pointed to Mr. Spire, Bill. Not until you twisted that letter opener out of Sally's hand. Now, now that's another reason I knew she was innocent from the very beginning. What? Her hands. They, they were so soft and attractive. Yes, they were sort of pretty, weren't they? Hmm? Yeah, sort of small and dainty, like a, like a little girl. Oh, is that so? I didn't know that you'd taken in noticing other women's hands, Jerry. Well, I, I didn't really notice them, darling. I, I was just following one of your hunches. The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Yep, door's open. Mr. Diamond. Well, Angelino, come in. I didn't know whether you were busy or not. If you didn't hear the drums, you know I'm not busy. Drums, Mr. Diamond? Well, it's sort of a ritual, Angie. Every time I get a paying client, my landlord offers up his thanks to the goddess of joy. Plays an old bongo and turns on the heat as a kind of sacrifice. I see. Oh, no, no, you don't. You're too normal. What's the trouble, Angelino? The pig's knuckles in your butcher shop got arthritis? <laughs> you always with the kidding, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the kind of a hairpin I am. Hairpin? Uh, Angie, you got something on your mind. Forget my little asides and let's have it. Well, I got the big problem, Mr. Diamond. Oh, you mean something's wrong and you can't pay me to take care of it? Oh, no, no, I can pay. Oh, well, then you haven't got a problem. You slip me the cash and I'll move in on your worries. Well, you see, it's like this. I come to you as a sort of representative for all the other butcher shops, the independent ones. I ain't the only one that's worried. So all the butchers got together last night and decided to do something about it. I, uh, I hate to be uh, a nag, but do something about what? We all been paying money to a protective association. Oh? Yeah, every week a couple of guys come around and collect. If we don't pay, we get our shops busted up. And if that ain't enough, we get our heads busted too. See, I still got three stitches right here on the top of my head. Oh, Nice job. What the doctor use? A loom? I got it this last week when those two guys come for the money. I couldn't pay, so one of them hit me with a blackjack. You're lucky he didn't use one of your salamis. Might have been a job for homicide. He knocked me out when I, when I come to. My shop was a mess. There was a note saying that they'd be back. Well, you better go to the law, Angelino. They'll give you good protection and won't cost you a thing. We discussed that at the meeting. But we decided it was too dangerous. We've been warned that if we go to the police, we'll get hurt bad. We got the families, Mr. Diamond. We can't take the chance. Yeah. Now, uh, tell me, have these two Garniffs been back to see you? Garniffs? Oh, Angie, you're going to be a lot of trouble. Garniffs? Hoods. Hoods? Gangsters. Bad little boys. Oh, no, they ain't been back. Not yet. Well, for you or Rockefeller, my fee's the same, Angelino. One hundred clams uh, of dollars a day in expenses. We took up a collection. I uh, only got a hundred dollars. Oh, why does this always happen to me? I'm going to end up making Simon Legree look like Snow White. You only got a hundred. Huh? Yeah, mm. but we thought of something. If it costs more, you can take it out in trade at any of the butcher shops. Well, it's liable to run into a lot of ham hocks. <laughs> it's the only way we can pay you. So I'll throw a barbecue. Let's go, Angelino. Where do we go? Well, you and the rest of the butchers have not only hired yourselves a private detective, but you've got a new addition in the butcher's union. You mean you... Yeah. Come on. I want you to show me how to carve a lox. Well, that's what happens when your reputation gets around to the butcher shops. 
I'd been buying cold cuts from Giuseppe Angelino for the past two years and telling him what a great detective I was. I should have known he'd never take my word for it, so now I had to prove it. His shop was over on 10th Avenue, so we walked over and went in. He took me around behind the counter and handed me a white apron. I don't get it. Why you want to be a butcher? Well, Angie, you want me to get a line on these two guys who do the collecting, don't you? Sure. Well, I can only think of two ways I could watch them and not look suspicious. Make like a butcher or crawl in with the ground round. Huh? Think what would happen if someone looked down for the price of ground round and caught it staring back at them. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a good one. That's pretty good. Oh, now, come on, <laughs> Angie. It wasn't that funny. Oh, you got my hundred bucks, ain't you? It's a riot. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, come on. Let's... Uh, Show me what happens with this butcher racket. Uh, oh, customer. I'll show you later. Oh, nothing like learning fast. Let me handle the sale. Think you can? Yes, he comes. Uh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Oh, good morning, Mr. Angelino. Business must be good. I see you have a new butcher. Oh, uh, y- yes. Uh, this is a Mr. Uh, Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Hangtooth. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Something I can do for you? Oh. Uh, Yes. How much is the lamb shoulder today? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, which one? What? Look, uh, maybe you better let me take... Uh, relax, Angie. I'll make it. Uh, which shoulder would you like, Mrs. Hennessy? Well, is there any difference, young man? Oh, yes, yes. You see, this lamb is really a ram. A ram? Oh, sure, yeah. Hurt his shoulder playing against the eagles two weeks ago. We're also selling his shoulder pads at 21 cents a pound. Mr. Angelino... Uh, you'll find him hanging in the back with the spare ribs. Now, if you can tell me which shoulder you want, I'll wrap it up and send it off tackle between the liver and the knishes. Well, well, I never... Well, of course you haven't. That's the trouble with you people. Now, here's a nice little ram that played his heart out. Oh, by the way, the heart is a special today, 11 cents a pound. Hmm. Angie. Is she gone? Like laundry in a tornado. What for do you want to do that, Mr. Diamond? She was one of my best customers. I wanted to get her out of here, and I wanted to get her out in a hurry. But why do you have to do it like that? Not a lamb, a ram. Which shoulder do you want, Miss Hennessy? Look, Angie, I'm sorry, but you can explain it to her later. Just as she came in, I spotted two guys heading this way. When they saw her, they backed off. They're standing across the street right now. Where? Right over there, in front of the cigar store. Hey, one of them has got a hatchet. Oh, no, not that one. You're looking at the Indian. Over there. Oh, oh yeah. Hey. That's them. That's the two guys who hit me on the head. They're the ones who come around to do the collecting. Well, they're coming again. You better duck. I'll take care of it. You be careful. They're pretty rough monkeys. Go on, I'll beat it. They're almost here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be in the back. One meatball. I got you under my skin. I got... Well, well, well. Good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Where's Angelino? Oh. Well, uh, he's out buying some old buffalo. I'm the new assistant. Buffalo? Red, shut up. And get your hand out of the pickles. All right, now tell me, new assistant, when will he be back? Well, that's hard to say. These buffalo are in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. Carl, you know, I think this guy's trying to be funny. You win yourself a lamb chop. All you have it, with or without the bloomers. You know something, Red? I think you're right. What's your name, laughing boy? Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Oh, I'm going to have more fun with that. It throws everybody. Well, look, Hangtooth. You know who we are. Uh, how many guesses? You won't even need one. We're in a hurry. We're collectors. Uh, We put all the scraps out in the back in a can. You can't miss it. I don't like you. Well, I have a friend. Maybe we could double date. Look, let's stop the clowning. If Angelina didn't tell you about us, it's going to be too bad for you. We're here for some money. We get it every week. Twenty-five bucks. Yeah. Last week, Angelino didn't have it, so he accidentally hit his head. We figured that all that blood would make him remember it this week. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Angie didn't say anything about it. Tell me, what does he pay you boys for? Oh, little things. Protection, mostly. You see, if he paid us last week, he wouldn't have hit his head. You know something? I know a big, fat cop who would just love to hear all about this protection Angie's paying you for. You do, huh? Yeah, I do, huh? Well, uh, look, seeing as how you're a new boy around here, maybe we ought to tell you first. Why don't you do that? Let's go on the back. I like it here. I listen better. You do, huh? Is that all you guys can say? Now, get out from behind that counter. Oh, I want to explain the thing to you. Yeah, go on, Red. Explain it to Mr. Hangtooth. Hangtooth! You'll have to pardon him. He don't hear so well. How's your hearing, Hangtooth? 
Depends on what I'm listening to. If it's dull, I might end up with an ear trumpet. You might end up with one whether it's dull or not. Now, seeing as how you're working for Angelino, you're going to need protection, too. So let's have the 25 bucks. I want to know what I'm buying. Sure. Here. Oh, now, don't you know it isn't nice to go around breaking up showcases, and especially with that nasty old sap? Well, you never know when things are going to get busted, see? Now, uh, don't you think you need protection, Mr. Hangtooth? Uh, tell you what I'll do. I'll pay you for protection if you'll pay me. Pay you? For what? Well, you never know when things are going to get busted. <laughs> like your jaw, maybe. Who are you? Hey, Carl, help me. Yeah, sure I'll help. This looks like my head breaking day. <laughs> Got his legs. All right, hold him. I'll tap him good. <laughs> Give it to him again. <laughs> oh. Oh, he's a rough one, ain't he? Yeah. Kick me in the mouth, will you? Hey, right. Red. Let me try that, huh? Hang to turn such a pretty color when you kick him like that. He's out. You think he gets the idea? Maybe not right now, but when he wakes up, he's going to have a sore head to remind him. Come on, we'll come back for Angelino later. Well, you can't really blame brave little old me for going to sleep at that point. One, I could have handled, but in that cramped space behind the counter with both of them coming from different directions, I had to give up sooner or later. And I did for about 20 minutes. When I finally snapped out of it, I looked up and saw three heads staring down at me. Two herring with Angelino in the middle. You all right, Mr. Diamond? Oh, Angie, do you always ask people that right after they've lost their blood? Here, let <sighs> me help you get up. Oh, oh swell. <laughs> now, uh, look for my eyes, will you? I didn't know what to do. I guess I should have called the police. Uh, why, Angie, you're really beginning to think for a chain. Oh, let me sit down. Uh, but when I thought about calling the police, I also thought about my family. Those two men might have beat up my family just like this. Yeah, 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 I guess you're right. You take the $100, Mr. Diamond, and forget about this. It's too dangerous. When they come back, I'll pay them the money and nobody gets hurt. Look, uh, look, I can understand why you're scared, Angie. Those, those two headhunters aren't kidding, but... You can't let them get away with it. I can, and I will. I need taking no more chances. First, they bust up my shop, then they bust... No, thanks. I've had enough. Okay. Okay, Angie. Here's the hundred. No, no, that's yours. And then say it's a present. Buy yourself some new glass for the counter. What are you going to do? Well, now I got no obligation, Angelino. Just a sore face and a nasty disposition. I won't get back to normal until I find those two guys and tie their necks in a bow. I left Angelino's shop and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I wanted to look up two sure bets for the police gallery. One named Carl, the other Red. Two guys who went around scaring poor little businessmen like Angelino. By the time I reached the station, the aches from the beating were making me very unhappy, and when I walked into the squad room, I spotted something that didn't make things any better. Yeah, what are you... Holy cow, Diamond. Well, Otis, I'm glad you noticed. It means I put myself together all right. What's the matter with your voice? I got a cold. Sound like you swallowed a rattlesnake. Yeah? Well, what happened to you? Oh, don't be silly. I always bleed just before lunch. Yeah, how'd it happen? It wasn't easy. Is the lieutenant in? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Say, Otis, when are you going to start shaving in the morning? Why? What's wrong? Your five o'clock shadow is four hours fast. Oh... Hello, Walt. Now you listen to me. Wow! You like it? What hit you? Wait till the bruises show up. I come on in Technicolor. Someone sure did a good job. That someone is two guys. One named Red and the other Carl. Red and Carl. Yeah. I got closest to Red. Name matches the hair, busted nose, about 190, and very nasty with a sap. And Carl? Dark greasy. Well-dressed if you like the type. Big boy with a scar under his uh, right eye. Uh, you sure pick him. You know them? Yeah, I think so. Uh, here. Here's one of them. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, you are so right. This is sweet little Carl, all right. Carl Tate, sort of a new boy, import from Chicago. Uh, here's the other one. Yeah? Yeah, that's Red. Uh, they work together, a couple of muscle men. Mm, Red Dillon. <laughs> Arrests all over the place. One conviction... 
Salt with a deadly weapon. What they go after you for? Oh, they've been pulling a protection racket on some of the independent butcher shops. Who do they work for? They used to work for Jack Arnold before he got sent up. Well, I know they're not working this setup alone. It's too big. No, they wouldn't be. Hey, Tiny Easter's in town. Tiny Easter? Oh, used to be Arno's right-hand boy. That's right. Came in about a month ago. I'd love to get something on him. Nobody has ever been able to nail him. Well, it adds up. He used to work for Arno, so did Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Now, if we can't pick him up just because two of his boys worked you over, I just say they weren't his boys. I don't want him picked up. I want Carl and Red. If Easter goes along with the deal, you can have him. What are you going to do? Get cleaned up and pay Mr. Tiny Easter a visit. What's his address? Well, he's got an office on East 48th Street, uh, 804. Thanks, Walt. Uh, Tiny's a bad boy. Well, I'll take along my 38 just in case I have to spank him. Bye. When I left Walt and went back to my office, took a clean shirt out of the closet and washed up. I locked up again, went down to the street, grabbed a cab. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the reception room of Tiny Easter's office. A big guy with a bulge under his arm was trying to be as unreceptive as possible. So you want to see Easter? You got an appointment? No, I haven't got an appointment. Now tell Easter I'm out here. What's your name? You're going to get hung up on this. What do you mean? The name's Hangtooth. Huh? Yeah, you see? Now make like an office boy and tell Easter I got a message for him from Carl and Red. You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? Yeah, and I'm going to spoil if I have to stand around much longer. You can spoil rotten for all I care. You ain't going to see Easter. He's busy. Okay. You know, you get so excited, you'll ruin your stomach someday. I don't think so. You don't, huh? Oh. Skeptic. What are you, Wong? I'm collecting scalps. Well, good for you. How'd you get by Lefty? He's tied up with a stomach ache. Swallowed a fist. All right, so you got muscles. Also, you got a pushed-in face. Lefty do that? Carl Tate and his blood brother, Red. Oh? What'd you come to me for? They're working for you, aren't they? You smell like a cop. Name's Hangtooth. I doubt it. Good for you. I'd hate to go through that again. I'm a private cop. Why not good for you? I was in a butcher shop when your two boys wandered in and started playing squash with me. I don't like to get pushed around Easter. And I don't like your racket. I want Carl and Red. And if I get you along with them, the state will hang a medal on me. <laughs> Looks like you kind of got nothing to lose. Look at it any way you like. Now, what about your two playmates? Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Seamus. I never heard of those two guys. I don't think you understand, Tiny. I'm pretty mad. I'm going to find these two guys, and I'm going to do it even if I have to be unpleasant with you. Why, Mr. Hangtooth, what do you mean by unpleasant? You break a leg, that's unpleasant. Oh? Well, uh, I got something in this drawer might change your mind. Yeah? Oh, oh my hand. Okay, a busted hand. Unpleasant enough? <laughs> Take your foot away. You're breaking it in two. Drop the gun in the drawer. Okay. Harry. Now, uh... Let me explain it again. If you go out and shoot 12 people tomorrow, I'm going to be sore about it. But when you start intimidating a bunch of hard-working little guys and their families, I go off like a skyrocket. Then when a couple of your cheap gunsels push me around, I explode. Look, friend, I tell you, I don't know these guys. <laughs> Look, Easter, please believe me. I don't know. You worked with them in Chicago. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, Easter. I'll work you over like an eggplant in a subway. Look, whatever your name is, I got boys. They'll take care of you. Who's going to tell them to do it? I am. With your mouth swollen shut? <laughs> now, where do I find Carl and Red? <laughs> Golly, you knocked one of my teeth loose. Then I got 31 to go. I guess you really don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, friend, I understand. Ah. Now, now, where are they? You still need some encouragement? No, no. No, that's all right. They're in a warehouse. By the 14th Street docks. What warehouse? Rogers and Sons. Big sign on the top. Mind if I use your phone? Yeah, go ahead, by all means. Don't you know it's not polite to listen, Easter? 
Well, what do you want me to do? Go to sleep. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, Rick. I'm up at Easter's. He let you use the phone? Yeah, he's asleep. I'm going down to Roger's warehouse near the 14th Street docks. Carl and Red are down there. May need some help. I'll be right down. You better hop down here to Easter's and pick him up first. On what charge? I'll give you a charge after I see Red and Carl. Now step on it. But, 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 but... Contact. I left Easter's office looking like a second-class rest home and headed for the warehouse on 14th Street. It was getting late in the afternoon when my cab pulled up near the river and I got out. The cold breeze was kicking up little patches of white on the water and a light fog was moving in from the Atlantic as I started toward a big building with a sign on the top that read, Rogers and Sons, importing. The place was boarded up, but a window in the basement showed signs of recent use, so I jimmied it open and dropped down on the dark, cold pavement. I held my breath and listened. There was a radio playing from somewhere in the front of the building, so I started moving toward it. I went up a flight of stairs and onto the first floor. The radio was louder now, and I could make out an office door with a small light shining under the crack at the bottom. I moved up close and listened. Hey, Carl. Yeah? Shut off the radio. Okay. What do we have to hide out in here for? Because Easter said to. Besides, we don't know who that guy was we worked over this morning. He might have been a cop. So he was a cop. We were cops over before. Look, Easter said we should stay undercover for a few days, so we stay undercover. Why not deal the cards? Oh. Off that top. Get it? That's probably Easter. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What? He did, huh? Hey, what's the matter? Boss! What's going on? I don't know. That was Easter. The guy we worked over was in his office, pushed him around, and now that guy's headed down here. Uh, we can handle him. Sure, but something's wrong. Just as Easter was going to say what to do, it sounded like he got into a fight. I had some guy tell him to drop the phone. Hey, the cops. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah. Good afternoon, boys. Hangtooth. Hangtooth. Come back here, Carl. Uh, help me. You shouldn't have pulled a gun, Red. Since when do you butchers carry rods? Since we get pushed around by guys like you. I'm going to go get your friend. You can't leave me. I'm shot bad. I can't take it back. The law will be here in a minute. You're a lousy butcher. I hope Carl pays you good. I'll see he gets a chance to try. I left Red lying on his face and ran toward the front of the building. The only way out was that window in the back, and Carl was sure to be hiding somewhere in the dark, hoping to get around me and head for the basement. There were a dozen places to hide in that warehouse, but I had one advantage. He couldn't see me any better than I could see him. I backed up against the wall. Come on, Carl. Red's hurt pretty bad, and the law's on the way. You've got to get me to get out of here. He was behind a pile of packing cases and had a big gun just to make things suffer. I eased along the wall, trying to get behind him when I suddenly bumped into something. I turned around and felt to see what it was. A ladder, straight up to the steel beams overhead. I put my gun under my arm and started up the rungs. It was tough climbing like that, trying not to make a sound and knowing all the time if he spotted me, I was an easy target. About halfway up, I stopped, held on with one hand, took off my shoe with the other. The idea was to drop the shoe draw his fire and nail him before he found out where I was. I dropped the shoe. Come on, Otis. Okay. Okay, only take it easy. I can't see nothing. Look then. Can't say nothing either. Shut up your sound off. Oh. oh. Rick. Rick. Walt. I hear him, Lieutenant. Rick. Huh? Here's some guy that's been shot. Now, Diamond's been around here, all right. Rick. Here, Walt. Up here. What? Where the devil are you? 
Up here on this ladder. There he is, Lieutenant. See, where my flash is. <laughs> what are you doing up there? I had to get Carl Tate. He's over there behind those crates. Now get me down. Well, why don't you climb down? Whoa! Not in front of Otis. Oh, I forgot. Otis, go outside and call the fire department. Fire department? Yes, and tell them to bring a net. What? Will you get a move on? Oh, okay. Rick. Yeah? <laughs> now you stop that! Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's so seldom that I ever get a good laugh at your expense. Okay. But you know this is a serious thing with me. How far up am I? I'd say about 40 feet. Oh. Now, now, take it easy. Just don't look down. Walt. Yeah? Promise me something? I won't tell Otis. I'll say you got stuck up there. Thanks. <laughs> what did you go up there for, anyway? I told you. I had to get Carl Tate. <laughs> I just didn't think until I was up. Imagine the guy who shoots it out with two of the toughest torpedoes in town having a horrible fear of heights. Boy, if that isn't one for the books. You know... I'll never forget the time that that little blonde trapeze artist got stuck. What? Yeah? I hate you. Rick. Hmm? How's your face? Fine. How's yours? Now you stop that. Oh, nice and soft. Rick. What's the matter? I'm just nuzzling a little. You're just nuzzling a lot. You want to nuzzle? You got to sing. Oh, no. No nuzzling. Oh, yeah. No sing, no nuzzle. Fiend. Piker. Just a real nuzzle. I think you're after my earrings. No. If I sing? Yes. I was ready. I was listening. I will remember you In the silent and lonely night And the memory of your smile Will bring me back the light I will remember you When the leaves lie upon the ground With the memory of a kiss A kiss in summer found When the winds of winter come crying through the darkness Your lovely voice will come to me Even though in spirit across the miles that part us Crying I love you I will remember you Till the spring of another year Till I hold you close again I will remember Wait a minute. Oh, now what? I just remembered. I got a surprise for you. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Got a new television set. Now you can watch the fights. Well, uh, great, great. Where is it? In the den. But first you've got to do one thing for me. What's that? Well, the reception isn't very good yet. I called the repairman, but he said to check the aerial. He can't come over until tomorrow. I'll fix it. Where is it? On the roof. The roof? But be careful. You've got to climb a ladder to get to it. What's the matter? Look, uh, Helen, wouldn't you rather... Fix the aerial first. First? First. Oh. Whom are you calling? Hello, operator. Give me the fire department.
have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Nestor Piler, Paul Fries, and David Ellis. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <coughs> now, this is Eddie King with an important reminder. Richard Diamond will next be heard on Sundays, one week from tomorrow. Remember, Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, will next be heard on Sundays, beginning January 15th. Consult your local paper for time of broadcast. What's on NBC tomorrow? The hilarious Phil Harris Alice Fay Show. And for mystery, Sam Spade, directly following Phil and Alice. Next, Hollywood Star Theater with Dorothy L'Amour on NBC. By transcription. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, where have you been? I've uh, been tasting the bitter with the sweet at Miss Wigginson's school for girls. Sort of a uh, special course in homicidal apiculture. Apiculture? Mm Mm-hmm. There were apes involved? Effie, where is your Latin? Apis, apianus, of or pertaining to bees. Oh, bees, of course. It was a bee caper? It was a beekeeper caper. Oh, that's funny, Sam. That's a honey. Effie, put these words down in your little book. Honey, sweetness, hives, combs, etc. Never mention them again. What? Keep things humming, sweetheart, and I'll be right down to drone my way through my report on the queen bee caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, during the summer, when you spend so much of your time out of doors, it's important to pay special attention to the care of your hair. To keep it right in place, to help keep it from getting dry, use America's favorite hair tonic, Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Use it every day. If you've never tried it, ask for it in the 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle, and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. To be or not to be, hum. Tricks. Oh, Effie, really, this jargon, this patois. Don't you think it's about time we spoke like educated people? You know best, Sam. Every time I visit one of our institutions of learning, I find out something I didn't know. Oh, Sam, that's incredulous. Well, you just know everything. Yeah, I guess I do when you come right down to it. The bee, for instance. Bees are a genus of insects of the Hymenopterus order. The what? Hymenopterus. Living in society is composed of one queen, or perfect female, a few males, or drones, and an indefinite number of undeveloped females, or neuters, which are the workers. That's me, I suppose. A neuter. Well, that's for you to say. Of course. And you know what else about the bee? What, Sam? Confidentially, it stings. (coughs) Date, uh, July 10th, 1949... To Miss Elizabeth Cowley, Miss Wigginson School for Girls, Seacliff Drive, San Francisco. I wonder about girls sometimes. And that's bad, Effie. Bad. Oh. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Queen Bee Caper, dear Miss Cowley. I uh, was singing a medley of sorority drinking songs as I opened the wrought iron gate 
walked up the garden path, past those cast iron deer, and presented myself at the big brass bell pull beside that massive panel door that stands guard between the outside world and your sheltered inmates. A little housemaid wearing Timothy let me in and led me to your office. I sat on your chintz-covered sofa and looked at your drapes with their thriving beehive motif and waited for you with my back half-turned to the open door. <clears throat> yeah, hello, how are you? Cowley? No, I'm not Miss Cowley. Oh, no, of course not. No, I was just hoping. You're Mr. Spade, aren't you? Laurie Thomas. I'm Miss Cowley's assistant. A nice day. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't bother to move. I'll lean over you. Mm-hmm. Put this report on her desk. Mm, sure. Miss Cowley will be here in just a minute. Oh, thanks. It's so warm in here. Next time, wear a mailman's uniform and a 50-year-old stoop. You'll find the temperature is exactly right. Yeah. I mean, yes, ma'am. See that you do, then. Oh, Glory. There seems to have been a misplacement of some of the hockey. Would you check on it, please? Oh, surely. Nice to meet you, Mr. Spade. <clears throat> I'm Elizabeth Cowley. You may sit down. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Spade, I'll be painfully frank with you. A thief is at large in my school. Oh? Well, uh... You probably have a good answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Why not call in the police? I have a good answer, Mr. Spade. My girls come from San Francisco's finest and wealthiest families. Mm-hmm. Miss Wigginson's has had an untarnished reputation for more than three generations. I'm sure. As headmistress, I must handle this matter with the utmost discretion. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I already know the thief. Are there any questions? Well, uh, only one timid one. Who is it? I regret to say a faculty member is to blame. Glory Thomas. She was in here a minute or two ago. Oh, really? Well, uh, why, Miss Thomas, you find any of the loot stashed away in her room? Well, no. Uh, No, not exactly. I haven't recovered any of the stolen articles, but I'm sure Gloria's responsible. I'm certain she's the thief. You're just sure? I I thought perhaps you might establish definite proof against Gloria. You mean you, you want me to frame her? Oh, no, Mr. Spade. I... You misunderstand me. I don't think so, Miss Colley. Oh, dear. I I was afraid this would happen. I told Ursula. But then I... All right, I'll ask. Who's Ursula? Mr. Spade, I... I think I can trust you. It was Ursula who instructed me to call you. Ursula Cavanaugh. You know the name. The Ursula Cavanaugh inherited all the real estate, lives in Cavanaugh Towers penthouse, hasn't set foot out of there in 20 years? Yes. Mrs. Cavanaugh is our school's benefactress. She is, of course, on the board of trustees. She is, moreover, a dear personal friend. Oh, I see. Oh, yes. We were classmates together here many years ago. Ursula's quite unlike myself. Married well, though a widow now. Rather aggressive. Frankly, she wishes to have Glory Thomas discharged. But her connection with the dismissal must not be known. Now, I don't suppose I can ask you to take the assignment now. I'm a detective, Miss Cowley, not a frame-up artist. I had to have my name called up in the lobby, and then two elevator trips later, I faced her on her penthouse terrace. Ursula Cavanaugh looked like a 1910 stock company lead out of Charlie's Aunt, smoking a black Italian stogie and gripping a cane like a shillelagh. Two men were on the receiving end of her black snake whip of a tongue. A youngish guy, stockbroker type, and an individual in a morning coat who looked practically nude without a butterfly net. Oh, you're a fool and an nincompoop, Jelinek. I lost all patience with you ages ago. Not only are you incompetent, but you're also dishonest. Don't mind telling you that when the board of directors meets on Thursday, I intend to instruct well, uh, them really, to have... Miss Cavanaugh, I, I've tried not to uh, discommode you in any way. Uh, I endeavor in every detail to fulfill my responsibilities as manager of this... Don't hotel. interrupt me. Ah, uh, Auntie... <laughs> I think you've got Jelinek and me all wrong. Now, the truth the is... The truth is, we... Gerald, you're both a pair of thieving scoundrels. Now, get out, Jelinek, before your weasel face ruins my digestion. Very well, madam. I remain at your service. Ah, no backbone, no stunk. 
And as for you, my dear nephew... Uh, I think I'll toddle along, Addie. I ought to get back to the office. Control your little impulses, Gerald. I admire a little larceny in any man, but not at my expense. I was beginning to think I'd become invisible in that rarefied penthouse atmosphere. She hadn't even blinked at me while Jellinek slunk back to the lobby and Gerald toddled along to his office. The terrace was a riot of bloom. I don't know much about flowers, but she must have had them all there. Off to one side, a little man in a blue smock putted around a wooden structure on a stand. I'd become aware of bees humming amidst the flowers when she finally spoke to me. You're Tom Spade, aren't you? Sam, ma'am, the fun-loving Spade. Picked your photograph out of the other detectives. Looked like you got spunk. Why'd you come here? Curiosity. I met Glory Thomas out at Miss Wigginson's. I liked her. I wanted to see the type that would strong arm her out of a job from a safe distance. Spunky. Come over here, Mr. Spade. I want to show you something. Take it. Yes, ma'am. That'll do for now. Work at the other end of the garden for the time being. Yes, ma'am. Oh, pig is my gardener and beekeeper. Most taciturn individual. You know what this is? Well, I didn't, but now I can see it's a beehive. Yes, my own beehive. Fresh honey from a tea and fruit cake every afternoon. Fine old tradition. Observe this hive, young man. Honeybees are the most intelligent of all insects, surpassing even the ants. And why? <laughs> because one female controls a community of many, many thousands. I am against it. Yes, Mr. Spade. The queen bee reigns supreme. The males are drones. Quite useless. The female workers perform all necessary labor. No waste motion. No dissension. Well, some of my best friends are drones, and I just can't I stand them. I think you understand me, Mr. Spade. I wish Gloria Thomas removed from San Francisco for an excellent reason. My nephew, Gerald Long, the young man who just left here, has developed absurd romantic notions about her. Yeah, so you want the romance busted up. But if you try to break it up openly, your nephew might get stubborn and even marry her. On the other hand, by framing her as a thief, you ward off the affair until you can figure out some other dirty trick. I knew you'd understand me, Mr. Spade. I admire bluntness in moderation. Well, what do you say to joining forces with me? Just one thing, Mrs. Cavanaugh. Nuts. <laughs> Next morning, I put through a call to Nickinson School for Girls. It had been my intent to talk to you, Miss Collie, to tell you I'd left my hat in your office, but somehow I found myself talking to Glory Thomas. And somehow our talk resulted in a cocktail date at the 10 o'clock scholar bar and lounge. I shouldn't have come, of course. Oh, uh, exam papers to grade, no doubt? Stacks and stacks. Hmm, soft, velvet-type hands. Well, what's this on them? Stain. I teach our girls chemistry, among other things. Mm-hmm. How about me taking on a night school class for the other things? You're crazy. You don't need any education. Well, I can always use a postgraduate course. <laughs> You're really crazy, Sam. I needed this. We'll make a night of it. Maybe. Gerald won't object, huh? What's that mean? Who have you been talking to? That hateful old woman? Mrs. Cavanaugh wants to put the boots to you, Glory. She called me in to frame you. I could kill her. Oh, easy now, Gloria. Don't talk to me. I thought I could take it. I thought I could be patient and wait while Jerry ironed everything out. But not now, though. I hate that selfish, domineering old woman. I hate her nephew, and I hate you. Well, that'll do to start with, honey. Now, let's get down my list. I hate... Oh, the... let me go. I've had all I can take for one night. Wait a minute, Glory. I was... Hey, you forgot your bag. Hey! She disappeared around the corner as I came out into the street. It was starting to rain. As I stepped off the curb, I slipped and turned my ankle. As I limped onto Montgomery Street, I saw her disappearing into one of the tall buildings on my side of the street. It could have been the Cavanaugh Towers. I stepped and a half into the lobby thereof a few minutes later. As I came in, Jelinek, the manager, was getting off the elevator. He swatted himself several times in the neck and then went into a door marked private. No trace of glory in the lobby. I looked in the bar. She wasn't there, but Albert Piggott, the beekeeper, was having a stinger. Oop. Now I'm beginning to feel good. I feel... Hey, who's this? I know that. Why, it's Mr. Spade. Sit down, Mr. Spade. I don't have Spade. time just now, Mr. Piggott. Tell well, me... Sit down, you... sit down, oh, sit down. Oh, oh, easy, easy. I'm, easy. I'm fired, have you heard? I'm fired. Just a worker, out of work. Turned out by the Queen Bee. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Piggott. I imagine Mrs. Cavanaugh wasn't too easy to work for. I told her to keep away from the bees when I wasn't there. Well, 
She's gone and disobeyed me. One of the workers must have stung her. She's got a temper, you know. Ooh, my. Must have smashed the eye with her stick. Bees were all over. And then she fired me. When was this and why did she fire you? Oh, about, oh, just now, maybe half an hour ago. I knocked and then there wasn't any answer and then I let myself in. It was all dark. I couldn't even see her. Heard the bees, of course, but couldn't. <laughs> Who was I? And I said, Mrs. Cavanaugh, you you disobeyed me. And in this voice, this awful voice, she said, Mr. Pickett, you're fired. Get out. This awful voice in the dark. And Mr. Mr. Pickett, mind you, never before, just Pickett this and Pickett that. And they, hey, where are you going? Hey! I didn't bother to stop at the desk to get myself announced. I took the passenger elevator and then operated the penthouse elevator myself. No hands. Nobody answered my ring. The door was unlocked. I went inside. Crossed through the empty apartment to the terrace. The rain had just stopped and the sunset cut a sudden shaft. First I heard it. The humming of swarming bees. Then I saw the overturned beehive. Then I saw Ursula Cavanaugh sprawled back in her chair, a stick and Italian stogie on the floor, while the bees clustered greedily over the food cake and honey set out on the table. I wondered if those most intelligent of all insects had the answer to Shakespeare's question, Oh, death, where is thy sting? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again... The choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Queen Bee Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Sam Spade. Oh, oh, yes. You shouldn't have gone to see Mrs. Cavanaugh. I didn't make any promises, ma'am. Ursula was quite upset by your visit. Called me after you left her. Quite angry about it, Mr. Spade. Oh? She wanted to see me today. Our weekly half-day holiday, you know. But I simply couldn't face her. I'm sorry if I sound I finally managed to doze off after everyone left for the afternoon. Have you called before? No, this is the first time. I'm at Mrs. Cavanaugh's place right now. Indeed. Does Ursula wish to talk to me? She can't. I beg your pardon? It might be a good idea if you'd come over here, Miss Colley. Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. What was that? Mrs. Cavanaugh's dead. And since you're her oldest and closest friend... Yes, Mrs. Spade. I'll come immediately. <laughs> Well, you came on over, Miss Colley, but meanwhile, nephew Gerald Long arrived, also Piggott, whom I called down at the bar and who sobered up with remarkable rapidity on hearing the news. Gerald was shaken up by his great aunt's demise. We waited for the family doctor to arrive and watched Piggott entice the bees back into the hive. 
You turned up soon after and tried to soothe Gerald's nerves. The hotel manager, Jelinek, also flooded in. The doctor diagnosed cause of death a shock from formic acid. The secretion bees inject into the bloodstream with their stingers. We all stood around thinking our various thoughts as the doc voiced this verdict. Piggott was the one who voiced an epitaph. She really knew nothing about bees, you know. The queen bee was all important, she thought. But there's always a rebel in every hive. The queen bee is always to pose sooner or later. The worker bees go on and on. But the queen bee can't reign forever. After that, we all left and went our various ways. Poor old Piggott shouldn't have said that. And he must have been a lot drunker than he seemed. Because he was found next morning in his garden in Marin County beside his overturned beehive, a victim like his late employer of fatal bee stings. Well, Nick, you're a fool if you think you'll get away with this. Don't threaten me, Mr. Long. I've been bullied long enough. I don't intend to lose my position here now Mrs. Kavanaugh's gone. I've taken all I could stand from her, and I don't intend to let you walk all over me. I'll do whatever I think needs to be done, Jelinek. Well, if you're trying to insinuate I that I have I can cause you as much trouble as you cause me. Maybe more. With what I found out about you now, Get out I... Get here. Go on, beat it before I break... How did you get in here, Spade? The door was open. Well, if you're here to collect any kind of bill, I want to know what services you rendered. Nothing's rendered yet. But I figured you might like to know that Aunt Ursula was murdered. Murdered? Uh, you, 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 you can't say that. Not my whole Shut up, Jelinek. You need proof to back that up, Spade. I've got it. Piggott. What? Piggott's dead. How do you know? His doctor just called me. Yeah. Well, that's why I know your aunt was murdered. I've just been out to Marin. I had quite a session with that doctor. Well, where's your proof, man? Who'd want to kill her? Well, uh, oh, stop it. Practically everybody who knew her. Uh, really, now, I, I must protest this disrespect to the Shut members up. of the... Shut uh... Go on, Spade. Go on. Start getting specific. Well, specifically, Piggott's doctor, because of what I suggested, examined the dead man again, found the mark of a hypodermic, plus the fact that a concentrated solution of formic acid killed Piggott. Piggott's next-door neighbor said he'd been stung as often as 10 and 12 times a day. That meant he'd built up a certain immunization to bee stings. Are you suggesting that someone murdered him with an injection of uh, commercial formic acid? I thought I'd made that fairly clear. And what would the motive be? To keep him from talking about his employer's murder. I see. Well, is that all? Yeah, except that his neighbor told me somebody answering your description called on him this afternoon. Mike. My... Oh. Well, yes, but uh, Spade, look here. I can explain Allow that. Allow me. I... Hello. Gerald, hello, darling. I'll be through in about an hour. I just got to check supplies in the chem lab, and then I'll be home and show you what a cook I am. You better be brave. I'm up. sorry. Just a second. Here's Gerald. For you, Gerald. Your wife. Hold on a second, honey. Uh, Spade, look here. Now, you, you can't drag her into this thing. When did you get married? She... Yesterday afternoon. Husband and wife. No testifying, huh? <laughs> well, I don't think I'll need your testimony. Jelinek's face fell four inches into his ascot tie as he heard himself lose exclusive hush money rights to the above information. Pausing only to enjoy a hearty laugh at his discomfiture, I went on to my next and final port of call, Miss Wigginson's School for Girls. This time, there was no girlish tittering as I entered Miss Collie. No dewy young Amazons clutching hockey sticks in their grubby little hands. For a very good reason, as you told me. My girls are dismissed for the day, Mr. Spade. Because of poor Ursula, of course. Really disrupts our routine. First our weekly half-day holiday yesterday, and now today... Yeah, I'd like to talk to Miss Thomas in the uh, chemistry lab she is, I think. Very well. I'll take you to her. She knows nothing of our first meeting. I've talked to her. Oh, well, in here. Yes? Oh, what do you want? Thought we might talk. There's nothing to talk about. Well, we could talk about this hypodermic needle. Put that down. I'm using it for an experiment. Or uh, how about a formula, HCOOH or CH202? What? That's formic acid. Mm Mm-hmm. Miss Collie, you said yesterday was a half-day holiday. Did Miss Thomas stay here in school? Why, no. She rarely does on Wednesday afternoon. That's why Mrs. Cavanaugh had a visitor, didn't she, Glory? Did she? After you ran away from me. All right. 
I did go up to see her. I, I was so mad about, about what you told me. I intended to hand in my resignation and give her a piece of my mind, and I... I but she was dead when I got there. Oh, glory. No. And, and I... I just got panic-stricken and ran. Yeah, murder's a pretty scary thing. Murder? What do you mean, Mr. Spade? Mrs. Cavanaugh died from a hypodose of formic acid. Somebody familiar with chemistry would use that method. Then... Then that could mean... Mm -hmm. The acid could be made up in this lab. The hypodermic could be this one here. I didn't kill her. I didn't. You say you were scared. You were so scared you ran all the way to City Hall and married her nephew. So you found out. Uh, Jellyneck found out first. He intended to squeal the old lady, but she was dead when he got back. He knew her will disinherited Gerald if he married without her auntie's approval while she was still alive. We married after she was dead. But, but that didn't matter. After I saw you, I told Jerry if he was any sort of man, he'd marry me will or no will. He did. And yet this morning, he drove over to Marin County to see old Piggott. You think he was trying to shield me? I tell you, she was dead when I got into that room... I don't know anything about Piggott. One moment. I believe I recall that Mr. Piggott said Ursula spoke to him when she uh, discharged him. Glory, you must be mistaken about the time you entered that room. She couldn't have already been dead because... Yes, uh, she could have and was. The killer was almost caught by Piggott. She hid behind the curtain in the dark and spoke to him. Miss Cavanaugh was already dead, but... Uh... I see. Mr. Piggott thought it was Ursula's voice, but it was yours, Glory. No, it was yours, Miss Collie. What? You committed both murders. You had access to the murder weapon. You had the half-day holiday to do it in. Mr. Spade. Even at that moment, the finishing school schoolmarm had to say, Mr. Piggott. Well, I'm not sorry for it. Ursula misused her power shamefully. And now the queen bees deposed again. Oh, you're brighter than most men, Mr. Spade. You, too, understood the significance of Mr. Piggott's remarks last night. Yeah, I could have been a little brighter a little sooner. You helped give yourself away when you asked me if I'd called you earlier yesterday afternoon. Oh, but why, Sam? How could she? Well, Kavanaugh bullied her since childhood. Then you came on the staff and your ability scared her. Oh. The queen bee being deposed and whatnot. When Kavanaugh wanted you framed, she saw a chance to get rid of both of you. She hoped her murder would look like an accident, but if it was recognized as murder, you'd be the logical suspect. Oh, you're much too clever, Mr. Spade. Let's get it over with. Yeah, let's. It's up to those drones at Homicide from here on in. Hurry and enter report. Sam. Yes, Evie? How come Gerald went out to see Mr. Piggott? Well, Gerald didn't care about the will, but he didn't want to boot a fortune out the window either. Glory hadn't told him she'd seen his aunt, so he called on Piggott to find out when Piggott last saw Auntie alive. Go type that up. I am completely well, and when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, Sam. And now, listen to this. Shopping notes. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Passport for Vivi. Her name was Vivi. I don't know what the rest of it was or where she came from. Probably a mixture of all the forgotten places from the Danube to the Nile. She wore too much makeup. Her clothes wouldn't have drawn a second look in a fire sale. And her collarbones kept reminding you she was even skinnier than the dames in the fashion magazines from back home. But there was something about her. Chris, my bartender, called her the Sphinx because she had wide Egyptian eyes and because she always seemed to smile no matter who threw sand in her face. I had a different idea. I figured out a long time later, Vivi knew what she wanted, that's all. And it was good.
Well, like a lot of the girls, Phoebe drifted into the place several times before I realized I'd been noticing her. It took an American to make me do that. It was on one of those sweaty nights when the flies are bad, you know, a sandstorm is coming. A big Armenian was playing chess with a Turkish soldier over in one corner. The American was draped on the bar, pawing for a rail that wasn't there. My name's Jeb Waters, salesman from Kansas City, Kansas, not Missouri. Ah, hi. Mine's Jordan. I run this cafe. Oil field supply, pal. I'm an oil field supply. It's a great little line these days, oil. Well, we all sell something. Uh, you know, this is my first trip to Cairo, flying. You know, a great way to travel, pal, flying. How about another bourbon? <laughs> Sure, sure. Expense accounts as big as his stomach. You see what I mean, pal? You get me, pal? Get you, pal. <sighs> say, Jordan, like I say, it's my first trip to Cairo, see? And I've been tending pretty strictly to business since I got here last week. Well, that's a way to stay out of trouble. Yeah, well, what I mean is after this, I head for the Persian Gulf. Kind of a lonesome place, the Persian Gulf, you see what I mean, boy? You're talking to the wrong guy. I lost a date book. Oh, now, don't get me wrong. I, I just thought, well, I haven't had much time for sightseeing, and there's supposed to be some pretty good night spots around here. If somebody could... Who is she? Huh? That one. That one coming in. Oh, I forget her name. Boy, <laughs> makes you feel like Humphrey Bogart, don't it? Here, take the bottle. Hello, Rocky. Hello, Vivi. Uh, forgot her. Uh, relax, Kansas. You have seen him? You have seen him, Rocky? No, he hasn't been in, kid. Him? Who's him? Say, what's this all She's about? She's looking for somebody, that's all. Victor, his name is Victor. He was to meet me here two days ago. Perhaps you have seen him, monsieur? Oh, sure, sure, honey. I know lots of Victor. Her maître and seaman, monsieur. What's she doing, kidding me? She told you she's looking for the guy. Stood her up, I guess. Uh, sorry, kid. I will find him. Yeah, try again later, Miss. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's the matter with me? Nothing's the matter with me. Excuse me, you. Come on, sister, come on. I mean it. What's a punk seaman got that I have? Hey, 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 hey. Now you're nobody. She to said let go. Family. Stay out of this, Jordan. Sure. Yep. Hitting me wasn't so smart, Jordan. See, you spilled the bottle, too. It's all right. You're not drinking anymore. You bet I'm not. Not in a joint like this. Back in Kansas, I wouldn't be found dead in a joint like this. I'm sorry, Rocky. So am I. People like him, they happen so often. Yeah, they pay their bills. I'm sorry about that, too. Oh, stop being sorry for everything. Just just go someplace else. When I find Victor, he will loan me the piastres I wish. Look, why don't you wise up? You were ditched by a sailor, that's all. Okay, go home and forget it. For whose sake should I do that, Rocky? For your own. What do you think I meant? I, I don't think anything. Like... All right, all right. It's the weather, I guess. Besides, I will find him soon. Sure, sure. Go look someplace. Good night, Rocky. Ah, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Had anything to eat tonight? I'm not hungry, Rocky. Uh, sit down at a table someplace and get your bowl of soup. Well, that was Vivi. Not much, but something. I picked up the bourbon bottle and headed for the kitchen, wondering if I couldn't make more money as a camel driver. I just tripped the heat on under the soup when I heard it. A rock had been pegged through the front glass window. I figured the salesman from Kansas City, Kansas, was trying to get even with a few convention tricks. That made me sore, and I took out after him like a Marine after a free beer. When I got out into the street, it was empty. Not even a bakshish boy or a drunken Occidental. Just a lot of shadows and sky full of black air that felt heavy and compressed. The voice was behind me, but I turned slowly. There was no point in jarring that thing that was poking me. It turned out to be a forty-five. In back of that, I could make out a pointed beard, a black coat, and a pair of baggy European pants. Senor. Yeah, I heard you. What do you want? The alley, please. Come on, the alley. We got privacy here. Uh, okay, okay. What happened to Waters? You gonna tell me, senor. This is far enough. This is far enough. To tell you nothing? Take it easy, you'll blow a gasket. Senor Waters, where he go? Come on, tell me. The Persian Gulf. Inside, what he say? Whiskey. Tell me what he talking about. The price of pyramids. <laughs> you should be aware, senor. This Waters, he's what you call a crook. Just, just like a Capone, a crook. Sure, and your internal revenue. Please, 
I have a business with him, that's all. Ma, you, you must help. I must know what he's doing. How should I know? The girl, who is she? What what, what he say to her? Nothing to interest you, buddy. The conversation was all about a merchant seaman named Victor. See? Seaman named Victor? That's it. Well, I told you, now you're happy? No, Lord. Not so happy. Not so happy at all. His face froze when I mentioned the seaman named Victor. He stood there a moment looking at me, then he took off. I could hear his steps as he ran down the alley and out toward Ari Benpolda. Then he was gone, and it was quiet again, and there was nothing left in the hot night but me in the mysterious east. Well, I walked around to the street and back side the tambourine. First thing I noticed was the chess game had broken up. The Armenian and the Turk had gone home. Then I saw the corner table where Vivi had sat. It was empty, too. She disappeared. Well, I poured myself a drink, went to bed, and tried to forget about it. But the things that don't make sense are the ones you can't forget. I was up early the next morning. The wind had started to blow, and I got Chris to nail some boards over the broken window to keep the Sahara from drifting in. Then I headed out to buy a piece of glass. I could have found a closer place, but... I steered through the dust with the big street markets beyond the mosque Sultan Hassan. Guess I was a little relieved when I found what I was really looking for. Hockey, good morning. Hello, Vivi. Yeah, nice surprise. Uh, skip it. Hey, you forgot your soup last night. Oh, oh but the broken window, I was so afraid you would be angry. I caused you so much trouble. That's right. I am sorry, Rocky. Look, kid, uh, you know a guy in a goatee? European, Italian, I think. There are many men, Rocky. You know him? No, I do not think so. Why? Well, he stopped me outside the tambourine last night with a gun. The name of your boyfriend seems to mean something to him. Scares him. The name Victor? Yeah. Oh, that is a joke. Oh, Victor, he's a nice boy. He would not scare anyone. Okay, I just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> You're very funny. Uh, I smell something, that's all. <laughs> oh, all right. I don't know why I bothered. Don't you, Rocky? No. Rocky, please, you don't be angry. Please, I, I do need help. Well, go to the police. I did, and to the consulate, and I cannot find him. Bakshish, Effendi, Bakshish. No, 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 beat it. Him, she. And I asked everywhere, Rocky. And no one has seen Victor, not for two days. Well, maybe he's got other friends. But there is no one else in Cairo, he know. <laughs> that was why I laughed just now. Okay, let's have all of it. There is no one any place. He missed his ship at Port Said last week, and he is in Cairo, and I meet him. He is all alone in the world like I am. Love at first sight, huh? No, Rocky. I do not love Victor. What? Not yet. What in the name of Please. Please. You would not understand. You are strong. You have everything. What makes you think you'll ever see him again? Well, he meet me, Rocky, like I need him. Make beautiful the lady shawls. promised me he would not Hey, Mr. Boy, me. shawls. No, no, I no, we're not, we're not buying anything. Mr. Shawls, you, you, old... Please Cairo. help me, Rocky. His full name is Victor Dinelli. Italian? Here, shawls for the lady. Mr. Boy, here I show Go you. Go away. No, Rocky. Super shawls. American. Don't you see? Victor is an American. Here, 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 Effendi. Here around the lady's shoulders I draped the blue one. Look, Mac, I said we're not buying it. Hey, hey, you. Rocky! About the time the peddler threw the shawl over Vivi's shoulder, I caught on he was the same Armenian who'd been in my place the night before playing chess. I reached to grab him when he started to run, but Vivi had grabbed me first, and she hung on tight. The blue shawl fell away, and I could see why. There was a rug knife buried between her shoulder blades. I could feel her skinny arms around me start to relax. Then Vivi crumbled to the sidewalk alongside the blue shawl. Only now it was turning red. You are listening to Passport for Vivi, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The day of miracles is not done, and one way to work miracles today without leaving your home is to contribute to your Red Cross. Your contribution will go out doing the yeoman service to your fellow humans that you would like to do yourself but cannot. Your contribution will perform miracles of aid for the homeless, the wounded, the hungry. Send your contribution out today to work miracles. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Passport for Vivi. Well, 
like so many things, it started out with a woman, Vivi. But she wasn't like other women. She'd been haunting my cafe tambourine looking for an American merchant seaman named Victor. And she never told me why. There was a salesman from Kansas, USA, and an Italian whose name no one mentioned as yet in the picture, too. But the center of interest was the girl looking for Victor. She didn't find him, but found a knife in her back instead. Well, that left me in the middle of the street markets with a knife girl on my hands. I put in a quick call for an ambulance, and it took her to a hospital. I couldn't go with her because someone else had put in a call to the police. A squad car was on its way. I figured I'd do my talking to Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, out of reach on a telephone. Jordan, where are you telling me of telephoning from? Uh, sorry, Sam, I can't tell Jordan, you. Jordan, listen to me. You are in serious trouble. You were in the company of a girl who was knifed. The injury is most serious if she may die. I know that, Sam. It would then be murder. Jordan, I am warning you. I have my men looking for you right at this moment. I didn't do it, Sam. You know that. It was an Armenian posing as a rug seller. Uh, you have witnesses? About 5,000 if they were looking. Then what do you fear? If you have witnesses and you did not do it, why do you not come to me? Funny and... thing, Sam, when something like this happens, people pull their heads in. They all let out for Mecca. Ah, uh-huh. so then you are my only witness and my only suspect. Jordan, I tell you once again, turn yourself in. Come You're to me. You're wasting and... time, Sam. Look for that Armenian. You know I didn't do it. I only know that it is the jackal who strikes and runs away. I'm not running. I got work to do. Such as... Well, maybe I'm looking for a sailor named Victor, too. I don't know. But the girl has looked everywhere. You yourself think that he will not be found? Well, all right, I'm mixed up. Perhaps then you will say you are looking for the one who tried to kill her. Maybe. Jordan, what does this girl mean to you? Nothing. Then why are you thinking of vengeance when this is a job for the police? Why do you do this when when you say the girl means nothing to you? Why, Jordan? I, I do not understand. Do you? No. That's the trouble with the world. People always want to understand things. Well, for a starter, I picked Jeb Waters. The American Express Company suggested I call it the Ramsey's Hotel. I did. It wasn't much. One potted palm and a sober Egyptian with a water pipe who fumbled some cards and said, Room 14 through the courtyard. That must have been the number one girl's quarters in the days when the place was a harem. A latticed door looked into a suite. I knocked. Nobody answered, so I lifted the latch. A sitting room, cool and dark and empty. There was another door, bedroom, I guess, and I moved over to try that. It went off right in my face, but I don't know what it was aimed at because I still felt healthy when I dove to the floor. My hand hit a foot that was trying to jump over me. I hung on and got a man on my chest for the trouble. He rolled, and I kept again a handful of baggy pants. I swung somewhere in the north and landed. He went down. On his way, I caught a glimpse of Beard. It was the Italian who froze when I'd mentioned Victor Donelli's name. Before I could pile him, his arm went around, and I guess the butt of the gun went with it. Well, a couple of stars later, I reached up to feel the bump on my head, and my hand touched leather. It was a passport the Beard must have dropped during the fight. I looked at it. On the first page was a bad picture of a nice kid in a blue shirt. Under that was the name Victor Donelli. Vivi's Victor. For the first time, things began to tie together. But it was a crazy knot. And a moment later, the door opened and Kansas walked in. Here you are. Hello, pal. Yeah. Dusk said you'd be here. Hey, what did you do to my place? Everything's thrown all around. Not me, Buster. Fifty bucks. Fifty bucks gone on my traveler's checks. Uh, he won't be able to cash them. Who? A beard. Oh. He says he doesn't like you. You do business and you're a crook. He's hey, a... hey, hey, hey. Take, take it easy, boy. I'm not in good shape. Oh, my head. Oh, mother, my head. Your head. What's his name? You know, I finally connected last night. I hit every spot. What's his in name? Town. The beard. Uh, Dispori. Gino or Vino Dispori, something like that. Yes, sir. I hit every spot in town, and you can have this town and that whole desert. Me for Palm Springs. All right, get Me off for it. Palm Springs. You said it. Me for the zestful, restful Rothmore Hotel where a guy can relax. Get and it have off, fun I said. I'm talking to you. What's the matter? You're still sore at me, pal. Well, I don't blame you. Guess I kind of got out of line in your place last night. You still are. Knife, wasn't she? 
Almost killed her, huh? Yeah, the cop told me. Called me at the company branch office. Yeah, I gave him your name. Well, thanks. I wouldn't have made a pass at her if I'd known she was yours. Who says she was? Well, what are you doing here? No skin off your neck, is it? If the Armenian did it, that's all there is to it. Maybe he was sore because she wouldn't cut a rug with him or something. Uh, you've seen this passport before? Uh, Victor Dinelli, huh? No. Is that the boy she asked about? Despore dropped it. He's tied in. Now give. Look, pal, like I told the cops, I really don't yeah. know who he... Take it easy, pal. That's a clean shirt. Keep talking. Yeah. Italian. New in town. Looking for business deals. That's all. Met him in a bar. He's a sucker. And you're a salesman. Well, there's nothing wrong with a little side operation, is there? Ah. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> I sold that jerk some shares in the Golden Gate. <laughs> So help me, boy, I actually did it. <laughs> no wonder he's sore. <laughs> I didn't hook him for much, a hundred bucks. I just did it to have something to tell the boys back home. <laughs> that dumb foreigner. <laughs> well, you're an American. You think it's funny, don't you? So long, salesman. I walked out onto the street and looked at Victor Donelli's passport once again. Then I thought of Vivi and her riddle. Well, I couldn't go to the hospital to talk to her, so I did the next best thing. I went over to where she lived to see what I could find. It was a box-like room in a French woman's rooming house on the street of a thousand eyes. There was a cardboard suitcase standing near the bureau, ready to go. But it was the walls that really told her story. The walls and the things I heard her say to me. You are strong, Rocky. You have everything you would not understand. Over the bed were pasted 97 pages from a Sears Roebuck catalog. Victor, he needs me like I need him. He promised he would not leave without me. I believe him. The rest of the room was covered with maps. Maine was next to the war stand and California hung by the window. It was all there. He's American. Don't you see? Victor is an American. Yeah, that's all she ever wanted. The land of the free and the home of the brave. And the sailor was the guy she was sure would give it to her. Vivi's riddle was as simple as that. And I started thinking the millions of people over here were the same idea. But I snapped out of the trance fast. There was a face in the window, a dirty face with long curly hair on top and a super superior shawl below. It was the Armenian. I took out after him and hit the street the same time he hit the next corner. He led me through half the alleys in the Ali Sforza district, then into a blacker section of the native quarter. Finally, he ducked into a doorway. I skirted around to the side and slipped into the shadow of an alley entrance next to the mud building. It figured if the only spot I could still see the door and watch the rear, too. It figured wrong, that's all. Mr. Boy, you saved me trouble, hey? Where are you? Uh, let me lead you right to my place. My su- super superior place with a nice flat roof I can stand upon and watch you below. Oh, there you are. That is, Jordan, I am at shooting better than with a knife. Now, do not move. I'm coming down. Uh, there. Now we see my face, yes? Yeah, and it ain't much. What do you want? I want you to kill same. On whose orders? On orders of Mr. Boss, who does not like you. Well, I don't like him either. Who is he? I just remembered. How much moolah will it take to start remembering? Huh? What is moolah? Money. How much? Oh, moolah. That is funny American word. <laughs> now I know many American words for money. Dough, cabbage, scratch, moolah. Let's drop your education. Get back to business. No can do business, Mr. Boy. Even your tambourine is not worth enough. Come. We have things to do in the shed. Well, the alley's just as good for what you got planned. The shed. More better. There are boxes there so that I may stuff you in and bury you in the desert. Well, I'll buy it if you build a pyramid over me. Otherwise, I'll just pass it up. No, Mr. Boy, no pass up. Come, move. Okay, stop waving that thing. Now, inside. Now you go inside. Hey, stop, Mr. Boy. Oh, oh. Well, Jordan, this time you are running toward the police. Hello, Sam. The police want you for questioning, Jordan. You do not come to them, we come to you. Uh, I'm not complaining, believe me. Is he dead? Seems so. Well, he was murder incorporated. Well, now you will come with me, Jordan. There is still another matter of interrogation. That young lady in the hospital is not expected to leave. Yeah, we can get some answers right here. That joker in the deep fees was the one. I the prefer to talk in the police station. It's not just a matter of talking, Sam. It's a matter of looking, too. 
Come on, into the shed. All right. Ah, there they are. And what are they, Jordan? A rug cutter's boxes. Break for traveling and bury. This empty one seems to have been for me. And this other one? Yeah, I think it's already rented on a long-term lease. Open it up, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Who... Who is this man, Jordan? Victor Danelli, merchant seaman, USA, Italian descent. Vivi's boy, Victor. I guess she can stop looking now. I will telephone the coroner, and you, Jordan, will please come with me to the police station. Am I under arrest, Sam? Technically, no. Sorry, Sam. See you at headquarters in about 45 minutes. Right now I get a date to see a man about a very ugly racket. Listening to Passport for Vivi, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Monday night brings you more mystery on CBS, that special kind of top mystery that has fans everywhere turning first to CBS. At nine, Monday night, CBS brings you Inner Sanctum in a story called Only the Dead Die Twice. Remember Inner Sanctum at nine, Monday night. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Passport for Vivi. Well, Viv said that her picture wouldn't leave her, and he didn't. He'd just been dead a couple of days, that's all. Killed by the Armenian and packed for a desert burial. But the Armenian was leg man for somebody else's racket. The Italian Despores or the salesman from Kansas City, Kansas. It didn't take a lot of figuring to get the right one. Victor's death and his lost passport gave the answer. Well, I'd made a deal with Sam. Forty-five minutes was all I asked for. I'd meet him then at the police station and he could ask questions until he turned blue. Forty-five minutes was all I needed. Just took me twenty to get over to the Ramsey's Hotel and just a few more seconds to cross the courtyard and bounce into room fourteen. Come on in, boy. Door's always open to a pal. You can quit packing, Buster. Oh, those are just my samples, boy. Hey, you won't need them anymore. Your time's all taken up. Hey, what have you been drinking? Now you're all wound up. Your like Armenian a... friend just had his rug cut. And we turned up Victor's body before he got it buried. <laughs> you're out of my depth. I don't think so. You thought you had a pretty sweet little racket, didn't you? Despore, Italian, wants to get into the United States. So he comes to you to buy a soul. Identity, passport, the works. I just told you I'm a salesman. I yeah, you a... couldn't resist bragging about it, could you? Couldn't resist saying you sold a spory the Golden Gate. What you really sold him, or at least planned to, was Victor Dinelli's identity, so that the spory could go to the U.S. as Dinelli. You're quite a storyteller, pal. I'm just telling it, buddy. You wrote it. You know, you had me going for a while when the spory dropped the passport in our little scuffle here. I thought he had taken it from Dinelli. But it was you who had Victor killed and took his passport. The spore, he was just taking it from you. What'd you do, boost the price on him? Who cares? He does. He knows what a mess he's in now. Yeah, well, he can stay there. Sure, while you go looking for more suckers. Maybe. Not a chance, buddy. The spore, he isn't going to be happy with a murder rap. After he gets through talking, you're going to get stretched. Oh, now, pal, wait a Knifing minute. Knifing Vivi to get her to stop looking for Victor turned your table, buddy. It would have gone nicely for you if a little lonely girl hadn't kept looking for a lonely sailor. you got to expect reverses in business, pal. Well, your business stinks. Sending a lot of unhappy people entrees into the United States. I suppose you're going to turn me over to the police. Yeah. But first, you and I got a little unfinished business. I guess I lied to Sam. I didn't make it back to the police station in 45 minutes. It took me a little more than an hour before I dropped Jeb Waters on Sam's doorstep. But Sam wasn't mad. By then, Kansas was ready to do a lot of talking, even through his swollen lips. Well, all that was left was Vivi. It was night, and the cool wind from the desert was blowing onto the Cairo streets when I walked into the hospital. A couple of old Egyptian women were scrubbing floors. And aside from that, there seemed to be nothing else to the hospital but the smell of antiseptic. But there was... Vivi, room 204. 
She lay in the white bed, her eyes closed. One look at the nurse attending her told you all you had to know about her condition. Hockey? Is that you? Yeah. Hello, Hockey. Hello, Vivi. Do not mind my eyes. They are closed. They are so heavy. Rocky, you have found Victor? Yeah, we found him. And he did come back for me. He did come back as he said he would. Did he not, Rocky? Yeah. He came back. I knew he would. What do you mean? No, I, I not be able to go to the United States with him. The poor boy will have to go alone and be lonely once I can. I will not be lonely ever again. Vivi. Haki. I feel so tired, Haki. I think that I will sleep. Good night, Vivi. Goodbye, Rocky. CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by Jackson Gillis, edited by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On the days before Christmas, Broadway dances along to carols that flow from sequined loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against the plate glass, lick it, and watch. And it's all there. The mechanical clown, the tin man dancing a jig on a tin box, the toy army precisely to scale with the latest equipment mechanized. And eyes are bright with desire and hope. It's the one time in the year when odds are better that dreams will come true. So make a wish on a neon star. And in the short time before Christmas, creatures were stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, my strong right arm, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. <laughs> Yeah, it's getting pretty late, you know. A couple more hours, you can go home and finish decorating your Christmas tree. Indeed, indeed. Getting a lot of nice things this year, General? Oh, many of things, Danny. I guess my old cockles should be warmed. Uh, but they're not. Oh, something wrong, Gino? What I want most for Christmas, Danny, I'm not going to get. I'm going to get nicks and knacks and an electric shaver and handkerchiefs and socks and ties and a curved K. Woody pipe to smoke my troubles away. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty full Christmas to me, Gino. Ah, humbug. Danny, what I want most is to go out and solve a crime. To meet face to face the sulky sirens, the hardened criminals, and to solve them the way you do. 
to go out on a case with you. My fondest wish for Christmas. Oh, police headquarters would fall apart without you, Gino. You just stick around here and do your job. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I just thought I'd let you know that's all. Oh, well. Uh, I'm going downstairs for some coffee. I'll be back soon. Roger. Oh, face it, Gino. You're stuck at a desk. Yeah? Oh, phone Gino. Sergeant Gino Tataglia speaking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right away. Danny. Hey, Danny. Yeah, what's the matter, Gino? I haven't gotten my coffee yet. Coffee? At a time like this? Buddy Malpar, the ne'er-do-well millionaire. What? What about him? What about him? He has been slugged. Let's go, Gino. Did you say let? Of course, on a case like this, I'll need you, Gino. Come on. This is his house, Danny. Let's go. It's locked? Yeah. Stand aside, Danny. No. We can go in now, Danny. Gino. Yeah? We could have rung the bell. Who's got time? You coming? For here, Gino. Back of the sofa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Take a note, Danny. Yes, sir. Buddy Malpa, the unconscious ne'er-do-well millionaire, battered and bludgeoned on the supraoccipital region of the cranium. Hmm? Back of the skull, Danny. Slugged on the supraoccipital by his assailant unknown. From the size of the lump on Buddy Malpa's heretofore refined head, conclude that said lump was administered by a blunt weapon three millimeters by five of the irregular contour and lead pipe consistency. You got that, Danny? Yes, Sergeant. Hold it. I got a P.S. To wit... Luxurious apartment of said ne'er-do-well millionaire, one buddy Malpa, ransacked and left in disarray. P.P.S., the butler of said household will have his work cut out for him. Shall I phone it in now, Sergeant? Don't move. Huh? The drapes just moved. All right. You, behind those drapes. Out. With your hands clasped behind your neck. Out. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Danny, it can't be. It can't be what, Gino? This man, this hider behind drapes. It can't be. Are you? (laughs) It is he. Danny, may I present Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia. Merry Christmas, gentlemen. Merry Christmas to you, Mike Shrek. I assume you gentlemen are of the police of the city? I present to you, sir, Lieutenant Danny Clover and myself, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Tartaglia, eh? Uh, that that name has a familiar ring. Oh, perhaps because I was an innocent abroad on the guided in the footsteps of Mike Shrek tour in Philadelphia last summer. I blew myself to it with my vacation money. Oh, it's not for that I remember you, sir. It's for the word that has come to me that you are indeed the brains behind the brains of the New York police force. Oh, come now, Mr. Shrek. You, you mustn't believe all Oh, you. I could have used you, sir, on my famed widow Chalcedony's case. When having trailed the Desperado across the 1.83 miles of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge, I was caught in the seductive toils of... <laughs> the machine gun <laughs> brain of the man, Danny. The memory for details. To have made a part of him the size of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge. Gentlemen, enough of nostalgia. To work. <clears throat> it was I who phoned this into you. Uh, being now on the trail of Lance Lash, master criminal of them all, I was led to this place. Only to find Buddy Malpaw, the ne'er-do-well millionaire. Now, oh, but hush. The man is coming around. What happened, man? Tell us what happened. You are... Gently, sir. You are among friends. We're from the police, Mr. Malpaw. Try to tell us what happened. Well, uh, I'll try, fellows. I had arranged such a pleasant evening. A date with Rima Nine. Oh, not the Rima Nine from Bolivia, but the Miss Rima Nine who was staying at the Stacy Arms. Go on, Mr. Malpo. Rima was to meet me here at 9.30. However, at precisely at 9, the doorbell rang. I went to open it. There was no one there. 
No one? No one. A prank, I thought. I, I started back into the apartment. Suddenly, the, the pain, the awful pain screaming through my skull. It, it was no prank, I assure you. No, it... Where is it? Where is it? Where is what, Mr. Malpo? It's gone. It was here in this case. It's gone. What's gone, Mr. Malpo? I prized it more than the jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. The jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. The jewel... What's going on here, Sergeant? Read your notes, man. Read your notes. And watch the sergeant as he considers the attitude of the distressed man. The desolation of him. The sergeant's compassion, understanding, the most precious thing of Malpaw's life, the jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan, was gone now, vanished, lost, strayed, stolen, purloined. The sergeant's gentleness, the knowledge of it caught up with Malpaw, took hold, displaced everything until it was only emptiness, void, vacuum, space, nothing. And finally, the ne'er-do-well millionaire's rejection of it. And turn now... Sergeant Tataglia nods sagely. Open the door for him. And leave. <laughs> Going out of the Stacy Arms, and the clerk at the desk lifts a corner of his lip and an eyebrow when the sergeant mentions the name of a woman he wants to see. The long ride up on the elevator. And walk down the carpeted corridor. The sprig of Christmas holly above the brass door knocker. At this time, we'll knock, Danny. Hi, fellas. Please come in. You'll forgive the way I look. We're from the police, Miss Nine. Yeah, we got some questions to ask you. A piece of finery I picked up at Cote d'Azur. I always wear it at this hour. It's a wishing hour. You may call me Rima. I'm Gino. He's Danny. It's about Buddy Malpaw, Miss Nine. Yes. He was beaten and robbed this evening. You may sit here beside me, if you wish. None of this sultry siren stuff, Miss Nine. Didn't you have a date with Mr. Malpaw this evening? Yes, I did, at 9.30. That checks, Sergeant. What time did you get to the Malpaw mansion? At 9.30. I rang the bell and rang it. No one answered. I was so disappointed. With an educational evening like that in sight. Educational? Buddy was going to show me the... Jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. The real one, not the replica. Oh? There's a replica? At the Museum of Far Eastern Lore, I often go there in my idle moments and browse around the Far Eastern things. And you're a strange one, Rima. Yes. Uh, please go on. That's how I met Buddy at the museum. Fate plays strange tricks, doesn't it, Gino? Yeah. Now, if you'll pardon me, fellows... I must change. Well, go right ahead. We'll just make ourselves... Go. Let's go, Gino. We are sorry, Mr. Zoe, that we have made you open your museum to us at such a late hour. It is always a pleasure, Sergeant, to indulge the whims of the culture. Though they be policemen. Thank you, Mr. Zoe. They're not at all. Mm. And here, gentlemen, looming above you, is the statue of the fabulous terrorizer, Genghis Khan. Clothed in the cap of Tibetan fur, the jeweled gown of brocaded Peking silk, all of it donated to us most generously by Buddy Malpaw to complete our Far Eastern collection. And the sword in his hands. A replica only, I fear. A replica of the jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan. And Mr. Malpaw's generosity dissolved when it reached Tell the... us about the scimitar, Mr. Zoe. With the deepest of pleasure. Genghis tore it from the wounded hands of Jella Ledin. His arch and bitter enemy, Danny. Mm. Then for centuries it was lost. Three centuries, Danny. Vanished to reappear again in the Renaissance as an ornament worn about the slim waist of... Oh, the Lucretia of Borgia, Danny. If this scimitar were real, Mr. Zoic, how much would it be worth? Eh, yeah, conservatively... Conservatively. Uh, half a million dollars. Give a little, take a little. Half a million, huh? That's all we need to know. Let's go, Danny. Yeah. And to you, Mr. Zoic, many thanks and merry, merry Christmas. And to you, sir. The fate. 
Half a million bucks, Danny. No wonder Mr. Malpar, the ne'er do well millionaire. Gino, hit the ground. Hit the ground. Danny. Danny. Oh, oh. Gino, you're. you're... Yeah. yeah. Help me, Danny. I've been. I've been shot. Oh. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's so delightful it's become a Christmas tradition with Amos and Andy. Tomorrow night, again, Amos will be heard explaining the meaning of the Christmas spirit to his little daughter, Arbadella. It wouldn't be Yuletide without this special bit Amos and Andy contribute to the season's atmosphere... So be sure to hear it again over most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night on Amos and Andy. As the winds move to the place of the year's dying, the Mazdas on Broadway's Translux arrange themselves in merry thoughts. Suitable for Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future... Broadway walks by, glances up, smiles, hurries to buy the last-minute gift for the last-minute friend. Crosby sings the tune that's in your heart. The corner Santa Claus winks, and the golden girl stops you, asks which way to Gimbel's, invites you to come along and show her. The budget term dreams are coming true, kid. So go live a little. Danny, Danny, I've been shot. Oh, oh no. I must have been dreaming. Yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah, I, I was shot. Uh, there you are, Sergeant, as good as new. My thanks, Dr. Sinsky. Uh, may I say something, Gino? Indeed you may. I've been privileged to attend many courageous men. But you... You, Gino... No other way I can say it. I, I stand in humility before you. Ah, oh, Dr. Sinsky. You, you shouldn't say those things. I He's right, think. Gino. Dr. Sinsky's only saying what all of us feel. We've already initiated proceedings for an award for bravery beyond the call of duty. Danny... Dr. Sinsky, dear true friends, I know not what to... May I? Uh, go right ahead, sir. Thank you. Sergeant Gino Cataglia speaking. Yes? Yes? Yes. That was my shriek. Evil has come to him. Get me a squad car. But Gino, Never you... Never mind the hole in my head. Danny, a squad car. Move. The door's locked, Gino. One side. After you, Danny. Huh? Mr. Shrek, what happened to you? Landslash. The master criminal of the all? I give the devil his due. You haven't told us what happened, Mr. Shrek. Please, gentlemen, please. You help me up. Oh, of course. Now be gentle with him, Danny. Yeah. Uh, over here on the bed. Mm. Now, tell us about it. My friends, I feel I have failed you. Oh, don't talk like that. After all, how many people have come face to face with Lance Lash and lived to tell about it? <laughs> Give the devil his due. Yes. Now, would you mind telling us what happened? I, I came here to my rooms. Sparsely furnished, you'll admit, but the way I like it. No furbelows to distract my attention. I needed to think. I knew I was once again a hot on the trail of Lance Lash. Once again, from the ends of the earth. Listen to the man, Danny. We had met, Lancelash and I. The last time on the lonely isle, Mauritius, when we battled hand to hand on top of old Farfangan, the volcano. Yeah, I know, but, but what happened tonight? As is my one before I retired, I looked under my bed, gentlemen, and there he was, Lancelash. So you got under two and started a fight with him, yes, huh? Yes, yes, it was nip and tuck under there, but if the devil has... Well, why did he come here, Mr. Shrek? He thought I had the jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. 
And as you know, gentlemen, I have not. As you... Would, would you mind, Sergeant? Oh, of course. Yes? Yes. Yes. How do you like that, Danny? Like what? Rima 9. The sultry siren? Yeah, she was picked up on a disorderly conduct charge. And you know what she had with her? No, I don't. A scimitar. And it was smashed to pieces. Let's go, Danny. If I were you, I'd try a poultice, Mr. Shrek. Open it, Danny. Yeah. Well, Rima, what have you to say for yourself? This, you... Take it easy, Rima. Just relax. Kicking will get you nowhere. A wild cat. No. All of you. Get for you. Easy, girl. Easy. That's it. That's a good girl. That's a baby. You have strong arms, Sergeant. Don't take them away. Hmm. The boys say they picked you up screaming on a street corner. Why were you doing that, Miss Nine? They tell you about me banging their empty heads together till they rang out the season's greetings. They mentioned it. Now you tell us why you did all that and right before Christmas. You know why. That piece of mail order carving knife masquerading as the... Jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. Not the genuine article, huh? Not the genuine article, huh? He says. It was a fake! A dirty, rotten, so tiny. Don't scream, Angel. We're all nearby. Okay, so it was a fake, Miss Nine. Where'd you get it? What's that got to do? Only this. You rang Buddy Malpro's bell at nine last night. You slugged him, stole the scimitar. Now you're hurt because it's a fake. Charges pile up, huh, Sergeant? Assault, theft? Indeed they do, Rima. Look me for anything you want, lover. Just so you bring in that woman-beating cab driver. Huh? The cab driver. I get in this cab. Tell him to get me to the airport in a hurry. Why should I stay in this lonesome town when what I had in my hands was worth half a million? <laughs> what I had in my hands. Go on. So Cabby tilts his cap to me. I see the union label. I figure he's friendly, trustworthy, loyal. I make chit-chat with him when, wham, bang, he turns onto a side street, grabs me by the throat, wrestles me for the scimitar. He looks at it and breaks it over my head. And you know who he was? Who he really was? Not, not, none other. Lance Lash, the master criminal of them all. Love him. Imagine poor little me in the clutches of Lance Lash. Oh, there, there. Don't think about it. You can let her go now, Gino. Read your notes, man. Just read your notes. And leave there. Go away. Find a place at police headquarters and close the door to the outside. Think about it, you and Sergeant Tartaglia. Put it down and add it up. It doesn't come out. So Sergeant Tartaglia puts it down and adds it up, and it comes out. Go to a place now, back to the museum, and tell it all to a man you talked to before. I can't believe it. I just cannot believe it. You better believe it, Mr. Zoig, because that's the only way it makes sense. That's right. If the scimitar stolen from Buddy Malpa was a phony, then the one the statue of Genghis Khan is holding is the real one. The ingeniousness of the man Malpa. What better way to keep his treasure safe than to put it before the eyes of the world? We want to see again, Mr. Dawkins. Of Dork. course, of course you do. This way, this way. Ah, this is very gratifying to me, you know, this publicity. People from all walks of life now drop in to catch a peek of the statue of Genghis Khan holding the scimitar. And just ten minutes ago, I had to warn a cab driver to keep hands off. A cab off. driver? Yes, interesting fellow, too. Interesting face. We better hurry, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 now look, look. I don't understand Genghis Khan. He's dressed like a cab driver. He's holding a city guidebook in his hand. The scimitar is gone. It's impossible. Maybe, but it's happened. The cab driver changed clothes. Maybe we can catch him, Danny. Yeah. And maybe that man's sitting on the step saw him. Let's ask him. Hey. Hey, mister. Hello. Did you see a man come out of here a few minutes ago? Well, I guess I did. I've been sitting here for the last hour. Did you notice anything strange about any of them, the way one of them was dressed? 
Let me see now. Uh, this I... man had on a fur cap and a brocaded robe. He was carrying a scimitar. Oh, sure, I saw him. I didn't pay him no mind, though. I just figured he was from California. Let's go, Gino. Danny? Danny, I think I got it. Got what? Get in the car and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, where are we going? To see Mike Schreck, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia. I think we're at trail's end. <laughs> Lieutenant Clover, Mr. Shrek, and Sergeant Tartaglia. I'll be with you in a minute. We're still waiting, Mr. Shrek. Come in. Come in. I was just tidying up. Going someplace, Mr. Shrek? Back to Philadelphia. I'm afraid... Afraid Lance Lash has outwitted me again. Oh, has he now? Yes, but I'll get him. After the holidays. Sit down, Mr. Shrek. Tell us how you're going to get Lance Lash. Well, I'm going to the Congo. After the holidays. Oh. And why are you going to do that, Mr. Shrek? Rumor has already drifted up from the veldt of the sudden appearance of the long-lost emerald eye of the goddess Osiris. If I know Lance Lash, that's where he'll be. After the holidays. Oh, he will, will he? Let me ask you a question, Mr. Shrek. At your service. How long did you say the Philadelphia Camden Bridge was? Uh, 1.83 miles. See? What did I tell you, Danny? Go ahead, Gino. Correct him. The length of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge is 1.81 miles. Did you hear me, Mr. Shrek? I heard you. Mike Shrek would never make an error like that. Oh? Lance Lash, the master criminal of them all, I presume. At your service, gentlemen. Look in the closet, Danny. Right. Uh, it's here, all right. The costume of Genghis Khan. And, of course, you left the disguise of the cab driver at the museum. <laughs> My compliments to you, sir. You came to the house of Buddy Malpa after the scimitar was stolen. You traced it to Rima 9. Disguised as a cab driver, you found her with it making her flight. You discovered it was a fake. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> of course, you know what happened then. I deduced the same thing you did. The genuine scimitar was at the museum. Where is it now, Mr. Lash? Where is it? Why, it is here. Watch out, Gino. He'll cut you to pieces. I'll take him, Danny. <coughs> Lance. Don't. Don't. Say, Uncle. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Look, Danny. See? I removed this bald-headed toupee, and what do we have? A full head of hair. What a phony you are, Lance Lash. <laughs> Gino. Gino. Come on, Gino, wake up. Come on, come on. Huh? You fell asleep, Gino. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I must have dozed. No calls, huh? Yeah, from... No. No calls. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Gino? Danny. Yeah? I had a dream, Danny. I was a big hero. I went out on a case with you. <laughs> a dream, huh? I want to tell you something, Gino. What? When something happens to you, something real, and then it's over, you know what you have left? Memory. Yeah, Danny. That's right. When a dream's over, and you can remember it, you have the same thing. A memory. That's all anything is, Gino. A memory. Then I got my Christmas wish, huh, Danny? Sure you did. <laughs> Go on home now. Sure. Merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas, Gino. The 
bells ring out on Broadway, and the horns blow, and there's laughter. The translux spells out peace on earth, goodwill to men. You read it and believe it, because it's Christmas time, the time for believing in miracles. The crowd pushes you along, and you're part of it. It makes you happy. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as Mike Schreck, Georgia Ellis as Rima Nine, Howard McNear as Mr. Zoik, and George Neese as Buddy Malpaw. Ships loaded with vital cargoes for our men at the fighting front are swinging at anchor for lack of radio officers. Men with six months merchant ship radio operating experience since 1935 or any kind of FCC license can get an emergency license to ship at once. Write, phone, wire, or go now to American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time, Sunday nights on the CBS radio network. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. 
It has the odor of Christmas night. Or uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was riding. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. And there's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep. Nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The sandman came and I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. It just happened, I guess. What's your name? Jamie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Jamie? Oh, I've had two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you, and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then if we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> that's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Here, let me see uh -huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother... Hmm. You're not. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. 
A sucker, if there ever was one. Well, this is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Put her down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I want a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holliday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holliday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're all right, our holiday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. I broke the nail. I broke the nail. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my very tail broke. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. You're a night man. Are you my daddy? No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Teddy bear? No teddy bear. You must be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears... The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the, the ba baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. <sighs> Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. <laughs> well, what's this? A little girl. 
Oh, thanks, over there. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it doesn't. It isn't? Uh, holiday. Great little kidder. Dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody else. <laughs> All children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, holiday? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, Oh, yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad you accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Whew. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Jane. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off. You'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old? Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside, then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Right, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. You come with me, Holiday. Let's keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you... Think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holliday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? The man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? All right, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must have seen him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? 
You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you can remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I dropped here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holliday. You. They've gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's mother... Mr. Holliday, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark... What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here, but I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. You'll get her. You'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. There. There it is. Brown's Motel. This is one time you'd better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get him to the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. My daddy, did you bring my fairy tale book? Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is. Tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. 
So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. Mary! I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holiday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Jamie. Mommy. Jamie. No, no, no. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holiday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holiday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Cling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Cling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child, who did? A man named Sam Parker who turned out to be... Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her a child, a Holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Are uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer the door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Mr. Holliday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holliday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can keep my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh, boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hedegar. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. (laughs) 